four months of work. Dozens of artists. Fixing Ruby, Volume 5. Kanpai, everyone! Volume 5 is... terrible. No, stop. You don't get it. People these days want to complain about Volume 7 and 8, and yeah, those have significant issues, but at the very least, there is something to work with there. Volume 5? Volume 5 is impressive in how absolutely trash it is from top to bottom. Every major complaint I've had with previous volumes is here. Volume 1's lack of spine, Volume 2's lack of cohesion, Volume 3's imbalance of quality, Volume 4's lack of bite, and Volume 5 brings its own additional problems in the form of utter vapidity! This is a tour de force of bad. This volume should be archived by the American Film Institute purely on the basis of how to write a story that takes up so much time and yet does so little with it. I'm going to be upfront here. Of all the seasons of Fixing Ruby, this is probably going to be the one that resembles its progenitor volume the least. Seriously, in previous volumes, I could get away with presenting core scenes wholesale with only minor tweaks to dialogue to fit changes or tweak interactions. Here, I've basically rewritten the whole volume from the ground up. Now, part of that's my own fault. I'd made some significant changes in previous volumes that have natural domino effects. That was to be expected. But the sheer scale of what I've had to change while also matching the most vital plot points, this was an effort I could hardly do alone. It took a month just to do the outline for this damned thing, and another to write it, all with the help of a small handful of sketchy huntsmen who joined me on late night calls while I was penning it. Without them? I'm sure I'd be speaking in a chthonic tongue right now, burying effigies of Miles Luna in my backyard! All of that said, I'm quite happy with the ultimate results that we've wound up with. We may have had to make some severe changes to how this volume works, but in the long run, I think it comes out of this with significantly more punch, both from the emotional side and from the lore side. As a consequence, the blasted thing is two and a half times the length of Volume 4's rewrite and clocks in at over a hundred pages. So there's a lot of fixing Ruby to come over the next few months. Prepare yourselves. Anyway, I've rambled on long enough. You've waited. I've waited. Now 50 members of the Sketchy Huntsman have waited. It's time for Fixing Ruby, Volume 5. We open on darkness, muffled sounds echoing in our ears, distant combat, screams of terror, rushing wind and nearby explosions, all drowned by the shadows. And then, a hand emerges, wearing a partially dissolved glove layering in thick green aura. Tendrils of darkness lap at the hand, trailing dry, acidic scars in the skin before it's completely obscured again. A moment later, a face emerges, struggling against the living ink. It's Roman, panicked, angered, and scrabbling desperately to escape the haze, his limbs pulling free for a second only to be dragged back in, a new trail of scars like chemical burns etched into his body. We see that in one of his hands is his cane, and as the tendrils begin to lap at his face, he squeezes his eyes shut and pulls the trigger. The darkness around him explodes in a flash of red, and we finally cut to outside where the griffin that had eaten him is limply flying from the airship it had been kicked into, having burst out of the side. A moment later, it explodes from the inside out, and we see Roman hurtle to the ground, his aura flickering from the slow dissolve on his body in the sheer force of the explosion in such close proximity. His cane shatters from the strain, and it can be seen that his signature coat has been almost completely devoured, leaving him in only the tattered remains of his shirt, pants, and shoes. As his hat flies off into the night, Roman sees the approaching ground below and has no time to react as his body meets it. He slams into it, his aura breaks completely, and he passes out from the shock. Moments pass before a golden glow washes beneath his eyelids. His eyes open, this time a much softer green, grayer in color. Wordlessly, he stands, and he limps away from the battlefield. The camera pans down to the broken cane, and as it fades to black, we're given a title card telling us this is taking place at Beacon, 11 months prior to the current time. The camera cuts back to Roman jolting awake in an emergency shelter set up in a veiled gymnasium, one among dozens of people who have taken refuge there. He sits up and quietly takes stock of the situation, including his injuries and the people around him. With a grimace at the scar on his arm and the tattered states of his clothing, he tries to stand before realizing he's chained to the bed with handcuffs. 
A glint of panic crosses his face until he realizes that the people around him are either too busy taking care of the injured or too injured themselves to care about him being awake. Gritting his teeth, Roman dislocates his thumb, slips free of the handcuffs, stands up, relocates his thumb, and walks his way towards the door, through which one of the emergency workers walks, leading two Atlesian guards. The worker points at Roman, and the guards waste no time moving to apprehend him. Roman scowls and moves towards the set of doors on the other side of the gym, breaking into a sprint and knocking medical equipment into the path of the men chasing him. The chase is brief, as the minute Roman gets outside into Vale Street, he's back in his element, and he vanishes into the alleyways. We see him lean against a brick wall, catching his breath as the guards incorrectly choose to follow the main thoroughfare, giving Roman his moment to breathe and fully escape. He leaves, and we transition to him arriving at an apartment door, and when he reaches for the keys, he realizes he's left them in his coat, which has now been dissolved. Rolling his eyes, he kicks open the door and walks into what is presumably a safe house apartment. Unfortunately, it's not much of a safe house anymore because one of the walls has been blown open during the attack, leaving the main room partially exposed to the street outside. Roman looks at it with defeat and moves on to what he came here to do, clean up and get a fresh set of threads. Opening the closet of the bedroom, there's a group of outfits set aside for him and a group for Neo, and he lingers looking at her side of the closet before taking his clothes and closing the door. In the bathroom, he tries the shower, only for nothing but gunk to leave the pipes. Resigned to not gain a proper shower, he changes clothes, and hears a voice, seemingly from somewhere else in the apartment. With the first word he's muttered this whole time, Roman calls out for the person, checking every corner of the place and threatening to beat them within an inch of their life if they've stolen anything. Instead, he hears noise coming from within the bathroom. Returning, he hears the voice again while looking towards the mirror. This is where he's blindsided by the bold mental proclamation of, Hello, I'm Professor Ospin. Roman slams himself into the wall behind him, breath rapid. He asks where the voice is coming from, and Osmond tells him he's inside Roman's mind. Roman doesn't believe him, and is quick to scour the bathroom and his clothes for hidden speakers. Finding none, Osmond asks if he's satisfied, and of course Roman isn't. There has to be some better explanation for it. Osmond muses that his attitude is very ungrateful for the person who saved his life, and when Roman asks, Oz explains that he was the one that took control of Roman's body and brought him to the field shelter. Roman is furious at that, since that almost ended with him getting arrested again, and Ospin apologizes for that. He doesn't exactly have a choice of who he ends up in the mind of, and he had no way to know that he was inside of Roman's head. All he knew at the time was that his new host had passed out in the middle of a battlefield and that he was injured. Ultimately, getting arrested for a second time would have been preferable to being eaten, wouldn't it? Roman tells Oz to spend a couple of weeks locked up inside of Ironwood's prison carrier and then talk to him about what would be preferable. Osman turns that around on Roman by asking him to spend eternities hopping bodies with little control over what they do. For emphasis, he moves one of Roman's arms, though it's sluggish and unwieldy. Roman is horrified as his hand moves on its own accord, and he is quick to use his other hand to restrain it. Osman comments that that demonstration was about the peak of what he can do, and even that much is dwindling quickly as their motor functions begin to fuse. Short of Roman ceding control directly, Osman will be powerless to do anything with Roman's body. Roman collapses on the remains of the apartment's couch before acknowledging, with no small level of disbelief, that someone else really is in his head. Ospin agrees that it was quite a surprise when it first happened to him, and the weight of the implications might be more so. The world is at stake from a grave threat, and Ospin has been fighting for centuries to stop it from succeeding. Roman has the distinguished honor to be the next in a long line of hosts destined to fight that threat and keep all of Remnant safe. Ospin notes that it could be quite an adjustment period for Roman, but he's sure that by the time they link up with Ospin's allies, Ospin's presence will begin to feel like second nature. Roman waves that off, saying that it's only an adjustment period so much as Oz remains in his head. He happens to enjoy the luxury of his own mind and doesn't intend to give up the real estate that's rightfully his. He doesn't know how Oz got in his head, but once he finds Neo, they'll go to a shrink or a priest or something and find a way to kick Oz out. Ospin is actually taken aback by Roman's brazen reply and is quiet for just a moment before asserting that Roman doesn't quite understand the situation. Roman cuts Oz off, stating that there's some old fart in his head trying to tell him what to do. Extort enough corporate suits and you get to know the type. Roman explains he's just gotten out of a rather sticky business entanglement, and he's not keen on entering another one. Whenever Roman gets Ospin out of his head, the ghost can go haunt someone else and bring his save the world nonsense with him. Ospin replies that it doesn't work that way. There's no way for Ospin to leave outside of Roman dying. Like it or not, they're stuck together. Roman stands and cracks his neck, commenting he's always found a way to be the exception to the rule. You don't become a criminal mastermind without a little grit, determination, and creativity. But his first priority is Neo, and in that he will not budge. 
Ozpin, capitulating as a show of good faith, says he'll help Roman look for his partner, and in exchange, perhaps he'll humor the old man's plans. Roman approaches the door to the apartment, resting a hand on the broken handle before replying tentatively that he might listen. Might. But Oz shouldn't count on it. And with that, Roman is out the door. As that door closes, another door in Junior's bar opens, opening into the room of Melanie and Milcha Malachite. We are told this is occurring a few days later via title card. Junior is silhouetted by the light from the hallway outside, illuminating the otherwise unlit room. He offers Melanie, the only person in the room, dinner on a tray, but she quietly shifts in the sheets on her bed, effectively non-responsive to him. Junior is hesitant to leave, saying it's been a couple of days and, though it's unspoken, he's clearly deeply concerned about her. She continues to give him the silent treatment and he leaves, saying she can grab the food from the bar if she feels well enough to come get it. We follow him out to his club, which has temporarily been closed following the attack on Beacon, and he puts the food down at the end of the bar. He pulls out his scroll where an image of himself, Melanie, and Milcha are all seemingly happy together, but he can't stand to look at it very long, closing it and putting it back in his pocket. He busies himself cleaning up the glasses behind the counter when Roman walks in, interrupting the man's mindless cleaning by dropping his elbows unceremoniously onto the bar when he sits. Junior acts with only a little shock to see Roman alive, commenting that the word had gone around that the crime lord was looking for his missing partner. Roman is genial and somewhat hopeful that Junior can help him find Neo, but Junior cuts him off quickly and tells him to leave. Roman is confused, of course, but Junior is quick to explain that he doesn't want to be involved in anything or with anyone that had their hands in what happened during the fall of Beacon. Feigning indignance, Roman puts a hand to his chest, proclaiming his innocence, but Junior is quick to shoot him down, pointing out that there's not a snowball's chance in hell that's the truth. Roman was arrested for the breach months ago, and with the White Fang involved, it's clear to anyone with eyes and a brain that the same people were involved. Roman growls that he had his hands tied. He didn't want a single part of what happened, but if he hadn't complied the way he had, he would have been killed on the spot. His employers over the last half year have been exceptionally powerful. Why would Roman have even entertained the idea of getting arrested in the first place? He could have made it out of there scot-free if it hadn't been for the people pulling the strings using him as a scapegoat. Despite the truth in Rowan's words, Junior doesn't buy it, and he wants no part in any of it. Things happen during the fall that, well, he trails off, but it's clear whatever happened was traumatizing. He suggests it would be for the best if Roman leaves. Insulted, Roman does. However, during the whole conversation, the two had an eavesdropper, Melanie, who'd come out of her room to get some of the food that Junior had talked about. She was privy to the whole conversation, and as Roman leaves, she slinks back to her own room. Outside, with Roman, Ospin speaks up, commenting on Roman's lack of success. Roman snaps back at him to shut up. He's running out of ties that haven't been burned when he enacted his last big heist during Volume 1, and the running commentary from some stupid voice in his head isn't helping his growing sense of frustration. Ospin apologizes, but he's trying to keep Roman's head on straight so they can be as efficient as possible. They've already been at this several days, and there's been zero progress made. He then goes on to suggest that if none of his old contacts could help, and the police would arrest him on the spot, it may be time to start investigating morgues. Roman snarls quietly at the suggestion, stealing his face and walking towards the sidewalk. Osborn tries to soften the statement that humanity is mortal and death is ever-present. It comes to everyone, and if it was Neo's time, it was her time, and he should be thankful for what time he had with her. Roman bites back at Ozpin's words, that Neo is made of tougher stuff than Oz could ever comprehend. A stupid fall wouldn't kill her, and a few setbacks won't stop Roman from continuing to search for her. Ozpin asks where they're headed, and Roman says that he still has a few more contacts to dig up. Some burned bridges can still be crossed with enough for open resolve. We jump back to Melanie in her room, yelling to Milcha about what she overheard, about how Roman was involved with the people responsible for the fall of Beacon and all the damage that spread into Vale. Milcha takes the ranting in stride and offers words of affirmation to Melanie. Of course it's his fault. Doesn't she remember that the blonde bimbo who came to the bar used him as leverage against Junior? And how that ended with the whole club wrecked? The man is nothing but trouble. It's only natural he'd be involved with the fall. Melanie, still wholly distraught, asks what they can do. The authorities are too preoccupied with the attack to focus on him, and the underworld wants to lay low. With a smile, Milcha suggests that they take care of him themselves, get back what he and the rest of his cabal took from them, and live happily ever after with his head hanging as the club's centerpiece. As Milcha speaks, Melanie begins to nod her head in agreement, and when the camera spins around Melanie, we see that Milcha isn't actually there. She's only a product of Melanie's mind. Junior knocks on her door and asks if everything's all right, he heard shouting. Malachite looks to the door and says that everything is fine. In fact, Milcha and I were thinking it was just about time we come out for some fresh 
Air. A title card tells us more days have passed, and we pick up with Roman and Ozpin at a morgue. We can tell the situation has deteriorated. Roman is quite clearly not operating on a healthy amount of sleep anymore, and Ospin's voice is twinged with irritation over how long the search is taking. He prods Roman into giving up the search. There are more important things to be done. Roman sees that there is nothing more important to him, and if she's not a corpse, then it means they didn't check hard enough with his contacts, didn't dig deep enough. As he leaves the morgue and enters a nearby alley, he resolves to hit up his contacts at the docks. Maybe Neo made her way out of the city, though he doesn't know why she'd do that unless she had to. It is here that a second figure follows Roman into the alley and calls out his name in a scratchy, hoarse, and prolonged way. Roman turns to face the deranged smile of Malachite, wearing a crude combination of the two sisters' clothing, a blade on her right arm and a blade on her left leg. She begins to approach, dragging her arm blade across the alley wall. Roman flounders over both the twins' as names, unsure of which twin this is, and Malachite screams that he's not allowed to use their names with all that he took from them. He's honestly confused what the hell is happening, and says as much, but that doesn't stop Malachite from attacking him full force. And here we get our first action sequence of the volume as Roman is chased through Vale streets, scrambling to defend himself and keep himself ahead of Malachite's vicious, if not sometimes horribly uncoordinated and unbalanced attacks. Eventually, he's chased to Vale's harbor where he finds himself cornered between water, Malachite, and a nearby group of Atlesian soldiers. Roman flees across the docks, across the boats, with Malachite in hot pursuit, slashing and gouging her way across the yachts and fishing skiffs. With a stroke of luck, Roman manages to jump from a sail onto a much larger boat leaving out of the docks, leaving Malachite to fall into the waters beside it. Roman collapses from exhaustion against the rails of the boat and watches the port fade into the distance. For her part, Malachite crawls up onto the dock using her blades to give her extra leverage into the wood. She watches as Roman shrinks into the horizon on the ship and gives a blood-curdling, furious scream. We cut to black and hit the opening for the volume. Wait, why am I doing this now? この番組はご覧のスポンサーの提供でお送りします。ご審査様のお名前は動画の途中で記載されます。Episode 2 opens similar to how the original Episode 1 does, with Darkness and Nora excitedly demanding that everyone hurry up. The Darkness eases up so we can see our heroes approaching the tunnel's end. We can tell from their slouched poise and heavy bags under everyone's eyes that they're just now really getting out of bed for the day, and they're all exhausted. John asks Nora to settle down, but Ruby yawns while waving him off. She's just as excited to see the city proper as Nora. Nora just has the most energy of everyone in general. Ren adds, looking just as tired as John, that Mistral is a wonderful sight, and he's sure that it'll lift their spirits after they've all been stuck in a house for an entire day. Crow backs this up from the literal back of the group by saying the sea's a real sight to see. Ahead of them, Nora has already exited out onto the veranda and is calling them all forward. With a flourish of his arm, Crow properly introduces the team to the city of Mistral. The group emerge onto a balcony overlooking the expansive interior of Mistral's dual mountain structure. Buildings litter the mountainside, spreading vertically, horizontally, and every which way they can in order to cram space. 
The top of the mountains are capped by a massive bridge-like structure that supports a number of buildings, referred to as the Chochin by the characters. And though unseen here, the Chochin is topped by Haven Academy and the CCCT Tower. Waterfalls cascade from the highest levels of the mountain and the Chochin, spilling through the heart of the city. Shops and houses pocket the ridge, entire centers of commerce connected by bridges between the two mountainsides, all showered with the spray from the waterfalls. The water all trickles down into the bottom of the city, where a mixture of urban sprawl and overgrown wetland have merged together into a veritable swamp where the walls of one building blur into the trees of the house next door. All of this is tethered together by a series of pipes that are all well maintained near the top of the mountain and deteriorate more and more as they descend into the urban swamps below, ending in crude stonework aqueducts that peek out from around the foliage and buildings. Ruby and John are in awe of this sight, while Crow just lays his hand on Ruby's head. Softest yet is the expression of Nora, who is sitting on the balcony's ledge, admiring the view and holding Ren's hand as they overlook the city. Crow asks if it was worth the wait, and John says that it's nice, but it could have been worth an even longer wait, motioning to the fresh bandage around Crow's waist. Crow waves them off, saying that the poison's almost completely out of his system, even motioning to his flask, see this kid? All in one painkiller and disinfectant, before taking a sip. John and Ruby look unamused, but Nora quickly pulls them out of their reprieve, eager to get up to the Chochin. Her and Ren have never had the chance to go all the way up there until now. As they enter one of the many glass elevators that pocket the mountain, Crow tells her to temper her expectations till they're done at Haven. Seeing Lionheart is the first priority. With that, they board the elevator and take off. The elevator emerges to the top of the Chochin, where Haven's clean, aesthetically pleasing campus awaits the crew. Things are quiet, however, and the crew are unsettled, standing on edge until they arrive at Leo's office. He's actually just leaving it, staring at his watch in concern as he bumbles out the door and into Crow. There's a brief surprise for all parties, and Ranger even reaches for their weapons, but no one draws them and no one falls on the ground. We're keeping the slapstick to a minimum for now. Leo, dusting himself off from the run-in, apologizes, explaining that time got the better of him and he forgot to meet them out in the courtyard. Crow is quick to forgive it, though he's steelier about the lack of people on campus, asking where all the teachers and students are. Leo replies that they're out on missions at Current, all of them. It'll be easier to explain if everyone gets situated in his office, though. So, the group crowd in and Leo begins to explain. Mistral has been in a state of disarray since the fall of Beacon, with initial panic in the streets bringing a significant number of Grimm to the city's border. Those were repelled, and order was somewhat restored, but the outward normality of everyday life hasn't tamed the unease in the hearts of the people. Grim attacks have been up, and growing worse, to the point that the Council made the hard decision to nationalize the Huntsman missions to better fend off the threat. Ruby speaks up, asking if that's why they pulled back support for the railway and couldn't send them an airship. This is the first time we see Leo really hesitate to respond, a brief flash of guilt on his face before he says that yes, there was a severely bad fight out at Kuchinashi that severely strained their resources. Sending a simple medevac when Crow was injured was the best he could do even after that particular crisis had receded. The Grimm have been relentless. Crow pinches his nose and asks where the students are if that's the case, and Leo explains that someone had to start taking care of the private huntsman missions being put out on the boards. Crow slams his hands on the desk, asking what Leo means by that. Leo says that the pragmatic solution was to make the students take on everyday complaints so that the people of Mistral aren't suffering while the trained huntsmen are busy. It serves as a good learning experience about real huntsman work and solves the demand in the marketplace in one go. Crow is taken aback, saying that there are missions on those boards that students couldn't possibly handle. Hell, there are criminals on those boards and kids have no practical way of knowing what missions to take and not take. He's thrown children to the wolves. Leo hardens his expression and stands, saying, As much as I would love to go gallivanting around the countryside, Crow, I have an entire city to manage, half the population of which already hate my guts. Unlike you, I can't shirk my position and lapse into unemployment. People are depending on my decisions to keep them safe, and if it means those who have pledged to protect our world make that sacrifice early, then so be it. Crow raises his hands in the air and growls about how great the situation is. A school without any teachers or students, absolutely wonderful. Then who, he asks, is guarding the relic? Just little old retired Lionheart? Leo takes indignance to that, puffing out his chest that he's not too old he can't fight. Besides, Osman's idea of security is laughable. The vault already needs the spring maiden to open. Everything else around that is just redundancy. And it isn't just him. Students are still frequently on campus, they're just busier than normal. A quiet campus isn't a deserted one. Crow says that the redundancy is vital when John asks what Lionheart is talking about. Realizing the discussion had gotten far more heated than he intended, Lionheart straightens up and asks how much Crow let them in on. 
Crow says he hit most of the important parts, and he'd have told them more if he hadn't been, well, you know, motioning to the bandage at his waist. He turns to the kids and explains that only maidens can open the vaults where the relics are stored. Pointedly, he turns to Leo and sees that they are supposed to be the last line of defense protecting the relics, but Lionheart stands strong against the glare. Leo continues that only the Spring Maiden can open the Mistral Vault, and she vanished years ago, running away from her duty decades prior. But it's clear she didn't defect either, or else they'd already have her kicking down their door. Which is why we have teachers to guard it, just in case, Crow grouses, crossing his arms. Before Lionheart can retort, though, he rolls his eyes. He brushes by his own point, sick of the argument, and says that he might actually know why that is. He had a chat with Raven before he linked up with the kids, and he's pretty sure the Maiden fled to the Branwyn tribe. Ruby steps in, asking, Yangs? Mom? One and the same, Crow replies. With the kind of damage the tribe has been wrecking recently, most notably Shion, they have to have a Maiden backing their plays, and Raven all but confirmed it when they talked. The only problem Crow sees now is finding where the Branwyn tribe is and convincing the Maiden to join the Yellow Brick Bunch. Fortunately for them, Crow knows the tribe's habits. Unfortunately for them, Raven knows he's onto them and the usual haunts haven't panned out from what he could see. He's sure he can find them, but it's going to take some digging. After that, it's just a matter of scrounging up enough willing huntsmen to assist in case talking with Raven goes south and they'll be golden. Leo's not keen on that idea either, since Mistral needs every huntsman it can right now. Even if they get lucky, and there's a pocket of time where the Grim are easier to deal with, there's uneasy political tensions between Mistral and Atlas, what with the trade embargo going into effect. They won't feel it immediately, but the squeeze on imported dust is going to make the people of Mistral quite distressed. There's even talk of starting war with Atlas, to reopen the dust flow by right of conquest and bolster the spirits of the populace once and for all behind a jingoistic cause. Ren balks at the idea of open war, and Nora helpfully chimes in that, yeah, that's a bad idea, remember the last major war? Ended bad for everyone! Lionheart agrees, saying that an attack on Atlas is suicidal for Mistral, but Beacon's fall and Vale's absence from the political stage have made the international scene an absolute mess. Crow asks about any leads they have in the other direction, the infiltrators from Mistral during the Vital Festival. Leo shakes his head. Cinder and Emerald were unknown quantities with clean transcripts coming in, and though Mercury's father was a known assassin, the combat academies have seen their fair share of bad seeds turn good. But the fact that Cinder managed to worm her way onto the faculty without a problem contributed to his vote in the council nationalizing the Huntsman. His trust in his own subordinates had been shaken thoroughly. Regardless, their personal effects on the campus have already been searched and nothing of use could be found. It's as if they vanished into the wind. At this rate, the best course of action would be to find the Spring Maiden and find a way to get her as far from Mistral as possible. Crow sighs and says that they can start looking into where Raven and the gang might be, but he's adamant that Leo start looking into bolstering the school with some kind of security. Leo promises to do what he can with his limited free time, but there's only so much he can do at this rate and so few people he can trust. Crow agrees that those seem to be in short supply before waving the kids out of the room. They give warm goodbyes to Leo, which only seem to make him feel more guilty. With the door closed, he collapses onto his chair, and Watts' logo appears as a hologram over his desk, shitting him for his flimsy acting ability. In the hall, Ranger discuss how they should go about investigating for clues to the Branwyn camp location, and Crow just tells them to leave it to him. The four of them have been through enough as it is for the last few weeks. They deserve a little time off. When they ask what he'll be doing, he just waves them off and says he'll be self-medicating in a local dive. Ruby watches, concerned as he pulls away from them towards the elevator. John asks if he's going to be okay, and Ruby says that she doesn't know. Nora jumps between their shoulders and says that he'll be fine. Besides, hey, they have the house all to themselves until he gets home, and that means slumber party! John refuses since they've been backpacking for weeks together at this rate, and during this debate, a curious pair of shoes come into focus further down the campus. The feet approach and call out to them, and the camera lifts to show Arslan Atlan, as well as Scarlet and Sage, all three of which look tired and bedraggled. Greetings with Scarlet and Sage are amenable, what with cracks about Sun taking off, and well wishes that Neptune's recovery is going well back in patch. They're also quick to explain they're only popping onto campus between missions. They've been run ragged, and this will be their only night on campus for a whole month provided the schedule stays steady. They were just on their way from the dorms to the onsen in the Cho Chin's mall when they ran into each other, and Sage recommends if they get the chance to check it out. It's super relaxing. Arslan's greeting is quieter and reserved, looking on John, Nora, and Ren with some amount of pity, sadness, and regret. Pira's death lingers heavily over the whole conversation. 
Arslan expresses regret that the last time they all worked together it wasn't under better circumstances, and that they have to meet with just as unpleasant circumstances as well. John agrees, but it's nice to know that Team Auburn made it home safely. Arslan just seems to nod through that concern and finally asks if they know who did it. Surprisingly, Ruby butts in, answering with Cinder's name, and Nora adds confidently and with no small hints of rage that they'll get the people responsible for what happened. Arslan responds, half playfully, half seriously, only if she doesn't get to those people first. They took away her chance to rematch Pyrrha ever again. They better watch out for the real Mistrillian champion coming their way. Before this could accidentally come off as more of an insult towards Pyrrha, Ren, and Nora, Scarlet rolls his eyes and grabs her by the elbow, telling her to tone down the machismo. He says that as much as he'd love to chat with the crew, they really need to get going. The rest of Auburn are already there at the hot springs, and they're probably waiting for them. The group say their goodbyes and hope they run into each other again soon, then ultimately part ways. Nora caps the scene by bringing back up the idea of a slumber party as they get into the elevator. As the elevator descends, we far outpace it with the camera and transition into the slums of Mistral to a storefront called The Chop Shop, and the attached apartment building beside it. Presumably a vehicle repair company, we quickly learn it serves as a front for a White Fang base, as well as a workshop for Watts, slaving on a scroll while seated at a workbench. He pulls up the soldering goggles to admire his work before speaking to a different active scroll beside him. On the other end is Leo, who is asking if it will be hard to find the Branwyn tribe. Watt says that it will take some time no doubt, but Salem has reinforcements on the way to the city proper in order to do more groundwork. Once they're here, he has faith that they'll be able to at very least outpace Crow in his children's investigation, if only by a slim margin. It's clear in his inflection he doesn't have a high opinion of the reinforcements in question. When Leo asks how the White Fang are doing, Watts replies that they're doing quite well by his understanding, and when he's done with these modified scrolls, they'll be unstoppable. He lifts the scroll and activates it, checking its signal to make sure it's strong before saying, Oh, I'm sure the city will be in for quite the surprise indeed. We transition through the glass screen and into the glass arboretum of the house Ranger is staying at, which from now on I'll call the Oz House because it's the house Ozpin would use while in the city. This factoid will be brought up in incidental conversation, but I'm sick of referring to it as just the house. Nora is towering over the rest of Ranger, proudly holding her game piece high and boasting about her victory. Ren comments that it's only turn one and she's quick to shush him before rolling the dice. John replies that she's won the last three games, no reason she won't win this one, and Ruby is quick to point out that she only won the second game because Nora tried to eat John's game piece. There's a knock at the door, and when they ask who it is, a muffled voice asks if this is where he can find Team Ranger. They hesitantly tell him that he's in the right place, and Ruby goes to answer the door. She opens it to find someone carrying a drunk, giggling crow, who's blabbing about finding him and, I did it. Ruby, seeing her uncle in such a state, sighs and thanks the stranger, motioning John to come over and take Crow to the couch. However, when they lift Crow off the man, his and Ruby's eyes meet, revealing Roman Torchwick. The two freeze and stare at each other. Roman just mutters a confused, Red? before the scene cuts to black. Episode 3 picks up with Weiss on her way to Mistral. This scene is basically unchanged from the original, with the caveat that the airship she's stowing away on is not a flying dumpster in design. Instead, Weiss is riding in the world-class luxury of an Atlas military cargo ship, which more or less matches the aesthetic of Atlas technology and resembles a C-130 Hercules. This makes it slightly less maneuverable than the flying UPS van, but way more appealing aesthetically, and instead of having a sound mixer, it has actual flight controls. But yeah, other than that, the scene goes on normally. There's mentions of congested airspace around Northern Anima from Pilot Boy, the distress signal from a nearby ship being attacked by Grimm, Weiss wanting to go save them, and Pilot Boy shutting her down hard. Weiss stares forlornly out the cockpit window, seeing a storm on the horizon, and we hard cut to a different storm above Menagerie, as the first of the spring monsoons hits the city of Kuokuana. We pan down to find Blake, exhausted in ankle-deep water just outside the city walls. The wall itself is made of a heavy wooden frame reinforcing large sarsens, capped with aged gun turrets for aerial defenses. She's fending off the remains of a small pack of Beowulfs, periodically calling back the sun and the other guards who are busy building sandbag barriers around the wooden gate to keep water out of the city, as well as other workers bucketing water out before they close the gate for the season. Soon enough, Sun and the other guards finish with the sandbags, closing the door. Blake finishes off all but two of the Beowulfs, using Gamble Shroud to escape up the side of the wall, while Floodwaters sweep the two Grimm away with a comical little arf sound as they flow downstream. Blake braces herself against the city wall, while Sun walks up beside her and says she really swept them off their feet, didn't she? Blake gives a glare that only a wet cat can. 
Sun backpedals, but only slightly, defending his need to inject some levity in things. He promises to be the one outside the wall next time, and Blake throws her soaked hood at him before snickering at his disgruntled face. We transition over to the police station, where the two grab towels to dry off, and Sun asks if they're going to take another shot at interrogating the White Fang members in custody again tonight. Blake says yes, but she's not sure how much they'll get out of them. They've all been incredibly tight-lipped. Well, except Ilya and Corsic, but one was just a pawn to the leadership, and the other won't shut up about things that don't matter. I swear, she says. Be easier to talk with these people if they were mute. So then we cut over to Mistral, where we hear Yang complaining with no small amount of disbelief, how could you get us lost? We get a little more perspective where the two of them have stopped beside the walls of Oniyuri, and Neo seems genuinely remorseful and shamed as she quickly signs to Yang that she's not good at reading maps. Yang sighs and grabs her face, groaning that it really shouldn't be that hard. Neo puffs her cheeks out and waves the paper in Yang's face, signing that there's a lot going on with the map, and it's really hard to read while holding onto a moving motorcycle. Yang takes the map from Neo and walks beside her, folding it in her hands to look at just the local area. On the back of it, we can see a number of circled sites crossed off. Yang points to a spot and says, Look, here, we can get back on track at this town called Kuro... Juru? Whatever, we can get back on track there and make it before sundown. Neo nods at the suggestion and Yang challenges her to memorize the route before they get back to it. She'll do the same, but she wants an extra set of eyes on this one. Yang makes a casual remark that she never thought she'd find someone worse at maps than Ruby, and Neo pouts, signing, at least I'm a better fighter. Yang raises a brow and challenges that, asking when the last time she fought Ruby was. Neo raises her hands to speak, only to put them back down, repeating this a couple of times as she decides to word things better, ultimately settling on saying that Ruby cheated. Yang folds her arms and nods, smug knowing that Ruby bested Neo, and Neo just stamps her foot that Ruby didn't fight fair. Yang asks when Neo ever fought fair, and Neo brushes back a lock of hair, signing that she always gives her opponents a fighting chance, just not the most balanced chance. She should just ask the last three bandit tribes they ran into. Yang rolls her eyes and says that there's a stream nearby and she's going to fill up their canteens. Neo should have that map memorized by the time she gets back. Neo sends her off with a raspberry. As Yang walks past the entrance to Oniyuri, she slows down and looks into the desolate settlement, and in the background we hear rising white noise, as the settlement begins to blur and overlay with Beacon Cafeteria. Before it can consume her, she blinks out of it, shakes her head, and continues her way towards the stream. We hear an echo of Blake's scream when she got stabbed, overlay with Blake's frustrated groan, as we cut back to the Kuokuana guard precinct where Blake is frustrated with interrogating the prisoners. In front of her is Trifa, who gives Blake an absent stare. Blake slams her hand on the table and orders a change of prisoner. Trifa gives Blake a smirk before we cut to Yuma being brought into the room. He obnoxiously asks to see his lawyer, smug grin on his face the whole time. Blake says that he's a terrorist, he doesn't get a lawyer. He leans back in his chair and asks if that means she wouldn't get a lawyer either if she were in his place. Blake twitches at the barb, and he continues to say that they still haven't read him his rights, so they have to let him go by law, right? Don't want your citizenry getting mad at prolonged detainment, do you? Biting her tongue, she orders him away and calls for Corsic. However, when Corsic is led to the doorway, Blake takes one glance at the wild look in his eyes and orders him back to his cell, saying that she wants to see Ilya instead. Ilya is sat down in the chair, and across from her, Blake has her head in her hands, groaning. Ilya asks if interrogations are going well, to which Blake groans more. Ilya leans forward and rests her hands in front of Blake, saying she wishes she could do more to help. Blake hesitantly pats Ilya's chained wrist, saying that Ilya seems to be the only sane member of the White Fang left. For all the good that's doing you, Ilya jokes. Blake admits she doesn't have anything to ask Ilya since she's already given up all she can. It's just nice to hear a friendly voice in a cavalcade of crazy people. Ilya narrows her eyes and reminds Blake that those people are her colleagues. Trifa and Yuma are genuinely friends of hers. Friends, huh? Blake pulls away from Ilya and wonders briefly if she'd have been more like Ilya or if she'd be more like them if she hadn't left the White Fang. What would have happened if she had stayed? Ilya says Blake wouldn't have set her house on fire, and Blake blushes from that, saying Ilya didn't make things easy on her. Ilya laughs, but it peters out, and she says that as much as he tries to imagine Blake back in the White Fang, she can't see it. Every time she does, she only sees the old Blake she thought she knew, not this Blake in front of her. And if that Blake was inside of her the whole time, it'd probably have been impossible for her to stay in the Fang at all. 
Blake takes those words to heart and thanks Ilya, sending her back to her cell. Blake and Sun link up on their way back to the lockers, and she starts a small conversation about how poorly the interrogations are going. They're making zero progress, and today was the last day they'd have carte blanche to interview them. The new captain of the guard is being appointed today by the Elder Council, and word has it that a White Fang sympathizer is the likeliest candidate. Blake scowls at the idea of fighting corruption from the inside again, and they round the corner where they see a news report airing from the town hall of Kuokuana. Gira is mid-speech, and while it sounds like normal politician pleasantries at first, he mentions that he has elected to not heed the council's decision, and made an executive choice for leader of the Kuokuana Guard and Menagerie Militia. He steps aside and declares that Kelly Belladonna will be made the new captain in Saber Rodentia's stead. Blake, Sun, the precinct, and the universe stare in shock as Kelly steps on stage and evolves from Cat Mom to Cop Cat Mom. The scene goes dark and the episode ends. Rolling into episode 4, we pick up with Ranger meeting Roman. There is a collective freeze as all members of the room stare at each other, unsure of what to do. Everyone clearly confused as to what is going on. This doesn't last forever, however, and Nora is the first to react, grabbing the table, spilling its contents, and full-on chucking it at the open door. Roman narrowly dodges out of the way, and as he still registers that it was, indeed, an entire table that was just flung at him, Ruby slams the other door in his face and tells the crew to get their weapons. What follows is a quick slapstick mini-action scene as Roman tries desperately to explain himself and Team Ranger constantly misconstruing his intentions, making them even more violent towards him. During this engagement, Crow is practically useless, juggled by John in a drunken stupor. Finally, the fight concludes with Roman tied up, Nora raising the table over his head in order to cave it in, and Crow finally burbling out that Roman is in fact Ozpin, before face-planting on the floor. Everyone freezes, and the restrained Roman sighs, saying that there is a lot to explain. We cut to Roman, still tied up on the couch, seated in front of the now repositioned table, with the entire crew surrounding it, all clearly distrustful of him. Crow is on the opposite couch, being nursed back to sobriety by Ren by helping him down a glass of water. Roman acknowledges that he likes this about as much as they do. If he had a choice, he'd still be in Vale, but fate apparently has a way of screwing everyone over. The quartet expresses their doubts, with Nora saying they don't exactly believe him except for Crow's words. And as you can probably tell, that's on shaky ground right now. Roman admits that being vouched for by a lush isn't the most ideal situation, but it wouldn't be the first time and he's confident it won't be the last. Ranger look at him, their doubt only growing, and we hear Ospin speaking to Roman in his head, suggesting that he take over to give proper explanations. Roman argues against it, not keen to hand over autonomy so easily. And for a brief second, we get a camera shift to show Ranger staring at him with added distrust as he argues with himself. Ultimately, Ospin makes the point that he knows exactly how to win them over, and it will only work if it's in his unique cadence. Roman pinches his nose with his tethered hands, then points to the kids, saying, Just remember, I'm still here, and I will be listening. Closing his eyes, Roman gives control over to Ozpin, though without any weird glowing flourish, since we've not really seen that effect ever again throughout the original series. Ozpin amicably greets the team, and while the mood eases somewhat, their doubts linger. Ozpin dispels it completely by looking Ruby in the eye and asking if she remembers the first thing he ever said to her, then repeating verbatim his remark about her eyes. Ruby is taken aback, but then he follows that up by saying his I have made more mistakes speech, and she remarks with some amazement that she genuinely believes that they're talking to Ozpin. It takes a moment to register, and once it does, Nora is ecstatic, suggesting they take him to Lionheart so they can get everyone on the same page. Crow, surprisingly, speaks up through a slowly onsetting hangover, saying that it might not be the best of ideas. Ospin elaborates that while his return is a good thing, Leo's loyalty is only matched by his more… ineloquent nature. Ren asks if they don't trust Leo, and Ospin refutes that, saying that the man simply has loose lips. Essentially, Oz is afraid that Leo will accidentally out Ospin's return to the Council, who are more prone to corruption, and thus spoil a significant advantage their coalition now has. While their enemies are aware of Ozpin's ability to hop bodies, to whom is always in question, and oftentimes it has been someone less formidable or able to freely travel. Thus, being reincarnated into Roman and linking up with allies so quickly is a boon they shouldn't be eager to spoil. John speaks up, questioning how exactly the reincarnation works, and why would he choose Roman of all people? Ozpin explains that he doesn't get a choice. Reincarnation like his can be seen as a gift, but in reality, it's a curse from the gods themselves a decree that he walk the earth for all time to ensure the relics bestowed to humanity remain separate. Like the seasons themselves cannot happen all at once, all four relics cannot be in the same place at the same time, else doom will befall the world. 
The room is silent as the weight of his words land, and Ruby, resolute, steps up and asks what they need to do. Osborn smiles and says that they've already got a fairly good plan ahead of them. Locate the Spring Maiden and the Branwyn tribe, convince her, either by carrot or by stick if necessary, to rejoin the cause, and get her as far away from Mistral as possible to ensure the vault remains sealed. As for tonight, they should continue to rest. They can hit the investigation once everyone's fully recovered. Eyes of course turn to Crow, who winces in pain from a slowly growing headache. There's only a bit of quiet before Ruby asks what they'll do with Roman. Osman gives her a sheepish smile, saying that while Roman certainly has a disagreeable temperament, he's agreed to humor Ospin's mission, so far as to not actively harm any of Ospin's conspirators or plans. Even after all these months, they still don't quite see eye to eye, but they're in an agreeable position for the time being, and the crew should learn to tolerate his presence as a tag-along, if not a full member of the team. Ospin remarks that he's probably already overstayed his welcome, and says that he's always there, if not easily reached or heard. Closing his eyes, Roman returns to awareness. Roman blinks and mutters under his breath, Agreeable position, my ass, before turning to the group and elaborating that he thought being pestered 15 times a day about Ospin's noble quest would be tolerable. But Ospin has proven to be painfully more persistent than his own conscience, and he was starting to lose sleep. John raises a brow and asks how that little factoid would endear him to them, and Roman pauses for a moment before shrugging and saying, I was just being honest. Roman stands and looks around the living room before asking which way it is to his room. He needs to get some shut-eye. We cut to Weiss waking up in the main hold of the cargo airship, buckled into one of the many seats along the side. She gets up and goes to the front, and we have our pleasant conversation with Pilot Boy about the floating islands over Lake Matsu. And in addition to this scene, we have an overlay map in the cockpit showing us that Lake Matsu is the big old lake in the dead center of Anima. They get alerted a little too late to the Mistral airship under attack by Lancers, and what proceeds is roughly the same action sequence as what we see in the show. There are some noticeable changes though, aside from just another passive animation cleanup to catch flaws. One, since the airship is a much larger size, it is equally less maneuverable, and each turn, twist, and pitch should be felt in the viewer's stomach via animation and sound design. The second big change is to the Lancers themselves. There are more of them, but these are grim adapted to fight aircraft, maneuverable, fast, and small, in order to shear entire hulks of metal from the hull with a thousand cuts. With a variable swarm chasing the airship, Weiss needs to go all out on them, and thankfully the dust in the back of the ship helps that happen with her becoming a rapid-fire anti-aircraft battery raining hell out the back of the ship, not this podunk tiddlywinks low-energy pop gun we see in the canon show. This is so intense, in fact, that Myrton Aster actually glows bright red from overuse. This is the first major fight of the volume. We gotta send the people home. Odd. The final change to this comes partway through the fight, when all the Lancers have been dispersed. The ship's movement through the rocks awaken a full-sized Nevermore, which replaces the Queen Lancer from the final segment. The Nevermore serves as a more thematic representation of Weiss's growth, able to solo one, as well as a swarm of other Grimm, and having the Nevermore as a summon will lead to more interesting opportunities in the future. I honestly don't know who might be attached to the Lancer Queen, but since Weiss can adjust the size of her summons, she'll still have access to that summon going forward. Best of both worlds the way I see it. But yes, Weiss summons her knight, kills the Nevermore, and slows the crash of the plane. Unfortunately, the damage the airship has taken, combined with the force of the glyphs, begin to tear the hull apart. As they reach her last glyph, Weiss is flung out the back by an unrestrained box of dust and knocked out. When she comes to, she's floating in a shallow pool of water staring at the sky. This is where we get the bandits finding her and Raven knocking her out, ending the episode. Talk about a rough landing, but eh, she'll be fine. Just as fine as all of these wonderful patrons that have landed on my Patreon. I'd like to welcome Brandon Caddy, Heath Burrows, Ina, Sean Barry, Zero to Hero 148, Salazar, AHW, Joshua Banks, Catherine Matemate, Yin Pei, and Sean Shams. I'm glad to have you all seen around the bonfire, and I hope you're happy with what we've managed to build with this project. I can't wait to see you all in the tundra. Remember that you too can gain access to the Tundra, the Team Frostbite Discord server, for $1 or more to my Patreon. There, you can interact with all sorts of other Ruby fans, as well as other prominent Ruby community members such as myself, Fatman Falling, Dashie Lee, and the Sketchy Huntsman. Join us for regular activities such as Bad Fan Fiction Night, which I host every Friday evening. I'd love to see you all in there, so consider signing up today! That's all for now, back to your regularly scheduled fixing! Episode 5 opens from the perspective of the bottom of a teacup, looking up at Callie as she's about to pour a freshly made kettle. 
She winces, however, as Blake's loud, furious voice screams in her direction, though Callie's face remains composed otherwise. Blake is in utter disbelief that Gira would choose his own wife to be captain of the Guard and militia, asking how he can justify such blatant nepotism considering that this is the exact kind of corruption he spent the better part of his life fighting. Gira is calmly sipping at his wife's tea, not paying much mind to Blake, and in fact outright ignoring her as he turns to Callie and asks if she's done something different with her tea today since it tastes sweeter. Blake shouts at them not to ignore her, and Sun, who is seated at the table across from them, agrees that the tea does taste sweeter. Kinda likes it. Blake snaps at him to back her up, and he just shrugs, saying that the tea is, in fact, nice. She pinches her nose and breathes to calm herself, taking a languid sit at the table next to Sun, who pours her a cup with his tail. Blake states more calmly this time that Gira should know how messed up the situation is. Gira finally replies to her, saying this was the only move he could make. The person the Elder Council were most heavily considering was a White Fang sympathizer and would have put a kibosh on the investigation. He needed to choose a candidate quickly and make his veto of their decision known. And who is there more trustworthy than his beloved wife? Callie gives a small mom wave before returning to her tea. Blake doubles down that this is how deep-seated corruption starts, with necessary actions, but Sun speaks up and hijacks the conversation by pointing out that it's doubly weird to choose Blake's mom. Like, why choose her of all people? The three cat faunas turn and give Sun a confused look. He blinks and asks if he's missing something. Blake replies that Callie was once captain of the militia decades ago, and Callie waves off that statement telling Blake not to say it like that. It makes her sound like an old woman, though it was almost 20 years back. Sun sputters his tea, wiping his mouth in surprise, asking if she really was captain. Blake rolls her eyes, saying, of course she was. She's still wearing the formal guard uniform. Sun's eyes bulge, stating with disbelief that that is the formal guard uniform, and Callie responds that it's had a few modifications for everyday use, but she's always loved the way it hugged her figure. Blake is about to point out that she herself has worn an outfit like that for the formal events, before realizing Sun never actually went to those formal events, and has quite possibly never seen a woman in dress uniform. Gira regains control of the conversation and says that with Callie's prior work, she was a natural fit and easily overqualified. Besides, this will possibly push people towards favoring the Democratic Council movement that he's been a major proponent of the last few years. Having blatant corruption in the face of the populace might spur people to push for change in the system. Blake challenges that the only change that might happen is Gira's removal from office, but he says it's a risk he's willing to take. There is a known active terrorist threat that has already tried to undermine the leadership of Menagerie and attempted an assassination on his family. If extreme action isn't warranted now, then when? And while he appreciates the good he can do well in office, his family comes first, as does the well-being of his people. Blake sighs and puts her head in her hands, giving Sun the room to ask why Callie left the position in the first place. She and Gira have a sappy parent moment where they lean together and say that she fell in love. And with Gira being a major political activist, it made it hard to be impartial. Ultimately, she chose to have a family with him over her career. Gira moves the conversation along again, saying this appointment may only end up being temporary. If the Council vote unanimously to override him, the appointment will be overturned. Luckily, there's a few voices of reason among the Elders, at least for now, so they'll have a little time to work with. He projects something like two or three months at least. If they work hard enough, it should be enough time to figure out what the White Fang are trying to do in the long run and find a way to stop it. Blake is amazed at how flippant they're being at the possibility of losing their jobs and positions, but Kelly shrugs that off. A job, an appointment, those things usually wind up being temporary no matter what. She and Gira will still have each other, they'll still have Blake, and they'll still have their home. Well, what's left of it. The situation still doesn't sit well with Blake. Her mom being a yes-man for Gira makes her stomach royal. At that, Callie gets indignant, saying she was captain of the guard for years before marrying Gira, and Blake should know better than to think she just follow his orders blindly. Blake points out that she's never seen the two of them disagree, not on anything serious, and Gira turns that around, saying that's because they talk through their problems before deciding on a solution. They don't always agree on the approach, but they agree on a unified approach in the end, even if neither of them are happy about it. Bad optics as it is, Callie says that it's the best decision they have on the table. With no one else to trust and the guard needing a captain, this was the only good choice they had. Blake is still uneasy about this, and Gira replies, Well, you shouldn't. It's completely out of your control. You'll just have to live with your mom outranking you. All eyes fall to Callie as she grins mischievously. And for our first official act, let's arrange a play date. The camera zooms in on the bookshelf behind Callie, where we see the spine of a copy of A Man With Two Souls. 
We transition smoothly to a gloved hand pulling the copy off a shelf. There is a distant ticking sound and we pan past a nearby clock. The camera refocuses on the now open book and zooms out to show Adam Torres, reading it to pass the time in his private chambers, dressed down for comfort. He wears a neutral expression, but as time fades on through the miracle of montage, he gets more and more frustrated. Eventually, he looks at the clock, which is now hours ahead of where we last saw it, and with a yell, he throws the book at the wall. Standing, he approaches the door and hears Blake's voice echoing off the book that he's an animal. He pauses, walks over to the book, picks it up, and puts it back on the table gingerly. He walks back to the door and opens it into the hallway. It opens into a dramatically different location than the White Fang HQ, a sterile, cold, and claustrophobic kitchenette of an apartment. The camera angles are all Dutch, and there's a slight glow to everything, letting us know this isn't quite real. Adam walks through the door, noticing two pairs of shoes at the entrance, and passes the table holding an empty medicine bottle with an attached handwritten note that says refill ASAP in big, bold letters. Adam hears noises from a nearby room and moves to open the door. The noises, though hard to discern, get louder, and a woman's voice can be heard shouting Adam's name in surprise. The vision fades as a male voice begins to talk, and we blink back to reality, where Adam has opened the door from the hallway to another part of the base. A mook is telling him that the menagerie forces have arrived, or what's left of them. Adam asks the man to elaborate, and he explains that apparently the coup attempt in Menagerie failed, and most of the White Fang and Kuokuwana have been arrested pending further investigation. Those that made it back barely slipped by the harbor patrols as is. As far as they can tell, the White Fang has lost its foothold in Menagerie. Adam, stone-faced, looks to the man before turning around and slamming the door. The door slam is our transition to the door slamming on the interrogation cell of the Kuokuwana Guard HQ. Ilya jumps as Kelly leans forward across from her. Ilya laughs awkwardly and says it's strange to meet Mrs. Belladonna here, but Callie smoothly deflects the comment, saying it's not unusual to see family friends from time to time now, is it? Ilya looks to raise a question about that statement, but Kelly transitions into asking her about her friends, particularly the people she works with in the White Fang. Ilya is even more confused now, and what follows is a montage of scenes as we hop back and forth between Callie interviewing Ilya and intermittently interviewing Trifa, Yuma, and Korsak. During each Ilya segment, we get a commentary on one of the three's personality quirks, while in the follow-up scene with that character, we get Callie exploiting that personality quirk. Behind the one-way mirror, Sun remarks to Blake that he never wants to get on her bad side, and Blake just agrees with a muted, shocked nod. All of this comes to a head as Callie manipulates each of the three inmates to think that they've been sold out by the others, leading them to spill information that Kelly can further exploit. The culmination of this interrogation has Corsic spitting and raving about something called Fenrir, and how it'll consume the world of man, leaving Faunus the only true ruling caste. We cut back to Callie talking with Ilya, and finally she brings up the term Fenrir, quoting Corsic's raving diatribe. Ilya laughs it off. Operation Fenrir was a pipe dream of kin on Ryu back before he was ousted by Sienna Khan. It was some kind of full-scale coup d'etat in Mistral, but it was never practical because of the scale of land they needed to cover in order to hold the power. Besides, anything they tried would be stopped by Atlas, which just closed its borders, or Vale, who are too busy recovering from the fall of Beacon. Ilya mumbles to herself about logistics and manpower before she goes completely quiet. Finally, she mutters to herself, Oh my god. Callie smiles and stands, wrapping a warm hand over Ilya's. She says it's clear that Ilya has a lot to think about, and Callie's going to give her time to do it. She should think over what she wants to discuss next before they meet again tomorrow. Ilya just stares at her, visibly disturbed by the prospect of whatever Operation Fenrir truly is. Callie saunters out of the room, though Ilya tries to stop her, wanting to continue talking, that it's important. But Callie just says, Same time tomorrow. If you really want to talk, we'll have someone give you a pen and paper to write your thoughts down so you don't miss a thing the next time we have a conversation. Still inside the mirror, Sun is banging on the window, begging, No, 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 don't end on a cliffhanger! Come on, I hate those! Blake just mumbles to herself, How did I get away with anything as a kid? Gira just says, Trust me, you didn't, and I had to hear all about it. Kelly walks into the room, remarking that this has been quite the productive day, and Sun complains that it's clear that Ilya wants to keep talking. Kelly explains that, sure, Ilya will talk, and talk, and talk and tomorrow she'll remember three more important things she'll want to talk about. And all that time, they would be chasing their own tails, emphasized by pulling on Sun's tail, following incomplete information. Let Ilya stew on it, write her thoughts down, compose herself, and tomorrow they'll have just about everything they need to know. For now, 
they just have to wait. The four of them go quiet, watching Ilya get taken out of the room back to her cell, and then Gira approaches the idea of clocking out early and getting dinner, to which everyone but Sun readily agrees. Sun is still in shock over everything, trying to process it, and complains that leaving off on a note like that is just like an episode of your favorite show cutting to black. And in the middle of him saying the word black, the episode ends. The next episode opens with Muffled talking, as Weiss slowly wakes up. She only opens her eyes briefly before a leg passes in front of her and she closes them again, pretending to still be unconscious. Around her is a heated, muffled discussion and very quickly the voices come into focus as we realize Weiss is laying on the ground, having been tied at the ankles and with her arms behind her back. The first clear voice we hear is a man's voice saying they need to bury the body soon or else the sacrilege will start to upset the tribe. They've already begun prepping the body. A woman's voice, Ravens, acknowledges this and orders them to take care of it as soon as the largest debris has been removed from the ruins. After that, they can strip it for parts. Sacrilege or not, that scrap will be useful. A second female voice asks, What do you think we should do with her? And Weiss tenses since she knows who they're talking about. Raven says that, ideally, they'll just kill her and be done with it, but the second woman says that they can't do that, and the man quickly agrees that one unnatural death is already one too many. Raven sighs and says that she knows, but it doesn't make it any less annoying. We see her feet enter frame as she stands over Weiss and asks, What do you think, Schnee? Weiss opens her eyes to look up at Raven's figure towering over her. She appraises her surroundings. They're inside the heart of an encampment of yurts, among a crowd of bustling bandits who are all scurrying about to take care of different jobs. Most only spare Weiss a passing glance, but a small throng stand before her, led by Raven, who is flanked by two more distinct members. The first is Shady Man, or as he's been renamed in this fixing, Shiloh Man, in order to kind of obfuscate the pun a little bit. Writers, listen to me. In a show that already has several on-the-nose names, you can't just throw one at us that just is the nose. The second is a young woman around Weiss's age, with tan skin, a red color scheme, and black and brown hair peppered with white lilies. Weiss looks at the group of bandits nervously before seeing a ritually wrapped body not too far from where they are. Pilot's boy's helmet placed atop its chest. Weiss's face quickly cycles through horror, crestfallen, and then apprehension. Raven, seeing this reaction, says the man died in the crash. She should be happy he's going to be getting a burial at all. That little stunt of theirs ended up doing quite a bit of damage. Weiss tries to sit up, but winces against her restraints, saying, Well, sorry, next time I crash an airship, I'll pick a more convenient location for you. The younger woman snaps, Watch it! Your crash damaged our ruins! Weiss digests what was just said and blinks, replying, They're ruins. How can you tell? Raven rolls her eyes and says, Lesions. Weiss glares at Raven and says, How do I know I can trust your word? For all I know, you killed him. You were just talking about killing me. Shiloh speaks up and says, You're not gonna be killed here, kid. We're bandits, not savages. He turns to Raven. Honestly, I don't think we have a lot of options here. Either she stays with us, or we send her into the forest on her own. Raven replies, I don't like either of those options, but you're right. Raven uses her foot to lift Weiss's chin. Even if we set her free, wouldn't feel right to chase her down and kill her after she survived that crash. As much damage as she did to the ruins, that was impressive work. The girl next to her shrugs. Could be useful. She might be a pampered princess, but if she can fight, she might be able to hold her own here. Raven uses her toe to appraise Weiss's face before dropping it and stepping back. That's true. Raven pauses in thought before squatting down to be close to eye level with Weiss. Look here, princess. Weiss cuts in. Eris. And Raven continues. I don't care. You're on thin ice. I want you dead. And I can't kill you so long as you're here. So here's what will happen. You're going to be staying with us until we move camp again. If you play nice, we'll leave you here alive. And you can go on your merry way. If you don't, we'll throw you into the woods and use you as target practice. Raven stands. Either way, I wouldn't stray too far from camp if I were you. Weiss glares up at Raven and asks, So what? Am I going to get my own little tent? Please tell me they come with air conditioning. Or a fan. Shiloh also looks to Raven, giving a shrug. Actually, that's a good point. Uh, not about the air conditioning part, but where are we going to put her up? Not like we have any spare tents lying around. Raven crosses her arms and considers the situation. Good question. Vernal, she'll be staying with you. The girl next to Raven jumps in place, groaning, What? Mom? Raven waves a dismissive hand through the air as she walks off. You vouched for her, now she's your problem. The other collected tribe members seem to take this order in stride and begin to disperse, leaving Weiss alone with Vernal. Vernal is just staring after Raven, and Weiss manages to sit up on her knees. She sighs and mumbles, How do I even get myself into these things? Which attracts Vernal's attention. The two lock eyes for a heated second, Vernal glaring at Weiss. 
Lacking anything better to say to break the awkward tension, Weiss draws out, So... who does your hair? Renal groans and walks away. Weiss manages to hop up on her tied feet and begs, Hey, wait, at least untie me! As she hops after Vernal, her body obscures the camera. A moment later, the camera is unobscured by a bowl being lowered down, and we are now in a sushi bar in Menagerie, watching as Blake, her family, and Sun walk through the front doors. They're drenched from head to toe, and Sun complains, only to see the bright side, that a shower during a brisk walk is a great way to wake up after a long day at work. He turns to find the entire Belladonna family, wet cats, glaring at him. He shrivels under their gaze and quickly distracts himself with finding them a booth. The three watch him go before Callie and Blake look at each other. Callie sticks a bit of hair behind Blake's ears so it's not stuck to her face, and giggles at the sight of her waterlogged daughter. The three follow Sun to a booth that he's waving from and sits down. Sun stretches and says that whenever he gets back to Mistral, it's going to be weird. He's so used to the restaurant serving him right off the bat, he might be rusty sneaking into places. Gyura asks if he's had to do that often, and Sun thinks on it, counting on his hand before stopping and saying it'd be easier to tell Gyura the times he doesn't have to do that. Gyura mutters to himself that discrimination in Mistral must really have gotten bad in his absence, but Sun waves that off, saying, Nah, that's only like half the time. The other half, I'm just broke. Scarlet was always so crabby about the team's allowances. Or maybe that was just mine. Gira grips the bridge of his nose in frustration, and Blake is bewildered that the students of Haven got an allowance. Sun is surprised that the Beacon kids didn't get one, and here we learn a little bit about what distinguishes the schools from each other. At Beacon, materials are typically provided to the students unless budgeting was a specific part of the curriculum. While at Haven, the teams had quarterly allowances for their own supplies and equipment. Considering Mistral is the most economically oriented of the kingdoms, money management would be a key component of their teaching structure. Gira asks if Sun got less allowance because he was a faunus, or if it was because he was bad with money, and Sun says he was just bad with money. Honestly, the whole discrimination thing never really rang true to him. Sure, the city has its fair share of stores faunus aren't allowed in, but on campus everyone was equal for the most part. I mean, he says, Lionheart is the headmaster of Haven, a council member. He's one of the most powerful men in the world. And, like, he's the best one. I mean, Osmond had that whole mystery teacher vibe going on, but Lionheart would sit down with students and work out their problems. Guy was always super honest, and he'd take a bullet for anyone. Callie remarks that he seems like a reliable man, and Gira agrees, humming in approval of Osmond's eye for talent. Blake, however, asks if Sun's glowing appraisal isn't just because Lionheart would let some of Sun's shenanigans slide. Sun takes offense to that and says that it's only a little bit of the reason he's so appreciative of Lionheart. As Sun finishes speaking, a waiter arrives and asks what they'd like to order. We pass behind the waiter's back and we slide out from behind Vernal's back in the bandit camp, as one of the bandits sneers at her that he doesn't take orders from her. She returns that he takes orders from her mom, and unless he wants his ass on a pike, he better do what she says. She begins to draw a blade at her waist, and the guy panics for a moment before rushing to clean up the space around him, which is littered with empty cans and cartons of bygone drinks and food. Weiss pokes her head out of a nearby yurt, and for the first time we get a good look at the bandit camp. Instead of being the absolutely insane log wall enclosure military tent encampment, which looks ugly as sin, the Branwen bandit camp is now taking keys from a number of different cultures. In specific, we're invoking Mongolian and Ainu cultures. The tents are now Mongolian yurts, which all circle a nearby misty lake. As far as anyone can tell, there's no obvious defenses against the wilderness, though there is a reason for that we'll touch on later. The outfits and air of the tribe have only a fraction of that Mad Max-inspired biker gang aesthetic, though that's still definitely present. Instead, it pulls more from the Ainu, the native peoples of Japan. Weiss raises a brow at Vernal and says, isn't killing against the rules here? Vernal sneers at her and says, Killing is. Hurting is another story entirely. Sometimes it takes a little extra motivation for slobs to pick up after themselves. Weiss sympathizes. She used to have a roommate that was pretty slovenly. She'd always eat snacks in bed and hang posters with thumbtacks instead of frames. She actually shivers at the thought of it. Vernal glares at Weiss and tells her to stop. You might be staying with me, and I might have stood up for you, but we're not friends. Don't pretend that we are. Weiss gives Vernal a confused stare. I was just trying to make polite conversation. Vernal puts a hand on her hip and says, Well, that's to be expected of a pampered princess. Weiss replies, Eris, actually. Vernal asks what the difference is, and Weiss has to actually pause and think about it for a moment, never having to actually describe that before. Ultimately, she lands on the differences not mattering. She's not even an heiress anymore. Vernal says that's a shame, but it'll make Weiss stronger in the long run. What's the point in inheriting someone else's accomplishments? Weiss points out that Vernal just invoked Raven's name to get someone to do something. Vernal says that she can back all that up. Her mother's name is inherited strength, not inherited success. Weiss just shrugs, sarcastically saying, Whatever you say. 
Renault asks if Weiss has a point with coming out of her tent, and Weiss says that she was thinking about going for a walk around camp. She's already been in the tent for a couple of hours, and it's driving her stir crazy. Renault taunts the little princess for not having any patience, and Weiss's face twitches with frustration before settling. She composes herself and asks if it's alright if she walks around the camp. Renault says that her mother is being too lenient with Weiss, with no guards and Vernal doesn't exactly trust her to not steal something and run away. Weiss asks if that's what Vernal would do, and Vernal responds, haughtily, that she would, and Weiss wouldn't know it till she had gotten away scot-free. Regardless, it's probably best if Vernal keeps an eye on Weiss. As a compromise, Vernal offers to show Weiss around the camp during her rounds, though she warns, some of the folks here bite. Weiss accepts with a touch of hesitation. They begin their walk, and along its length, Vernal will occasionally shout orders for someone to clean up their yurt or to move something around, often getting frustrated in the process. During this, Weiss begins to ask Vernal questions, asking exactly what this tribe does. Vernal is frank when she says that Raven was telling the truth. They're bandits. Or at least that's what people call them, she supposes. It's a name they, like much else, took for themselves. Apparently it carries a pretty negative connotation out in civilized society, but to the tribe, it's just a way of life. If you can't protect what you hold most dear, you don't deserve to have it. Weiss raises a brow that they steal things for a living, but Vernal is quick to correct her. They don't steal, they take. Stealing is just a concept made by the weak to persuade the gullible. Weiss shakes her head at that, but doesn't attempt to voice any opposition just to keep the peace. She does, however, ask if that's why they took Mirnaster away from her. Vernal looks at her curiously before it dawns on her that Weiss is talking about her sword. Vernal says yes, but before she can go into detail about it, another bandit jogs up to Vernal, calling her Little Branwyn as a nickname. They look to find Shiloh approaching, and Vernal stomps her foot, telling him to stop calling her that. He slows his jog to a stop, and he rubs the back of his head, apologizing. Regardless, he came over to tell her that they're about to go on a raid of one of the nearby towns and asks her if she wants in. She seems to debate it, only to look to Weiss and give a frustrated sigh. She passes on the opportunity, saying she has to lug this deadweight around. Weiss takes exception to that, of course, but Shiloh is understanding, saying they'll have plenty of raids over the next couple of weeks. Vernal begins to smile at that, but expertly hides it away, dismissing him while tersely thanking him for his consideration. He laughs off her hardened exterior and goes to pat her on the head before reconsidering and saying his goodbyes. Vernal grinds her teeth as he leaves, murmuring how she just doesn't get that clown. Weiss watches the scene, not really sure what to make of it, before redirecting Vernal back to her original question. Seemingly relieved to be focusing on something else, Vernal casually remarks that, oh yeah, her mom took Weiss's little toothpick. Weiss asks why, and we cut to a distant shot of the camp, followed closely by a loud, shrieking, WHAT?! We next cut to Raven tending a turkey over a fire, a turkey that's suspended from an impromptu spit made out of Myrtonaster. She's humming a little tune to herself as Weiss comes barreling over to her, her face absolutely red and infuriated. Vernal is close behind, a touch of surprise on her face over Weiss's sudden outburst. Weiss points an accusatory finger at Raven, shouting, HOW DARE YOU BESMIRCH A FAMILY HEIRLOOM! Raven pauses while turning the spit to look up at Weiss, unflinching in the face of Weiss's impressive screaming. Raven scoffs, laughing at the very notion of a family heirloom. Weiss is unmoved by Raven's dismissiveness and continues her tirade, explaining that Myrton Nasser has been in the Schnee family line since her great-grandfather and has proudly served their lineage to defend the people of Atlas since... Raven starts flapping her hand to mock Weiss's talking, saying blah de blah de blah de blah and cutting her off. Raven says that talk is cheap, and from her perspective, the sword is hers to do with as she pleases. Weiss again argues that Raven has zero connection to it, but Raven turns it around and asks what would have happened to it should Weiss have died in her little airship crash. Like the ship's pilot did. Weiss recoils a little and goes silent. Raven continues that she knows what would have happened. This sword that served so many generations, a lineage of history, would have been found just like it had been here its pedigree completely lost to the tribe, and used as a spit for the rest of its pitiful existence. Sure, maybe it'd be used to kill a rogue grim or two, but nothing substantial. Best case scenario, it becomes a cooking implement. Worst case, it gets discarded and forgotten. And Weiss would just be another corpse on the pile, powerless to do anything about it. Weiss is shaking at this point, and after a pause, she quietly seethes for Raven to give it back. Raven asks her to speak up, and Weiss does ordering her to give it back. Raven cocks her head to the side and says, Make me. Weiss continues to shudder before bowing her head and muttering, Please. Raven laughs, pointing to how the mighty princess of Atlas has fallen, asking a petty bandit for her weapon back. Well, no, she's not getting it back. Weiss looks up and says, I'm not a princess, I'm an heiress. And I wasn't asking, I was being polite. 
From behind Raven comes the blade of Weiss's knight, lining up to Raven's throat. Raven looks at Weiss in surprise, and the entire clearing freezes. We see Vernal reaching for her knife, and the surrounding tribe moving towards their weapons. And then Raven laughs. She flips the hilt in her hand and holds it out for Weiss to take, which she does. Once Mirt Nasser is safe in hand, Weiss dismisses her summon. To that, Raven applauds her backbone before she steps closer and says that if Weiss ever threatens Raven again, she'll eat every word she's ever said and the tip of her own blade. Weiss stares her straight in the eye, and we see a flash of fear before she hardens and replies, Make me. She then lifts the turkey on Mirt Nasser to her lips and bites an entire chunk out of it. A second later, she spits it back out because it's too hot to eat. Again, Raven begins to laugh, and soon the surrounding tribe does as well, including Vernal. And through that laughter, we transition to the Menagerie Sushi Bar where the Belladonnas are laughing at Sun scraping his tongue and saying it's too hot. Blake hands him some water and says that she told him that Menagerie Fire Snapper was a bad idea. Gira, however, commends him on trying new things, though Callie wryly adds they're lucky he doesn't seem to be allergic to it. Sun coughs in surprise that there's an allergy that could come from this, but Blake shoves another glass of water in his face with a frown at her mother. The waiter comes back around and asks if there will be anything else. They say no and Gira takes the check, heading up to the register telling his family they'll be leaving in a couple of minutes. He just wants to make sure they've paid. He leaves, and shortly afterwards, Blake catches wind of a drunk patron complaining about the new restrictions already coming down at work since that damned cat lady took over the captain's seat on the guard. He continues that the damned husband of hers is playing politics with their lives and slowing down the trade coming out of the port. Blake is frustrated by the commentary, and after a few more snide remarks, she stands to confront the patron, with Sun and Callie trying in vain to stop her. She stomps over to the table in what progresses as an argument that slowly gets out of hand. Blake argues that Callie is perfectly suited to the position. The guy argues back that she's killing the shipping industry at the worst possible time by having every ship of Menagerie searched, and sprinkled in there is an escalation of insults that end with Gira being called a lapdog politician and Callie his little bit. And before the man can finish the word, Blake lunges at him, only for Sun to pull her back. During this, Callie has remained seated at the booth, quietly trying to ignore or otherwise stay out of the argument. Sun quickly tells Blake that hitting this guy will solve nothing, even if he is being a complete ass about things. The guy complains to Sun that it's bullshit he's the ass when it's their livelihoods that's being snuffed out, and Blake shoots back that there's actual lives being snuffed out by the White Fang. Finally, Callie slams her hands down on the table and tells both sides to step away. She recognizes that the situation is currently bad for everyone, but they're working very hard to solve it as fast as possible, and fighting like this will not help anyone. Gura arrives to collect his family and asks what's going on. Callie grabs Blake by the arm and drags her towards the door, saying that nothing is going on and that it's about time they get home. Gura looks to Sun and the man, the former who shrugs and the latter who glares. Gira hardens his stare at the man before Sun tugs them towards the door. Blake and Callie exit the door into the stormy night. The camera pans to the clouds, and we transition into a clear moonlit sky at the bandit camp, panning down to where Weiss has just left the tent flap of Vernal's yurt. Night at the bandit camp is quiet and peaceful, with the air clean and the stars clearly visible above, framing the shattered moon. There's a quiet chanting happening in the distance, and Weiss follows it, coming to the lakeshore where the entirety of the tribe has gathered. Mo seems to be praying out towards the center of the lake, where now visible are a series of small islands upon which rest ruins very reminiscent of those last seen in the Emerald Forest. Leaning against her own yurt, nearest the shoreline, is Raven, who seems disinterested in the prayers of her people, and Vernal, who is idly chipping away at a small block of wood with a knife. Raven shakes her head and enters her yurt, and Vernal moves to follow, packing up her whittling kit, only to pause, turn towards the ruins, cup her hands, and bow her head for only a few seconds. Weiss watches this moment of quiet reverence as Vernal picks up her head and sees the Schnee staring at her. Vernal blushes and hurriedly goes inside Raven's yurt. Weiss gives a bemused smile and turns to look at the lake as fireflies begin to light up around the islands, illuminating an imposing cherry blossom tree at the center. The screen darkens, leaving us with only the glow of the fireflies, and then those two fade, ending the episode. Episode 7 begins very similarly to how the first steps began in Volume 1, with Nora, Ren, John, and Ruby going through their morning routine in a comedic montage format, all overlaid with Ruby talking about the investigation they're setting out to accomplish for the day. Her stated goal? Investigate key locations around the city in order to locate leads on the Brynwyn tribe, including the police station, the local hunters guild, and the library. At the end of the montage, the four of them are lined up and yell, BANZAI! to initiate the beginning of their search. 
However, just behind Nora is Roman, who has mockingly joined the group and cheering along. Nora, surprised, reflexively elbows him in the stomach and sends him sprawling. Nora, with a bit of bite to her words, apologizes for her reflexes, and John asks what Roman is doing there. He cheekily retorts that he's one of the crew now, isn't he? They can't leave him out of all the fun activities. Ruby says this isn't some game, they need to find the Branwins as soon as possible. From behind her, Crow speaks up, saying, You're sure making it look like a game, before hitting his flask. He elaborates that with that plan, all they'll come out with is a handful of cold shoulders and a library card. If they want to investigate that way later, fine, but he's got methods with a proven track record and they're going to tag along to see what real Huntsman work is like. The group's spirits dampen, but Ren is optimistic. After all, they're still technically in training, so they should just consider this another learning opportunity. They did only ever get one chance to shadow a Huntsman in the field, and that was interrupted by the Breach. We focus in on his hopeful face and smash cut to a more sobered one as we reveal the group are seen inside of a half-empty bar, observing Crow as he drinks what appears to be a second shot of two next to a window. John crosses his arms and asks how this is an effective investigation tactic. Crow's about to respond when Ruby jumps in and defends him with a mix of hope and growing doubt, saying, No, no, it's, it's just like a gritty detective novel. Going to a seedy bar to find shady characters that might give away the nefarious plans of the grisly underworld? The camera pans over to Roman, who's sipping a Long Island iced tea. Catching her stare, he asks, What? Crow cuts in and says that Huntsman work is nothing like that. What you read in the books is garbage. Nora asks, Well, then what are we seeing around here for? And Crow just replies, We're just watching. All eyes go to the window, and then to outside the window, where a barmaid is serving drinks to a handful of patrons. The group as a whole scowl back at Crow, except Roman, who just mockingly says, Hmm, good taste, while sipping his drink. Ruby nudges him in the side. However, as a background detail that most people will only pick up on a second viewing, there's a major gate out of the city beyond the barmaid, crowded with trade caravans. Ren shrugs his shoulders and says, Well, at the very least, the atmosphere is pleasant. And this is when Crow stands, declaring that they're done here and it's time to move on. Ren blinks and briefly protests that his oolong tea hasn't even arrived yet, and Crow says they'll get him some at the next place. John remarks, Next place? and we pop over to an entirely different bar, though the table arrangement is almost exactly the same, only aesthetics have really changed. John rolls his eyes and groans, Oh, you've gotta be kidding me! There's silence as Crow continues to stare out the window, and Nora quietly asks Ruby if her uncle is okay. Ruby hesitantly asks him if maybe they should try some different venues, kinda shake things up instead of just bar hopping. And Crow responds that if she wants to do her own investigation, she's free to do it, but he has his methods and he's not changing them. Ren hums and says that they should trust that he knows what he's doing, and Nora complains Ren's only happy because he got his tea. Ren shoots back that she's only upset because they stopped serving breakfast past noon. John crosses his arms and asks if Crow's methods are drowning at the bottom of his glass, and Crow just shoots him a glare before looking back out the window. Roman finally speaks up, saying, As much as I'd love to watch this guy pickle himself, I've got some ideas that I could hit up on, so if you'll excuse me. He stands to leave, but Nora stands to stop him from leaving the table. John asks where Roman thinks he's going, and Roman appeals to their team camaraderie to let him do his part. It isn't like he's going to run, he found them after all. Ruby sighs and volunteers to go with Roman to make sure he doesn't get into any trouble, and while they express concern, she insists. She turns to John and asks him to make sure Crow gets home safely and they share a knowing look. Roman asks if Ruby is sure she wants to come with him. After all, he's a criminal, right? They're gonna have to stick to the alleys and go deal with the criminal underbelly. Ruby just says, exasperated, I've dealt with you this whole time, haven't I? And Roman laughs, leading them out the door. After a moment of silence at the table, Ren turns to his two remaining teammates and says that he brought cards. Outside, Ruby is storming off into the crowded streets, clearly frustrated by Crow, and Roman lazily comments that she's going the wrong way. She turns and asks, with a bit of edge, which way should they be going? He explains that often the heart of a problem has a lot of pesky things around it that make it hard to reach, so he needs more roundabout methods to get to it. In order to get to the root, you have to start with the leaf. In order to get to the bottom of things, he points up at the Chochin. You have to start at the top. The camera follows his finger and zooms in on Haven, flying apart and giving us a nice broad view of the locale before zooming in on the student housing. We see Ruby and Roman walking along the scenic trail outside of the dorms, and Ruby is in awe of the view. She asks what exactly they're doing up there. How does student housing tie into fighting the Branwins? 
Roman replies it doesn't, they're here to tie up loose ends. When he was working for Cinder, he really didn't get a lot of time to ask questions, and knowing she and the kids were at Mistral means they probably left something behind. And, if they can use that something to figure out where Cinder and her cabal have holed up, they can completely bypass the whole Maiden situation and just nip the problem in the bud. No need to bodyguard someone who's not going to get attacked. Ruby has a touch of trouble following the logic, but ultimately agrees to it. We cut to the inside of a dorm room, and outside we can hear Roman saying that this should be the room according to the student registry. There's a brief clicking sound, and Ruby remarks, Of course you can lockpick. Roman replies, Of course I can. People keep putting things I want behind doors. And right now, I want whatever is behind this one. The door swings open and Roman flicks the light on for the room, finding it completely empty of even the most basic furniture. Roman and Ruby blink, and he says, And it's empty. Well, didn't expect that, but happens more often than you'd think. Ruby hangs her head at another dead lead, and Roman pats her back, strolling out the other direction, telling her not to give up. This was just plan A, and it honestly was a long shot. Ruby turns to him and asks, Well then, what's plan B? Walking out the door's frame. We cut to Nora in a different bar, raising a card dramatically in a mirror of Yang from Volume 2, declaring, Empty Pursuit! and slamming it to the table. John groans and throws down his hand, saying, All my hard work down the drain. Ren pats him on his back and says that victory should never be built to, it should only be found in the flow of chance, before laying down an unexpected fortune, which trumps Nora's play and wins him the game. Nora complains how unbalanced the game is, saying he's lucky they're not playing by standard rules or else that'd be outlawed. John shakes his head and looks to Crow, who's by a window, watching and drinking with three empty glasses before him. John rolls his eyes and asks to play the deck Ren's using this time. We cut back to Ruby pestering Roman to admit that he doesn't have a clue what he's doing. We see they're walking the streets of Lower Mistral now, not quite the slums, but definitely not the most pleasant area in the city. What with the shoddier buildings and patches of untamed foliage nearby. Roman rebuffs her, saying this is how good digging always goes. Most leads turn up dry until you find one that hits pay dirt. It's a numbers game, really. He smoothly tells her to keep her eyes peeled. There's always been rumors of a White Fang stronghold around this part of the city. It was always something touching on his radar, but since he didn't have any dealings with the Fang before his time in Vale, he never looked too deeply into it. Ruby says it shouldn't be too hard, they just had to look for a whole bunch of faunas in one place, right? Roman raises a brow and points to the crowds around them. Most, if not all of them, are faunas. Ruby gives a weak, oh and Roman snickers that searching for the White Fang in Mistral's biggest faunus quarter won't exactly be easy. There's some irony here, as most of their conversation is backdropped by the chop shop in one way or another the whole scene. Ruby groans that this is turning out to be a lot more frustrating than she'd hoped, and asks how he can be so flippant about all of it. Roman asks exactly how difficult she thought this be. Look at it from the outside in. They're trying to help an immortal wizard trapped in his head track down a bandit tribe where they need to convince some kind of sorceress to flee the country or else someone might use her to open a big magic door. If anything, he asks how any of them can be serious about the whole thing. It sounds ridiculous on paper. Ruby stops in her tracks, a wave of conflicted emotions crossing her face before she replies that they lost people. She lost people she cared about during the fall of Beacon. Roman nods along, saying, Right, right, you were friends with that robot, weren't you? And Ruby is quick to say that her name was Penny. Roman nods and repeats the name half-heartedly before Ruby continues that she lost Penny and Pura, and so many more people were hurt because of what Cinder did. Her and her team, at least the one she has now, just want to get justice for what happened to the people that mattered to them. And to have crows still treating them like children when they're more than able to help is really dampening her spirits. Roman comments that they're all still children, and Ruby shoots him a dirty glare which he shrugs off almost immediately. He elaborates that they're in the mindset that they're the only ones that really lost people. Take himself for example. He lost someone during the fall, because of Ruby herself no less. And yet, he's still got his humor about him despite the setbacks. Ruby deadpans that they were trying to kill her, and he shoots back that he was forced to under duress. And they can both sit there all day blaming other people for what happened all the way back up to Salem, but that won't do anyone much good. His point is that Ruby is getting upset over some pretty predictable roadblocks, and that's probably why her uncle's being so dismissive. Dead ends happen, accept it, go in a different direction, and see what you can find. Can't tell you how many heists I had to just give up on because security was too tight. And sometimes, all I had to do was wait for a new opportunity to present itself. Sulking nets you zero lien in the long run. Ruby digests his words and takes a deep breath, reaffirming herself physically. She nods and acknowledges that he's right. She's being petty. 
Roman is glad she's in agreement, but she's quick to say that she should still treat this a little more seriously. So far, he's 0-2 when it comes to his ideas. Roman nods and puts a hand to his chin, thinking. He scowls, exhales, and looks to Ruby saying, Alright, I think I have one more idea of where we can find a lead, but it's not going to be pleasant. Ruby asks, For me, or for you? And Roman replies, Depends. How do you feel about spiders? Ruby cocks her head to the side, asking, What? as we smash cut outside of a club called Charlotte's. The two walk inside and Roman takes a deep whiff of the room saying, Ah, the smell of free enterprise. And Ruby crinkles her nose in disgust. She asks what this place is, and Roman says that she can't possibly be that naive, motioning to the room. The camera pans over to the oriental-themed strip club, and Ruby closes in on herself, presumably out of embarrassment, saying that she's not old enough to go in these places yet. Roman waves that off and says that she's got adult supervision. Besides, there's no shows during the day. He makes his way towards a set of paper doors, saying he hopes some of the girls he knew are still around. Ruby might get along with them since they're all actually quite nice. Knocking on the door, it slides open guarded by a large imposing man. Roman declares, Honey, I'm home, and the guard just cocks an eyebrow at him. A voice behind the guard instructs him to let Roman through, and both Ruby and Roman enter the sitting area lined with small porcelain and glass figurines, where a sudare screen separates the speaker from the rest of the smoke-filled room. Roman gives an exuberant greeting to Little Miss, saying it's been quite a while. Out of the sight of his mouth, he tells Ruby to be ready to run, just in case, and Ruby gives him an accused, terrified, What? Little Miss calls out Roman, saying how dare he come here. Years without so much as a letter or a phone call, and now he shows up without even a souvenir from Vale? Roman awkwardly laughs it off, saying there wasn't much for him to give after Beacon fell. All the good souvenir shops had already been looted. She hums how unfortunate that is, but it's pleasant to see him and the several thousand Li Yen he stole from her the last time he was in Mistral. Roman's eye twitches and he calmly counters that he was sure that money was for the Caliban job. She wouldn't have forgotten to pay him, now would she? Little Miss chuckles, dispelling a little bit of the air, and says it's genuinely good to see him again. The streets of Mistral have been far too quiet without his shenanigans. She was concerned about Vale for him and his little friend. Must have been ashamed to lose her, but he seems to be bouncing back alright, pointing from behind the screen at Ruby. Ruby gives a little, hey, Little Miss comments, oh, this one speaks? That's new for you, Roman. And Roman replies, believe me, it's been an adjustment period, before conversation carries on. With a few more minor pleasantries, Roman gets to the point and says he needs some information, and Little Miss says that he knows her rates. He counters by saying this may be a mutually beneficial exchange. They're looking for the Branwyn tribe. Little Miss pauses and asks what they want with them. Roman explains that he's fallen between a rock and a hard place, and someone inside of that tribe is his way out. If there happens to be a substantial amount of collateral damage to the tribe along the way, well, accidents do happen. Behind him, Ruby is playing with one of the porcelain figures on a shelf, a Mistrillian geisha. She accidentally snaps its neck and quietly, nervously, places it back on the shelf before anyone can notice. Little Miss is quiet before saying bandits have a way of harassing her mules, the Branwyn's chief among them now that they're back in the area. She agrees to give him the information as long as he can guarantee the Branwyn's will at the very least move along again. He readily agrees, and she gives him the location of one of her less valuable smugglers who's lost a few men to the bandits in weeks past. Roman thanks her and moves towards the door, the bodyguard passing him a leaf of paper with the information on it. However, Little Miss warns him that the Branwins are very popular right now. Ruby asks what she means, and she quickly replies that they're not the only ones looking for them, they're just the only ones that didn't pay. Roman and Ruby share a look, and their pace towards the door quickens. Little Miss holds them up at the end, imploring Roman to keep in touch this time around. The duo rush out the door, and we slide by it, transitioning to the front doors of another bar where Crow is drunk off his ass, stumbling outside. Ren is beside him, trying to keep him balanced, asking Nora to help. Behind them, John is just rubbing his brow. He pulls out a scroll and sends a message to Ruby, asking how her and Roman are doing, and he gets a reply that they seem to have found a lead, but there's a problem. We cut back to Ruby, lowering her scroll as she and Roman look through a broken door. The room is dark, and there's a mangled, shadowy shape on the floor, a trail of blood leading from it to the door. This keeps things tasteful, but implies a level of gore we can't show. We close in on Ruby and Roman, and after a beat, he sighs, asking Ruby if she has any gloves. She says no, and he rolls his eyes, groaning. So we're going to be doing this barehanded then. Great. One more hard cut at the end of the episode shows a Cinder and her posse arriving at the chop shop, and yes, she's still sporting her singular sleeve Phantom of the Opera mask look. 
Don't worry, it'll be explained, not in Volume 5, but it will get addressed. Meanwhile, Emerald and Mercury are relatively unchanged, barring a quieter streak to Emerald, who appears to be running on limited hours of sleep. Watts asks how their little powwow with the pinnacle of the pits went, and Cinder says they traded points but by the end of things, his eyes were glassing over. Their friends from the Fang stayed behind to explain things to him a little more clearly. Watts hums how unfortunate that is for the man, but so long as they got the information, it's not much of a loss. She did get the information, didn't she? Cinder narrows her eyes at Watts and scoffs that of course she did. He tells her not to get so indignant. She's the one that set the precedent with her failure at Beacon. Emerald steps forward to defend Cinder, growling that she didn't fail at Beacon. She got the maiden power and killed Ozpin. Missing a relic doesn't mean she failed. Watts says, Of course, because failing to acquire the thing Salem wants most, now that's what success sounds like. And we'll ignore how unfazed she was to learn of Ozpin's death. Cinder is about to respond when Mercury finally steps in, saying it might be fun to bicker for the better part of an hour, but they have plans to make, and they've seen how Salem treats failure. The group react poorly to that statement, all recoiling in their own severity and style, though Emerald's is the most pronounced, openly wincing at the thought. Watts agrees with Mercury and asks if Cinder has the location. She hands over her scroll and says, Locations. Plural since the reports within the spider web weren't very well organized. Watts grimaces at the list of locations and says it'll take some time to narrow things down, and they're still going to have to do some searching on foot. All the same, with all the experience she, Emerald, and Mercury have killing Huntsman the last few months, this should be a veritable walk in the park for them. Turning back to his computer, he asks how Cinder feels about doing some community service and wiping a bandit tribe or two from existence. Cinder smiles, and her eyes flash with maiden power, the screen going to black, lingering on that glimmer. Episode 8 mirrors the opening of Episode 4 of Fixing Volume 4, using the double doors to enter into the White Fang throne room. The room is packed with White Fang members, and upon his throne sits Adam, fully garbed and gripping his sinuses, obviously overwhelmed at the series of voices flooding the room. As the volume rises, he does as well, slamming Blush and Wilt down onto the ground and yelling for silence. The room dies down into murmurs, and he doubles down, slamming his weapon again and repeating his order. Finally, the hall is quiet. He starts a speech, saying they've all heard the news of the fall of Menagerie's branch. With the loss of Menagerie and the disbandment of Vale's branch that Sienna foolishly committed, he can see how faith has been shaken. This is to be expected, but it is not to be tolerated. Assembled here are the best of the best, true believers in the cause, and to think that some island miles away will take from them the victory they've paved in their blood and sweat is foolish. Menagerie can be retaken, this lapse a mere footnote in the long march towards a true Faunus nation. There's an uproar as the assembled White Fang cheers his declaration. Adam smirks in response, lifting Wilton Blush above his head. He says that supplies and equipment are still coming in, and as always, Faunus friendly to the cause are always welcome to join. They, as well as everyone in this room, will become the gunshot that starts a worldwide revolution. The chamber erupts in cheering, and Adam slinks off the stage to a side room. On the other side is Hazel, leaning against a wall. He congratulates Adam at getting that under control, but he has to wonder how far a few fancy words can carry him. Adam is adamant that members of the Fang can subsist on words alone. Their loyalty is absolute, and any who would question it have already been dealt with. Hazel raises an eyebrow and asks how Menagerie fell if that's the case, and Adam replies, walking down the hall, that Menagerie had a rogue element, one they won't suffer in Mistral. He walks towards the camera and obscures it, and it's unobscured when a Lian card is pulled away from the camera and rests down beside a run-down sink. Roman is there, splashing his hands in the sink and wiping them free of blood with a towel. He frowns at the sight, and grouses that he thought his days of dealing with dead bodies were behind him. Ospin speaks up in his mind, saying that it's quite the contrary. The bodies only ever seem to keep piling up when Salem is involved. Roman snarks that he's looking forward to it, not like he had plans before all this happened that didn't involve corpses. Ospin says that Roman doesn't talk about his plans from before all that often, and Roman pauses while drying his hands, replying that they weren't much different than his plans back when they first met in Vale. Him and Neo were going to get out of the biz. One last big score, set for life. Find a nice tropical paradise, grow old, and die. Osman comments that he doesn't believe that for a second. He only ever gets put in the minds of people who are very much like him, and those who are very much like him always attract trouble. Roman laughs bitterly and asks if Oz is saying he'd never have a peaceful life, and Oz replies it would at the very least not be an uneventful life. Destined to make life difficult, just great. 
Roman says, picking up a freshly washed ring from a towel on the counter. He appraises it before setting it aside and looking at a drenched wallet that has flecks of blood on it. He rifles through it and asks what kind of trouble Ospin is used to getting into. And Ospin flippantly says, Oh, you know, stopping wars, ending racial conflict, saving the world. Roman looks deadpan into the mirror and says, Oh, so a Tuesday night out? You get all of that done on a school night? Ospin playfully replies that he was a headmaster. Roman looks over the scattered, partially bloodied effects on the counter and asks, Well then, headmaster, answer me this. Why would the White Fang kill a member of the Spiderweb? There's a pause before Ospin asks back, What makes you think it was the White Fang? Roman nods and lifts a number of metal shards to eye level from the pile. He remarks that the blade chippings belong to blades commonly used by the Fang, not to mention some of the claw marks that were present. So either this man had a bad run-in with a bear, or the White Fang killed him. The question is why? The man was in the underworld. Gambling debts, territorial disputes, even stock standard discrimination. There are any number of possible explanations, Ospin replies, but Roman shakes those suspicions away. No, you see, if this were an intentional hit from the Fang, they'd make it look like an example. They're always sending a message with their assassinations, and if it were any other reason, they'd make it look like one of their assassinations. He lifts the wallet and slaps it against the counter. And if it were a robbery, they typically would take the cash. This was quick and dirty, so the question remains, why? There is silence before Osmond comments that, I didn't quite see the connection that fate had made between us at first, but now I do. You have a rather astute mind. Roman rolls his eyes and says, Well, flattery will get you everywhere. He tosses the wallet to the pile and rests his hands on the counter. For a second, we get the tired Roman, the real Roman underneath. All the vim and bravado evaporated. So is that the only reason why? Everything you just said about stopping wars and saving the world, that doesn't sound like something I would go near, let alone touch. If you really want someone, why not Red out there? He looks through the door to the bathroom, which is closed, and from beyond we hear Ruby say that she found something. And then the sound of something breaking, followed closely by a squeaky, Never mind! Ospin explains that everything he just said comes with a layer of dark realities that someone like Ruby is keenly poised to fight, in her own way. Someone like Ospin, however, isn't apt to fight that darkness. He's more apt to use it. A mind like mine couldn't survive in an innocent soul, and neither would yours. Roman offers a wry smile, saying, Who? Me? I'm as pure as the driven snow. There's another crash outside and Ruby says, That was nothing! Roman groans, slides the loose Lien cards into his pocket, and stomps to the door, saying, Red, I told you to search the room, not to wreck it! The camera pans up into the flickering lights overhead, and we fade into the dull fluorescence of the menagerie jail. We pan down as Ilya walks through the hall, being led back to the interrogation room. Blake and Callie sit across from her, and Ilya sets down a full notepad on the table beside her. Callie folds her arms, but gives Ilya a warm smile, asking her about this Operation Fenrir she was so eager to talk about the other day. Ilya looks through her notes and takes a deep breath before starting to speak. Operation Fenrir was a plan by Kin on Ryu charted out shortly before the breach happened. It was part of a collection of ideas he had to try and make quick power grabs across the continent, but the scale just wasn't feasible and most of the plans were scrapped. The idea was to have thousands of White Fang all positioned around the kingdom in massive cells that operated simultaneously for a singular massive coup. But what he didn't want to admit was that we didn't have those numbers, not even close. Sure, we could take those positions, or at least a good chunk of them, but holding them was completely out of the question. Blake asks if this plan was so unworkable why Ilya is so concerned about it. Ilya quickly answers, Atlas. Callie and Blake are confused, but Ilya continues that organized resistance in Mistral and Anima at large is pretty light. Mostly police, maybe a few scattershot militias. Really, the biggest threats were gangs and crime families. That is, if you discount Atlas, who would no doubt swoop in to reset the board. Vale was also a concern, since they'd more than likely try to liberate Mistral from the White Fang, and they could do it. It'd be more difficult for them than for Atlas, with its air superiority and army, but get enough huntsmen and militia in one place, and it's a serious threat. Callie and Blake process this and begin to piece it together, out loud. Blake points out that Vale is still reeling from the fall of Beacon, and Callie notes that Atlas has started closing its borders. A complete fleet withdrawal globally. Ilya nods, saying that's exactly the thing she's worried about. Now the numbers don't matter as much. The biggest obstacle they face is reinforcements and an organized resistance from the Mistral Council. But Adam must think it can work. He must have some idea to make it work. Blake stands, her chair screeching back, and she sputters that they need to stop this. Callie, meanwhile, is silent, eyes flickering back and forth as her thumb rises to her lips. She bites her nail and finally mutters that this is bad. Really, really bad. 
Blake turns to her mother and says that they can't just let it happen, and Callie agrees, but they don't even know where to start. Mistral's political connections with Menagerie are tenuous at best. Chances are, they wouldn't listen to them about such a ridiculous-sounding plan, and by the time they'd be convinced, the White Fang would already be bursting down the door. Callie pulls Ilya's notes over the table and begins to flick through them. Her brow creases as she goes, and finally she drops the pad and looks up, declaring they need to stop the Fang themselves. Blake blinks and asks what Callie means, and Callie says they'll have to talk with Gira, but the only solution that they're going to have is to go to Mistral themselves and make sure the plan doesn't happen. Blake asks what the four of them are going to do, and Callie quickly corrects her, not us, menagerie. Ilya leans forward and says, you can't be serious. And Callie shoots back, deadly. Blake asks how they're going to get there, how they're even going to find the White Fang. Blake could help somewhat, but they've no doubt moved their base. It'd be impossible to track them down before the attack, and by then the militia won't be much good. There'd be massive bloodshed in the streets. Innocents would die. Callie affirms what Blake is saying, but says they have someone who can lead them where they need to go. And eyes fall to Ilya. Ilya balks at the suggestion, saying she refuses. This plan of theirs? Doing that would literally start a civil war among the Faunus, and Ilya won't take part in that whatsoever. Blake continues to question her mom, compounding that Mistral might see this as an act of war. Callie is calm and says that when Gira learns of this plan, he'll burn every bridge, call in every marker in order to ensure that exact possibility doesn't happen. Blake shouts that the Elder Council will have both of their heads on a platter after that. Callie slams her hands on the table and stares Blake down. It's not about their political power, it's about the innocent lives at stake that Blake was so concerned about not just a minute ago. If the White Fang succeeded, how many people are going to suffer? What happens when Vale's CCT goes back online and they learn there's a new country? What happens when Atlas unlocks the door and comes rolling down on Mistral? Do they stop at Mistral? Or do they roll on to take Menagerie too? And the injured Vale, leaving Vacuo on its own against the literal world? This would be the precipice of a world war that doesn't end with a magnanimous king stepping down to bring world peace. This ends in tyranny, or worse, extinction. Blake falls back into her seat, the weight of the situation dawning on her. Callie shoots a glare to Ilya and demands she tell them where the White Fang are. Ilya pauses, thinks, and refuses, saying what they want is to have the Faunus destroy each other. Callie slams the table again and yells that if they let a world war happen, then they deserve to destroy each other. Stop thinking in us versus them, and realize there's no winner in all of this. Ilya is resolute, until Blake finally speaks up, having digested what was said, asking very softly, Ilya, please. Ilya looks to Blake, and her resolute face wavers. Seconds pass, and she exhales, relenting. She makes one demand at the very least. She wants to go with them. If the Faunus are really going to war with each other, she wants to be able to say that she tried to stop it from happening. Blake thanks her and takes her hand, though Ilya pulls away, grimacing and saying, This is the last time you get to pull that. Am I clear? Blake is taken aback by the venom in Ilya's voice, and has to think for a moment before nodding. Yeah, she says, concerned. I didn't. Ilya stops her by saying, yeah, she never means it. It just comes naturally to her. Blake's eyes widen and she looks off to the side in shame. Callie, meanwhile, is flipping through Ilya's notes, telling Blake they need to leave and start planning. This is going to be the biggest step Menagerie has made on the global stage since its founding. They need to get every detail right. Blake looks back at Ilya before walking out the door. Ilya watches her leave, but then tears her eyes away and stares daggers at the table. We cut to a mirror shot of Adam looking down at plans on a map, his jawline grim. He stands and walks over to a series of boxes, pulling a clipboard from on top and flipping through the pages. The papers themselves indicate these boxes came from Vale, presumably some of the materials Roman stole prior to and during Volume 2. He looks over at one of the boxes and sees it branded with a Schnee Company logo, and he frustratedly throws the clipboard aside, trying to get control of his breathing. He opens the crate to look inside, and the world becomes foggy, like when he had his prior flashback. This one finds Adam at a warehouse, looking inside a similar crate, when the warehouse manager catches him. The man yells at Adam for stealing from the crates, and a second later something can be seen swinging at Adam's face. There's a sound of metal hitting flesh, and flesh melting down, as well as Adam's strangled cry of pain. Adam, back in the present, grips the left side of his face, and stumbles towards the door. He bursts through it and makes his way to his room. He shirks his jacket, throwing it aside completely, and grabs a man with two souls from the table, replacing it with his mask. Adam then proceeds to curl up on the bed around the book, crying as he obscures his face from the audience. We fade to black on his pain sobs, ending the episode. 
Episode 9 slowly fades in on the placid waters of the lake next to the bandit camp, a thick mist lingering in the morning air. Vernal scoops water into a bucket before sitting down and breaking up a concoction of flower petals and powders into the liquid. At a distance, a groggy Weiss walks up besides Raven and asks what Vernal is doing. As Vernal wanders off, Raven explains that it's a hair thing apparently, she's never asked much about it, but hey, it makes Vernal happy, and she smiles very subtly at that. Raven looks to Weiss and comments how she looks pretty ragged, and Weiss replies that they don't have any coffee in the camp. This tea is barely doing anything. Raven scoffs that folks around here don't need coffee to stay awake, and Weiss just bites back that she's tasted their tea. It's awful, and any coffee they made would probably be the same. She then takes another distasteful sip of tea from a cup inlaid with gold liqueur. As per the Kintsugi method, Raven just rolls off the insult and says that if Weiss wants coffee, she could always join one of the raiding parties. Considering how long they'll be staying at this camp, Raven might modify her deal with Weiss so that she can pull her own weight around the tribe. After all, Weiss is taking great advantage of their hospitality, and it's a poorly exercised kindness that should at the very least be balanced if not entirely repaid. Who knows, she adds wryly, Weiss might find a taste for the bandit life. Weiss raises a brow, asking if that's an offer to join, and Raven says that as much as she doesn't like Weiss, she has promise that could be worked with. Her strength and resilience are virtues that are greatly appreciated by the tribe. Weiss just nods, dryly commenting that she's surprised bandits know anything about virtue in the first place. Then again, she never thought she'd see bandits prey either. She points out that she's been here a couple of days, and she still can't tell what it is everyone even does at the shore at night. Is it some kind of warrior god they're praying to, or...? Raven sighs and says they're not part of some vacuum sand cult, if that's what Weiss was thinking. She looks out over the lake, where the cherry tree and the surrounding ruins can barely be seen through the fog, explaining they worship the ruins and the land around them as guardians, protectors. Every night, it's a prayer out to make sure they wake up and their work is protected, and in return, they tend to the ruins, keeping them as pristine as they can. Weiss hums the word guardians and takes another sip of tea. She never understood the religious, it always sounded like magic to her. Smoke and mirrors. Raven shrugs, saying, smoke is real, so are mirrors. Weiss blinks and looks at Raven in confusion, saying that doesn't sound too much like faith. Raven explains very coldly that she hasn't had faith in anything for a long time. Well, except herself. She does, however, believe what she's seen with her own two eyes, and why should pray she never has to see the same things. Even a proper bandit shouldn't have to see some of the things in this world, let alone some pampered princess. Weiss, slightly intimidated and completely confused at this rate, asks if Raven is trying to convert her. Raven raises a brow and asks if it's working, and Weiss just turns back to the water and says that Raven is a terrible preacher if that's the case. Raven offers a slight smile, muttering that she could kill Weiss where she stood and she's giving her lip? Having her around would be good for the camp. They've all been getting soft on her. Weiss is surprised by the flippant mention of her own murder and sputters her tea. As Shiloh and Vernal approach from behind, Weiss mutters, well, not much of a loss anyway, to the spilled tea. Vernal walks up and tells her mom that she's going out on a raid with Shiloh, which catches Raven's attention. She looks to Shiloh and recollects that their raid today is for Sumire, and he acknowledges that it is. It's a little far, he says, but it passes through the Ichoroyo, which he thought would be a great time for Vernal to get some practice leading Grimm. Raven scowls and asks why he thought the Ichoroyo was a good place for her to learn that. It's absolutely crawling with Deathstalkers and Manticores, there are even reports of Goliaths. Vernal isn't ready for that. Shiloh replies that she needs to be ready at some point, and what better place than a real trial by fire? Vernal steps up and says that she's ready for this. She's worked with Smaller Grimm before and come out fine. How else will she know if she needs more practice? Raven scowls and bites at her that practice means nothing if you die doing it. She says that either they subvert the Ichiroyo to get the Sumire, or Vernal doesn't go at all. Shiloh points out that bypassing would delay them a couple of hours, and they're already strained with how far they need to go for raids. Raven scoffs and brushes back a lock of hair, saying that it's settled then. They go. Vernal stays here. Easy as that. Vernal tries to argue, but Raven cuts it off with a glare. No argument. This is final. Vernal glares at Raven and the two silently see that each other until Vernal growls and stomps away, splashing into the water of the lake across a submerged bridge leading out to the island in the center. Raven doesn't even watch her go, instead turning to Shiloh and ordering him to get moving. He, however, hesitates, watching Vernal stomp off. Quietly, he asks why the tribe hasn't moved yet, and Raven stares daggers into him. She rests her hand on her blade and repeats her order. Shiloh grimaces and reluctantly walks to start his raid. Without a word to Weiss, Raven leaves in a different direction. Weiss watches for a second before resting her teacup down on a nearby stump and following after Raven. Curious, Weiss asks if she can ask a question. Raven sighs and says, 
for the last time, none of our tents come with blue stripes. Weiss rolls her eyes and says, My question isn't about your poor taste in decor. Raven grunts in acknowledgement and Weiss continues, Why did you turn her down? She seemed excited to go. Raven replies, I've seen her herd. She's not ready. She'd be a danger to the tribe. Weiss cocks her head to the side. I thought only the strong survive. Now you're worried about liabilities? Raven grits her teeth. She's not a liability, she's just not ready. Only for Weiss to reply, and if you don't give her a chance to practice, will she ever be ready? Raven shoots a glare back at Weiss. You are treading very thin ice, girl. Weiss falters in her gait, taken off guard by Raven's venom before replying, but it's a legitimate question. If you want me to stay, I need to know what I'm getting myself into. How do I know if I'm ready if your own daughter isn't? Raven stops and turns to snap at Weiss. Vernal isn't ready because I say she's not ready. Weiss blinks at Raven, a realization crossing her features, and she replies, You're a hypocrite. Raven doesn't respond and turns away, continuing her walk. Weiss hesitates a moment but pursues, continuing a monologue of sorts as they thread their way through the camp. You make all these speeches about might makes right, the whole tribe does, but the minute Vernal wants to do something you don't approve of, you shut her down? What kind of sense does that make? And it's not like she doesn't agree with you. She keeps mentioning all that stupid strength stuff you've seemingly drilled into her head. What kind of message are you sending her? When you're strong, you can make your own decisions, except when mommy says otherwise? All that's going to do is make her spiteful. You pretend like you're some kind of immovable bandit queen, but you can't protect her forever. At some point, you have to choose. Are you a bandit or mother of the year? Throughout all this tirade, Raven is silently walking, stewing, and her face twists more and more into a scowl as it goes along. Eventually, on that last word, Raven finally explodes, drawing Omen and pressing the blade to Weiss's neck, garnering the curious stares of morning onlookers. The blade is pressed flush to Weiss's aura, making the white energy crackle and sparkle, but Weiss is unfazed, staring Raven down with a mixture of rage and pity. I stand corrected. You're a savage. Raven stares at Weiss, her rage no longer contained, and with a roar, she lunges forward and backhands Weiss with her sword arm. Weiss crumples to the ground, dazed, and Raven steps over her to say, I tolerate your comments because they're entertaining. Don't humor for a second, they're any more valuable than that. Don't follow me. And with that, Raven turns and walks off, leaving the prone Weiss to grip her cheek. Wincing, Weiss stares after Raven, only to then be approached from the side by Shiloh. He whistles, remarking that she must have really pissed off Raven. Though, he's been hit harder, for sure. Weiss glares at him and wonders why he isn't off preparing like Raven told him. He replies that he'll get to things when he gets to them. No need to rush. She's probably gonna punch him later anyway for something small, might as well earn the hit. Besides, when he looked back and saw Weiss following Raven, he knew there'd be fireworks and he wasn't disappointed. Weiss growls that clearly he found it more entertaining than Raven did. He says that of course he did, and that was a blast to watch. Following that up, he asks what she expected to happen, and Weiss replies that she didn't really have an end goal. Shiloh offers her a hand and says that he thought allegians were supposed to be smart. Weiss only hesitates for a second before taking the hand and being pulled to her feet, saying that she thought that bandits were supposed to be violent thugs. The two meet eyes and begin to laugh over the absurdity of the situation. When they calm down, Weiss asks why no one stops her from coddling Vernal, and he replies that Vernal is special to the tribe. Weiss asks how, and he just smiles saying that he could tell her, but he'd have to kill her. They share another laugh, but quickly he breaks it and says dead seriously that yeah, no, he'd really have to kill her. Weiss is weirded out by the whiplash, her laughs dying into a chuckle. Shiloh looks out to the islands and remarks that it may not seem it, but Vernal brought a lot of this on herself. She put a burden on her shoulders that he's not sure she was ready to wear. If Raven says she's not ready, she's not ready, simple as that. Weiss stares out at the island and frowns, saying that it must be lonely for her. Shiloh huffs in agreement. There's no one her age in the tribe. He's tried to make things easier on her, but he can only do so much. Weiss is silent, digesting his words, and then asks if she should go talk to her. Shiloh scratches his head and says, I mean, we don't really do that whole feelings thing around here. But hey, you took that fist to the face pretty well, and you could do with a couple more. Weiss blinks at him, shakes her head, and sighs. Wordlessly, she begins a trek back towards the bridge, with Shiloh wishing her luck as she leaves. Over in a field of wild flowers, Vernal is lying face up, staring into the morning sky. We cut to her perspective as Weiss walks up beside her and looks down on her. Weiss coolly comments that parents are the worst, aren't they? Vernal glares up at Weiss before closing her eyes and tilting away, saying that her mom is excellent and knows what she's talking about. If Vernal isn't ready, she's not ready, and her voice sounds fairly resigned to that judgment. Weiss perks a brow and folds her arms, saying that doesn't sound much like a bandit. 
Vernal shrugs and says that Raven is the toughest person she knows, and she stayed alive to prove it. Why not listen to her? Why sighs, saying that parents aren't automatically right, no matter how powerful they are? Her father can move mountains, but she doesn't respect the thing that comes out of his mouth. Vernal snorts and says he must not have a tight grip on that power. If Raven had that power, she'd squeeze it until something popped. Weiss narrows her eyes and says that her father doesn't like it when his things break, and for this shot, we get a close-up of her scar. Vernal finally looks at Weiss and says that if things break, then it's not on him for how fragile they are. Weiss counters that sometimes broken things can be rebuilt stronger than before, and we cut over to that teacup she left behind and its many golden cracks. Then again, Weiss says, she gets the feeling that Vernal has never quite been broken before. Vernal hardens her stare at Weiss and tells her to watch her words wisely. Weiss rolls her eyes and asks why she should. It's clear she's dealing with a pampered princess. Vernal rolls to her knees, her hands going to the tanto on her back, snarling that Weiss can't just take her words like that. Weiss replies with a shrug that if she could take them, they were never really Vernal's to begin with. Vernal screams and lunges at Weiss. And effortlessly, Weiss uses her glyphs to slide out of the way, hand lazily reaching for Mirtonaster. She draws it, and we begin the first real fight we have with the redesigned Vernal, so there's a few notes to cover. Vernal uses a Tonto whose blades are composed of pure dust, which are 3D printed by the sheath on her back depending on which slot she sheathed it in. The blades can be detached if broken, or she can detach them mid-swing to fling them at her opponents, giving her a crude and surprisingly fast range attack. In all respects, it seems like a smaller, derivative version of Raven's weapon Omen, and while still effective, it's nowhere near as powerful or intimidating, requiring Vernal to make up for that in sheer ferocity with her movements. It's also less refined, so when she pulls her blade free, it produces a wispy cloud of dust that lingers around Vernal's belt. As the two begin to spar properly, Vernal's less trained yet more vicious attacks catch Weiss off guard, and Weiss ends up acknowledging that she's a bit rusty, having not trained properly in several months, putting the two on roughly equal footing. This balance evens out near the middle of the fight, though Weiss maintains a general superiority over Vernal. She still compliments the barbaric Vernal for her tenacity, commenting that she can take more than just her mother's orders, which goads Vernal into a second stage of the fight. Ultimately, the battle concludes when Weiss uses fire dust, channeled through her own weapon, in order to ignite the cloud trail that emerges from Vernal's weapon. The resulting explosion floors them both, leaving them sprawled out among the field of flowers. The two just lie there for a moment, letting the world around them still and the wind to overtake the field. And then, Weiss begins to laugh. A moment later, Vernal joins her, and for half a minute the two just sit there laughing their asses off. Vernal asks if they taught Weiss that at her fancy combat school, and Weiss shakes her head no, just some lovable goof with allergies. Vernal continues to laugh, saying she has no idea what Weiss is saying half the time. They settle into a comfortable silence before Weiss says that Vernal doesn't have to be so abrasive all the time. Vernal says back that she's stronger when she is, that people treat her with the respect that she's due. Weiss rolls over in the grass, staying on the ground, but looking over at Vernal proper, asking what respect Vernal is actually due. What has she done to earn it besides being her mother's daughter? Vernal replies that she's stolen, killed, and survived like everyone else, and Weiss immediately asks if she's stolen, killed, and survived like Raven, and Vernal goes quiet. Taking that as the answer, Weiss asks why Vernal thinks she's owed the same respect as Raven. Vernal is stoic, but Weiss just rolls back over into the grass and looks up at the sky. She advises Vernal to form her own path, earn her own respect. You never know where it might take you. Like a field in the middle of nowhere, fighting some haughty barbarian. Vernal smiles a little at that and asks where she got that advice. Weiss just says wistfully the same answer she gave before, some lovable goof with allergies. Vernal looks up to the sky and we fade out from blue to black, ending the episode. Episode 10 opens with the sound of a thrumming engine, and the darkness peels away as Bumblebee's tires drive over the camera. We find Yang and Neo coming to a stop inside a small, seemingly abandoned village in the dead of evening, where they roll up on a gas station quick mark combo. We're cleaning up the designs just a bit, making sure it's no longer some kind of weird middle of nowhere bar thing. What was that place, and why is there nothing around it? Super weird, man. Anyway, outside, Yang parks her bike next to a pump and leaves Neo to take care of it, receiving a cheeky thumbs up in the process and a request for water as well. Yang nods and promises to get her a bottle and heads towards the door. Next to the door is a congregation of familiar faces. Shiloh and a band of bandits from the Branwen tribe. I don't say that fin times fast. Band of Branwen bandits, band of Branwen brand... Band of Branwen bandits, band of Branwen band... Yang looks at them out of the corner of her glasses before slipping through the door. Neo pumps the gas and looks at the map, which is more marked up than last time. 
She eyes the bandits warily over the top of the map as Shiloh follows Yang inside. Yang is busy getting two bottles of water out of the back area's freezer, so when she comes to the front, she finds the clerk being accosted by Shiloh. The man is complying with everything Shiloh says and just taking the rough treatment in stride, being verbally and physically abused. Yang pays it little mind and tries to ignore it, but Shiloh notices her and begins to hit on her. He makes comments about her figure, her hair, and he'd say that she's perfect, but it's a shame about that arm. Yang, hands shaking and eyes down, just wants to get in and get out, and asks how much the water is to the clerk. A second later, an umbrella hooks itself around Shiloh's neck and flings him towards the door, and he bounces comedically outside because that's his semblance. Yes, we're keeping this. Somehow, this stayed in the script, and not even I know how it survived. Man, I hate this season. Yang looks to Neo and says she didn't have to do that, and Neo just rolls her eyes and shrugs, though Yang seems unamused. The clerk is thankful, mentioning when Branwins are in town, the police usually go into hiding. It's why no one's on the streets right now. He even goes so far as to say the drinks are on the house, though he pauses mid-sentence as he gets a good look at Yang. He trails off and asks if Yang happened to have been in the Vital Festival the year prior, and she asks what it would matter if she had. The man's eyes narrow and he says that it would mean that she would have to pay. She hesitates, looks to the door, looks to the man, looks to Neo, and her eyes turn red. The guy flinches as her arm moves, but then Yang slams down almost double the amount that she needed to pay and silently walks out. Neo looks between them before taking the waters and sauntering out after Yang, playfully stealing a box of bandages from a shelf just to annoy the man. As they walk out, a brutalized Shiloh is being tended to by his fellow bandits, yelling that they don't take kindly to being shown up like that. Yang and Neo don't even spare them a glance as they get on Bumblebee. Neo flippantly tosses the box of bandages back at Shiloh, hitting him in the head. The pair take off, and the bandits and Shiloh watch them go, scowling. He turns to his men and yells, What are you doing? Get them! And the group scrambles. We cut the Shiloh revving his own, crappier motorcycle and taking off after the duo, his allies and similarly shoddy vehicles beside him. We zoom in on the skid marks he leaves behind until the screen goes black. When the camera pulls back out, the blackness has become Blake's Volume 1 outfit, which she holds with a level of trepidation over a half-filled suitcase. Blake gives it a once-over before sitting and crumpling it in her lap. Behind her, we can see her doorway, singed and missing a door with a room divider folded next to the frame. Callie walks up and mimics rapping on the door with her knuckles, saying knock knock in that way a goofy parent would. Blake gives a weak hello, and Callie comments, I don't have to be a cop to know that means something's wrong. Something on your mind? As Callie comes to sit on the bed next to her, Blake looks at the crumpled clothes and unrolls them, threading the material through her fingers. She says she wore this the last time she saw Adam, both last times, and neither of them were exactly happy occasions. She doesn't feel like it'd be right to wear it when she finally confronts Adam. Kelly is confused, asking why she wouldn't be wearing the guard uniform. After all, Gira's busy setting up coordination with Mistral, having uniforms will be important. Blake hesitates, her voice raspy as she squeaks out an admission. After they've dealt with Adam, she's leaving the militia, and going back to Vale. That's why she wants to wear her Huntsman outfit again, to prove to herself she can go back and confront her past. Callie is surprised and wary, saying very softly that Blake told them she burned a lot of her bridges when she left. Blake replies that it doesn't matter. She left a lot of people she cared about behind when she came home. How many of them got hurt because of that? How many of them got killed? There's no way to know, what with Vale CCT down. Weiss is the only person she knows got out of there, and when the Schnees are involved, safe is a relative term. Callie clarifies that Blake is feeling guilty about all this. Blake says, no, but yes, but no. It's an obligation, to her friends, to herself, to see the job she never finished through to the end. Callie asks what happens after Blake goes to Vale and rights all those wrongs. She saved all of Vale and her friends, then what? What happens after that? Blake goes blank, blinking into the middle distance before responding that she doesn't know. She never got that far, if it sounds right. She just assumed all those problems would take forever to fix. Callie rests a hand on Blake's, saying that what Blake wants is well and good, but she can't see the problems of her past as problems of her future. Walking backwards is tantamount to running away, and it's only half as coordinated. Blake squeezes her mom's hand and looks to her clothes, and asks through a cracking voice how she fixes her mistakes. Callie smiles and says that a good first step is to stop making old ones. Callie grabs the clothes and chucks them to the floor behind them. She stands and pulls Blake up with her, commenting she never approved of Blake showing so much skin anyway. Caught off guard by her humor, Blake blushes and growls at Callie, who laughs it off. She tells Blake to calm down so she can show her something. They cross the hall into the parents' bedroom, which has the same burned-away door problem as Blake's. 
She has Blake wait by the bed and begins to fumble through her drawers, mumbling while looking for something. With an aha, uh -huh, she pulls free a hardwood box with the Belladonna family symbol on it and hands it to Blake, saying there's no beating the classics. Blake asks what this is, and Kelly tells her it's her old police uniform, the active patrolman one that is. She hasn't worn it in decades, but the two of them have such similar builds that they should only need a few nips and tucks to make it fit right. She pushes Blake towards the bathroom and tells her to try it on and see how it feels. Blake snorts in amused agreement, and Kelly sits on her bed to wait. A few moments go by, and Sun wanders into vision, poking his head first into Blake's room before seeing Kelly. He surprises her by calling her name rather loudly and asking if she's seen Blake. He wanted to get some sparring in before they went out on the boat where it would be too cramped. Kelly explains that Blake is trying on an old outfit, and he's free to sit down and wait for her. He thanks her and plonks down on the bed beside her. Finally, Blake emerges from the bathroom, adjusting the belt while commenting it's a little tight in the back, not noticing Sun. You can see the gears in his head moving as he puts his chin in the crook of his thumb and tilts his head to get a better view. Without blinking, he says, I don't know, looks like a perfect fit to me. It's like an hourglass. Blake jumps, and Callie just looks at him with a mix of mortification, amusement, and flattery. Blake, enraged, asks what he's doing there, and he says that he wanted to spar, but he didn't know they were having mother-daughter bonding time. But now he really wants to spar, and he begins listing off how combat effective her new outfit looks. Both women nearly facepalm over his excited ramblings, and swiftly ignore him as Callie turns to Blake and asks how it feels. She says it feels... nice. Different. And Callie pushes it further, asking if it feels like a fresh start. Blake squeezes the gloves and smiles, saying it feels like no matter where she goes, home is going to be with her. Callie walks over to her and rests a hand on her arm, saying it's not the clothes that give her that feeling. Sun coos over how tender the scene is, and Blake rolls her eyes at him, asking if he's done with his packing. He says yes, and he elaborates that he's going to miss it here. Callie agrees, but also admits it'll be good to give the construction crews time to fix the damage from the assassination. Sun commiserates and says, It's kind of hard to shower when the whole street can see. That wall really needs to get fixed, though I am enjoying the cat calls. And the dog calls. And the snake calls. And the fish calls. The Belladonna stare with lack of amusement, and quickly Blake takes the conversation back. Taking a deep breath, she asks if Callie and Sun are ready to start a war. Callie challenges this, saying, With the path they've chosen, the White Fangs are the ones trying to start a war. It's Menagerie that's trying to stop it. Blake nods, and we cut to Sun, Blake, Callie, and a contingent of Menagerie militia loading up onto a passenger ship, with Gira giving a speech in front of it. People of Menagerie, I come to you today bringing warning of a threat, not just to our way of life, but to the world as it stands. The White Fang, once a group I was proud to call myself the leader of, once a beacon of hope for all Faunus kind, has been morally corrupted from the inside out. This husk has led innumerable evils across the globe, attacking kingdoms, slaughtering the innocent, and most recently attempting to take my life and the lives of my family. And yet, these villainous actions have been left unpunished, either by negligence or incompetence. Today, this ends. We have learned of a plan by the White Fang that would embroil every kingdom on the planet in a war the likes of which unseen since the Great War 80 years ago. In an effort to prevent this, I have asked Menagerie's militia to leave our island and strike at the heart of the White Fang, to stop this horrific event from occurring and quite possibly end the threat of the White Fang entirely. I know there are those of you who disagree with Menagerie involving itself on the world stage, and as a lover of peace in all things, I understand any hesitation to bring call to arms. But the harm these radicals could bring threatens all life across Remnant. With the cooperation of the kingdoms and the fortitude of our militia, I am sure that we will bring a swift and final conclusion to this grim chapter in the history of the Faunus. Interposing this speech is a montage of the Menagerie cast readying themselves on the boat, looking resolute and firm. The final shot of the episode is backdropped by Gira's final sentence, showing Adam walking through a rough-hewn stone passage. He emerges into a tunnel filled with airships, dust, and men. Hazel stands next to him, and he smiles at the larger man, then to his troops, ending the episode on Gira's lingering words. Episode 11 begins with the sound of scraping wood, and we fade in on a knife being dragged against a wooden bear figurine. We hear Vernal saying, and done. See, it's all in the texture of the wood. She holds up the completed bear figurine and smiles, and then she asks to see how Weiss is doing. We cut over to Weiss, who is despondent and trepidatious, holding up a clearly botched bear figurine. Renal snorts and asks what that is, a fish? Weiss pouts and says that it's her first time doing something like this. She wasn't good at piano at first either. She throws the figure at Vernal and it bounces off her head, prompting the bandit girl to laugh. 
Vernal stands and wipes her hands off on her hakama, asking if Weiss wants to go out by the fire now. She heard they were thinking about making hot cocoa. Weiss agrees readily, grumbling that anything is better than that god-awful tea, and Vernal scowls since Weiss said she was getting better at making it. The two exit the yurt into the evening, laughing as they do. They hear a commotion coming from just down the way where the fire pit is, and a good portion of the tribe have circled around it. One of the background tribes members has had a little too much sauce and is rowdily singing a cross between a sea shanty and a bar tune, something like, hey ho to the bottle I go from the Lord of the Rings. However, he's singing so badly the other members are actively throwing things at him, and ultimately Raven walks up and decks him right in the face. The crowd goes quiet as the guy hits the floor and all eyes are on Raven, who looks to them and then bursts out continuing the song, much to the cheers of the tribe. Y steps over the unconscious tribes and, while well, Vernal steps on him, they both grab mugs being offered to the side of the campfire and join the crowd, bopping their heads to the boisterous music while Vernal joins in. Eventually, the music dies down and Raven stokes the crowd for another song, which they're all excited for, but Raven points out that someone in their midst has been rather quiet when it comes to their singing. There are comedically emphasized oohs from the crowd, and Raven turns to Weiss. Weiss, mid-sip, blinks and chokes. She puts her mug to the side and tries to wave away the attention, citing that she can't sing. Raven gives her a nonplussed look and says that her reputation precedes her. There's no way she can lie to get out of this one. Weiss nervously stands, and after a deep breath, she begins to sing a beautiful, lyrical feast for the ears, a gorgeous operatic aria which earns her middling attention at best. She begins to pick up on the group's disinterest and her voice fades to silence. The group are looking at her, confused, and she looks to Vernal for support. Vernal isn't even paying attention, more busy sipping at her own mug. When she does see Weiss's pleading eyes, she's confused and just shrugs. Weiss appraises the crowd one more time, takes a deep breath, and with a crack in her voice, bursts out into a song called The Roads of Anima. It's a deep, body piece with a much more guttural sound, describing the different beauties of the continent and notably ends with the line, The waters of Mistral always lead home. The song takes everyone aback for a second, but by the second chorus the tribe has begun to catch on, Vernal and several other members have joined in, and by the end of the song the entire campfire is singing along. As the song ends, Raven gives Weiss a pleasant smirk and asks where Weiss learned that song, and Weiss replies it's only natural she'd know some folk songs. She was just worried she was rusty, so she went with one that was more practiced at first. Raven slaps Weiss on the back and says that it's a start, before moving on and yelling at someone else to start the next round of songs. Weiss sits back down next to Vernal, who gives her a warmer compliment than Raven. Weiss shrugs and says that she realized she wasn't winning any fans, so she decided to take a chance by shifting gears. After all, better than standing there spinning her wheels. We hard cut to Bumblebee's wheels skidding through the dirt, narrowly being missed by a sweeping spearhead. The camera pans up to Neo riding side saddle, poising her umbrella to deflect the blade. It sweeps again and she narrowly dodges and parries it, leaning back ludicrously far and almost falling off the bike. Yang growls, grabs the spear with one hand, and yanks the bandit off the flatbed he's riding on, shouting that they should learn to take a hint. The camera finally pulls back enough to see that Yang and Neo are being chased by a small fleet of bandit vehicles, all armed with shotguns, spears, and kusarigama. The wheel bumps a series of stone grooves and half-buried bricks in the dirt, and Yang groans about the uneven roads while dodging incoming fire. Neo leans back so far she's practically face to face with Yang, and they share a look. Yang rolls her eyes and says that Neo was the one that started this fight. Neo scowls knowingly, and Yang says that they can talk about this later, after Neo kicks these guys' asses. Neo blinks at Yang in confusion, and Yang steers Bumblebee to the side just as a Kusarigama sails past them right to where their necks would have been. Yang looks back at Neo and says, I'm the one driving the bike! Neo silently groans, and we get a fairly dramatic fight scene where Neo is practically dancing around Bumblebee while fending off the bandits. Standing on it, swinging around it, even at one point Yang ramping off a tree so Neo can jump down right on top of one of the flatbeds. While Neo is on the truck, Yang is dealing with Shiloh, who is riding his own bike and trying to run her off the road. During this, she suffers flashes of an elongated beacon cafeteria, the ruin stretching on forever forward with a distant atom getting closer and closer. Her fingers begin to lock up, and she starts to lose control of the bike, and when Blake appears in the road, Yang swerves to dodge her. Unfortunately, Neo had chosen that time to try and jump back on Bumblebee and ends up missing as a consequence. She uses her umbrella to stutter her tumble and manages to hook Shiloh's arm with the handle, flipping onto the back of his bike instead. He struggles with her, but is ultimately thrown off his bike with one of the trucks breaking off to pick him up. Neo takes control of the bike, 
but realizes that her legs are too short to reach the pedals. Terrified, she drops into a dead skid and steers towards the fumbling Yang, managing to jump onto Bumblebee's back and abandon the bandit mobile. Neo snaps her fingers in front of Yang and breaks her free of her hallucination just as the incline begins to grow. More bandits rush out of a nearby clearing and Yang mutters, Typical bandits, right on cue. They push forward up the incline and break out of the trees onto a lakeshore inlaid with notable chunks of dilapidated architecture, mostly just stone and dirt. The bandits keep pursuing the two towards a point in the shoreline where the land disappears, dropping to a cliff on one side and the lake on the other. Taking a chance, Yang tells Neo to hold onto her hat and ramps off towards the water, into the unknown. They land on a massive weir, over a hundred feet in height, that slides gradually down towards a very familiar set of ruins. Steering them as best she can, Yang guns the throttle towards a collapsed pillar in the water and ramps off it, right into the center of the bandit camp. Before hitting the ground, Neo opens her umbrella and effectively ejects. Meanwhile, Bumblebee bounces painfully, with parts breaking and a loud crunching before it skids to a fuming stop not 20 feet from the campfire, where Weiss was once again starting to lead a rowdy song. Her voice goes from a beautiful serenade to a horrified scream to match the shouts of alarm from the rest of the tribe. Yang coughs from the fumes as Neo drifts gently down on the bike beside her. Yang saying that could have gone better. Neo elbows her in the side and Yang just says, Hey, at least we found the encampment, look! There's tents, there's campfires, there's Weiss. Wait, what? Weiss and Yang lock eyes. Weiss speaks Yang's name, but before they can reunite properly, the rest of the camp surrounds the two on the bike. Neo takes on a very defensive combat stance, ready for anything, using Bumblebee as the high ground. Weiss tells the bandits not to hurt them, and Vernal asks who these people are. Weiss quickly says that Yang is one of her old teammates from Beacon, and follows that up by asking Yang what she's doing out in the middle of Mistral. I'm looking for my mother. How did you get here? I thought you were an Atlas. Plane crash. Isn't that the girl that kicked your ass? Therapy, buddy. Since when do you swear? Plane crash. Since when do you crash your bike? Bandits. Wait, first plane crash or second plane crash? Were there two plane crashes? Same crash, Yang. Oh. Well, all things considered, you're looking great. You too. You got a new arm and everything. Yang cools at that, and the mood changes palpable. She acknowledges the arm and mutely explains that it was a gift from Ironwood. He apparently gave a lot of those out after the fall. Weiss expresses some surprise at that and says that she wished she could have stayed. Yang gives a flicker of a smile and says, Yeah, wish you could have stayed too. There's a sound of motors in the distance as Shiloh and his crew come around the corner. Everyone turns to watch their approach, except Neo, who is busy tapping sword tips with a few of the bandits closest to her. Shiloh rolls up and calls Yang out, a bit cocky that Yang is surrounded. He says that they've done it now. Do they have any idea who's in charge around here? And as he continues to try and gloat, Yang matter-of-factly says, Yeah, I do. And you let us right where we wanted to be. Shiloh's gloating slows and then stops as he looks to Yang and her flashing red eyes. And then he frowns as he starts to get a picture of who he's dealing with. Raven bursts out of a nearby tent, yelling that she goes to the bathroom for five minutes, only to see the chaotic scene in front of her. Yang locks eyes with her and flatly calls out the word, Mother. Shiloh's eyes are wide as he mutters, You're her. Raven is taken aback, and Vernal besides Weiss says, Mom? In confusion. Yang blinks and looks to Vernal, scowling and parodying the word mom before realizing who Vernal is. She asks, Wait, who's this? And Weiss asks, Did you say mother? Vernal is looking at Yang and Weiss with poorly veiled confusion and a slight hint of panic before turning to Raven and asking again, Mom? Raven groans, muttering that this... This is a headache in the making, and looks between the three girls. She looks to Yang and tells her to finish her little reunion or whatever is going on here, and when she's done, meet her in her yurt. They can talk this all out there. Yang glares at Raven and stomps her foot, saying that no, they're going to get their answers now. She's waited long enough for answers. Raven barely spares Yang a glance before continuing on her way to the yurt. Yang, now actively angry, yells at Raven to not ignore her and charges. With a sigh, Raven draws her blade and slashes a portal open in front of Yang, opening one beside Yang as well. Yang raises her fist just as the portal comes to life, and she ends up punching herself in the face, sending her careening off to the side. Raven gives her an unimpressed stare before reiterating that Yang should take care of things out here before joining her in the yurt. And with that, Raven calls for Vernal to follow her, vanishing into the tent flap. Vernal looks to Weiss, Yang, and Neo, her face conflicted, before following. Weiss jogs over to where Yang collapsed and helps lift her to her feet, Yang gripping her sore jaw the whole time. 
Yang glares at Vernal as she leaves, but Weiss helping her up pulls her out of it. Yang looks to Weiss and sees the absolute overflowing joy on her face, and a second later the two are wrapped in an incredibly tight hug. The two admit just how much they've absolutely missed each other before finally separating. Weiss looks over to Neo, who's seemingly still paranoid of attack, blade drawn and tiptoeing around a group of tribesmen that are circling her. Weiss raises a brow and asks, So, therapy buddy? Yang scratches the back of her head and says that it's a long story as we pan up to the young night sky and fade to black, ending the episode. Episode 12 opens with a sound of clicking, like a revolver cylinder cycling. After a few clicks, we see we are inside the cylinder of Omen, looking out on the inside of Raven's hut where Yang, Neo, and Weiss are just now sitting down around Raven's tea table. Cutting away, we see Raven flick through a few more of Omen's blades before selecting a green one and drawing it out for a fresh sharpening. As she begins her work with the sharpening stone, Yang raises a brow and asks, So, are we gonna start talking? Raven gives her a sideways glance before resuming her work. Vernal waits only a beat before responding that they'll talk when Raven feels like talking, and Raven immediately speaks, telling Vernal, I can speak for myself. She then continues to sharpen, a sound that'll be consistent in the background of the entire scene. After a few more strokes, Yang speaks up, saying that Raven's blade will become too brittle if she keeps doing that. Raven replies, they're disposable, which perks Yang's brow and prompts her to respond, Yeah, you'd know a lot about that, wouldn't you? Raven sighs and asks Yang what she wants. Yang drops her hand to the table, saying, Oh, I don't know, to see my mother for the first time in my goddamned life? Raven says, I thought her headstone was in patch, not mistral. Yang tightens her fist and says that Raven knows what she means. Raven says that she doesn't know what Yang means. Yang showed up in a town, beat the crap out of her men, chased them all across Anima, and crash landed in the middle of her camp, all while being backseated by the same girl that Raven had to save her from months ago. Raven raises a pointed finger to Neo and says that she hasn't forgotten that little run-in, and Neo sips her tea nervously. Redirecting her gaze to Yang, Raven says that no, she has no clue what Yang thinks she wants, and she suspects neither does Yang herself, typical of someone raised by that bonehead Zhao Long. Yang stands and shouts that Raven doesn't get to talk about dad like that, and Raven coolly responds, Of course I can if he raised someone with such bad manners. Please. And he called me the savage. Now sit down. Yang snarls, but Weiss tugs at her pants and just asks Yang not to let Raven get to her. She's testing her. Raven raises a brow and Weiss glares at her, saying that she may have this whole bandit queen act down, but in terms of family drama, she's a rookie. Yang looks down at Weiss, surprised at her relaxed assuredness, and looking warily to Raven, she slowly sits down. Raven comments that Weiss is astute, and Weiss fires back that Raven and Yang are more similar than they imagine. In fact, she's surprised she didn't connect the dots between them before. It's blindingly obvious. Raven leans back and says, Well, since I've been found out, why don't we cut the small talk? You don't know why you're here, not really. But I'll tell you why you're here. You belong here. The room goes quiet for a single second before Yang and Vernal both exclaim, What? Raven continues that once a Branwen, always a Branwen. The tribe is their family, and no one wants to be alone. Yang's jaws open in disbelief before she says, No, I'm not a Branwen. I already have a family, one that you ran away from. Raven glares at her and says, No, you have a family here that you were taken from. I let my guard down and made too many mistakes, and by the time I realized it, it was too late. Yang stares daggers from Raven to Vernal, saying, Well, I see you didn't wait long to correct a few of them. Raven eases forward and says that she wants to correct a few more now. Yang belongs here. How many times has she fallen to the bottom and crawled her way back out? How strong has she become as a result of it? She's more than worthy to join the bandits, no questions asked. You're my daughter. You belong with the tribe. Here, beside me, and that spot is still vacant. Off to the side, Vernal watches her mother speak with poorly masked dread. Raven asks Yang to consider it. She could do whatever she wanted, take whatever she pleased, and she'd have a real mom that's willing to show her how to live in the real world. Yang quietly seethes at Raven and then replies, No, you're just a bandit and a murderer. I already have a mom, a super mom. Her name is Summer. Raven stabs Omen into the floor, snarling that Summer was an ideological idiot who ran off and got herself killed. She wasn't Yang's mom, and she only taught her about fairy tales. Yang replies, was still a better mom than you ever were. Raven counters by saying that she never had a chance to be Yang's mother. Really? Yang scoffs. I know all about your semblance. No birthdays, no anniversaries, no graduations. 
The one time I've met you, the one time, was when I was lying half dead on a train car floor and that was barely what you would call in passing. Summer, Raven cuts Yang off and corrects her before she can even begin. Summer swallowed every lie that fell into her lap, ran off half-cocked like she was going to save the world, and where did it get her? Buried in a ditch in the middle of nowhere with nothing but a decorative rock to her name. No birthdays, no anniversaries, no graduations. You're wrong, Yang. She wasn't a better mom than me. She'd have to be alive to do that. Yang slams her fist on the table, shattering it, and she shouts, What is wrong with you? Is that how you think you win someone over? Oh my god, now I understand why Dad and Crow never want to talk about you. There's a cracking noise as Raven's sharpening stops. We see the blade she's been working on has cracked under the pressure. Raven, cold and threatening, tells Yang not to talk about things she has only half the story for. There's so much more at stake than some petty personality conflicts. Yang shouts, Personality conflicts? He's your brother! And Raven retorts, And he's as dumb as Summer. Probably dumber considering he's still Ozpin's dog after what happened to her. Yang is about to rebuff Raven when Weiss rests a hand on her shoulder, asking what Raven means about Ozpin. Raven scoffs and says that the old bastard is a piece of work, a snake that preys on young, innocent minds and rots them into willing pawns for a rigged game. Weiss questions that, saying that Ozpin died a hero. Raven laughs bitterly, saying, If only. Yang and Weiss look at each other and then press for more. Raven rests down her blade and asks how much the girls know about Ozpin. They think on it and give the stereotypical book answers. Youngest headmaster, master huntsman, accomplished diplomat. Raven smirks and asks if it would surprise them to know that the man they know as Ozpin had actually been picking cabbages until he was 22. The two look at her like she's grown three heads and she elaborates that every hunt he's alleged to have done before taking the office was fabricated. Weiss says that can't be true and Raven is quick to ask if Weiss has ever actually checked. There is silence before Raven shrugs and says, Of course, all the attention is drawn to his successes as headmaster. It's all theater. She looks pointedly to Weiss and says, Smoke and mirrors. She continues that unfortunately her best friend, her brother, and her lover all bought Ozpin's words hook, line, and sinker, and look where they are now. Dead, a drunk, and a washed up huntsman. Raven was the only one to cough the bait back up and walk away, and here she is leading her tribe, the only care in her world, an errant child coming home to throw a fit over a problem she knows nothing about. Yang stands, telling Weiss and Neo that they don't have to listen to this garbage. Weiss holds off, however, saying that she doesn't think Raven is lying. Raven doubles down that she's not, and Yang should listen to her. The pampered princess has a good head on her shoulders. Yang turns it around, snarking, Well, maybe I'm too dumb. I'm just a child throwing a tantrum, now aren't I? Should probably blame the parents, oh wait. Raven, finally, sighs and says that Yang is clearly not ready for this. No matter, it'll still take a couple of days for her to repair her bike. Raven will still be here for her when she's ready. Yang rolls her eyes and says, That'd be a first. Yang goes to the door, but is surprised to find only Neo following her. She looks to Weiss, who looks away guiltily. Yang gives a bitter t and storms out the tent flap. Weiss turns back to Raven and says, So, Ozpin. We cut over to the Oz house, where Roman is sipping a mug of coffee and sneezing. He's standing in front of the house's arboretum, cane in one hand, mug in the other. From around the corner, we see Ruby observing him before moving to talk. She catches his attention when she speaks, saying that at first she couldn't see it, but now there are these little things that remind her of Ozpin when she looks at Roman. Roman asks how so, and Ruby points out his posture and pose. He blinks, and then almost immediately he tosses the coffee mug over his shoulder to shatter on the ground behind him. He mutters, Let's not let that become a habit, before looking at Ruby and asking if she wanted something. She waffles between a yes and a no before saying she wanted to talk to him, or more accurately, Ozpin. Roman's more affable attitude cools quickly, and he asks if this will be a short talk or a long one. Ruby gives him a sheepish grin and says that it will be a long one. Roman sighs and says that he has a massage scheduled up at the Cho Chin at 5 and he does not want to be late. Ruby is confused that he gets massages, and he points out that crime lords are people too. Who doesn't want a good massage? Especially when the weight of the world is literally between your ears, apparently. Ruby and Oz promise to be done in enough time to get him to his appointment, and Roman and Oz swap minds. Ruby asks how Oz deals with living inside Roman's head, to which Oz chuckles that one gets used to it after the first few jumps. And keep in mind, Roman can still hear them, so it's best not to say much at his expense. Ruby pouts, but both turn to face the Arboretum. Osman asks what it is that Ruby wanted to discuss, and she says she was wondering about the relics. Sure, they're doing everything they can to protect the relic at Mistral, but what happened to the one at Beacon? 
Ozpin hums and says cryptically that there were some special precautions taken to ensure Salem wouldn't get her hands on it. Ruby raises a brow and her eyes travel to his cane. He laughs and confirms that his cane is not, in fact, a relic, though it does still have a few tricks up its sleeve. Ruby gives a weak, oh, and is quiet for a moment. Then she asks what exactly Salem wants. Oz is hesitant to answer, but then says that immortality can be bitter to those without purpose, and Salem was stripped of hers a long time ago. Enraged, she lashed out at the one thing she could, humanity. Ruby shakes her head and asks who Salem was that would drive her to do that, and Oz says that if he knew that, they may very well have avoided this entire conflict. Ruby asks if it would really have been that avoidable, and he chuckles, perhaps not, but it's nice to consider from time to time, or more bittersweet, I suppose. Ruby mutters under her breath that Penny and Pyrrha would still be alive, her voice tinged with melancholy. She turns and asks what exactly happened at Beacon, and Oz says that she'll have to be more specific. Quite a sum happened there. Ruby specifically asks about after Pyrrha died. She saw Cinder there, and then everything just went black. She asked Crow and her dad, but either they don't know or don't want to tell her. Ozpin nods and explains that in this world exists some miraculous people, exceptionally gifted with skill, with powerful aura, with semblances that could rock the world itself, and even among all those special people, there are a few blessed with a gift that even I fail to fully fathom. You, Miss Rose, have that gift. There's no consistent name for it, but I've taken to just call it Silver Eyes. Ruby hops at this, suddenly excited and asks if he can teach her how to use it. Unfortunately, he cannot, since every person he's met with the gift over his many lifetimes has described it in… different terms. What works for one may not work for another, and all he can figure is that the only teacher for the job would be one with the gift themselves. Or, as he adds cheekily, trial and error, not that he'd ever recommend that as a go-to approach. Ruby deflates at his answer, but Oz smiles warmly at her and says that there's nothing to be ashamed of or responsible for. Most people with the gift never learn they even have it, never have a need for it. To have already used it in such a fantastic way to save Beacon is an achievement so few can call their own, be it by accident or no. I can safely say your parents are proud of you already. Both of them. Ruby looks up at him with watery eyes. She sniffs and wipes her eyes with her sleeve and thanks Oz for answering her questions. He says that she can ask any time, but right now it would appear Mr. Tortrick needs to get to an appointment. And the two swap minds. Roman curses at how much he hates that feeling, and he looks to Ruby, complaining how much that guy loves to hear himself talk. Ruby manages a giggle at that, wiping away the last of her tears. Behind the two, Crow walks up and finds the broken mug on the ground. He yells, Who spilled coffee over the damned floor? and Roman says a rushed goodbye to Ruby before taking off. Crow mutters angrily as he walks past the puddle of coffee, and we focus in on the dark liquid as it fades into an oil puddle besides Bumblebee, where Yang is hard at work on repairs. She wipes a smudge of grease off her cheek and slams her wrench against the frame, growling how she'd just gotten Bumblebee's ship shape a month earlier. We can see she's outside one of the tents near where the rest of the tribe have parked their vehicles, having set up a little vehicle repair bay for herself with some tools. The members who manage the tribe's vehicles, some of whom were even part of the chase with Yang, glare at her from over their own work, keeping a watchful eye on her at all times. In the distance, we hear Weiss's voice, talking calmly and assuredly to Vernal off-screen. She says that Yang isn't that bad once you get to know her, and what she says about Raven is between the two of them. None of it reflects on Vernal. Yang sighs to herself just as Weiss and Vernal round the corner, and she turns to meet them. Vernal seems standoffish as usual, but Weiss gives off a strange aura to her, appearing manically disconnected, almost like she's being haughty. Seeing this, Yang raises a brow and asks if she can help them. Weiss says that since Yang is only staying at the camp a little while, it may be nice for her to get to know Vernal a little bit. Just because Yang's having a tiff with Raven doesn't mean she shouldn't try to get along with her other family. For a brief second, Yang's eyes flash red and she heatedly mutters, It's a little more than a tiff, Weiss. Weiss crosses her arms and says, Fine, cataclysmic disagreement. It doesn't change the sentiment of what I'm trying to do. Yang continues to stare at Weiss, and seeing the passive-aggressive stoicism on Vernal's face, Yang asks, What did Raven say back there? Cuz you're kinda acting weird, Weiss. Weiss quickly replies, I'm acting perfectly normal for someone who's just had their worldview completely upended, so I'd appreciate if we could just move this conversation along. Yang just stares at her when Vernal steps up and says, Just… humor her? She's been like this since we left. Yang groans and asks Weiss what she was planning exactly, and she responds that she was hoping they could all sit down and just have a nice conversation. You know, about less important things. Yang draws out, 
Right. I'm gonna level with you, Weiss? I don't think this is a good idea. I mean, I'm only here for a few days, and I've got to repair my bike. Weiss cuts her off, cheering, and I have to repair your relationships. Again, Yang just blinks at Weiss, who begins to shrivel under the pressuring gaze. Eventually, she squeaks out that she thought that using a pun might win Yang over. Vernal off to the side says that wasn't really a pun. Yang shakes her head and waves both of them off, saying that she has work to do, only to incur the wrath of Vernal, who steps in and all but demands that Yang at the very least give Weiss's idea a chance, as much as she doesn't like it herself. Yang grimaces and slams her wrench into the dirt before turning to Weiss and asking, All right, Miss Psychiatrist, what's your icebreaker for the evening? To which Weiss pops on her heels and says, Well, in my experience, the most riveting conversations are found on common ground, so I thought we should all have a nice conversation about personal grooming. Yang and Vernal look at Weiss like she's grown two heads, and Weiss quickly clarifies, Hair! I thought we could talk about how we each do our hair! Both Yang and Vernal cross their arms and roll their eyes in a clear mirror of each other, before Yang looks to Vernal and says, See? Look, it's clear you don't want anything to do with me, and frankly, I don't want anything to do with you or Raven. Not anymore. So let's call it even, okay? Vernal just glares at Yang and says, I don't see what Mom or Weiss see in you. You've been nothing but an indignant child since you've arrived. Y stomps her foot and seeds at both of them. Stop talking about Raven. Not everything revolves around her. Your relationship isn't defined by hers. Vernal raises her voice and points to Yang, saying that she isn't even trying. My problems aren't because of Mom. They're because she keeps disrespecting you, her supposed friend, when you're only trying to help. Yang drops her wrench, finally standing to meet Vernal eye to eye. It's not that I don't think Weiss is trying to help. I see it. I appreciate it. But I don't plan to spend any more time here than I need to. I think I got what I came for, as miserable as that ended up being. I'd rather not have my friend waste her time on something that'll go nowhere. Vernal hums in terse agreement, saying, Well, at the very least, we can both agree that it's a waste of time. I wouldn't want someone as ungrateful as you in the tribe anyway. Yang shakes her head, asking how in any way she's been ungrateful. Vernal quickly responds that of course she is. She's passing up a chance to join the greatest bandit tribe in all of Mistral. Yang rolls her eyes and says that if wanting regular showers makes her ungrateful, that's fine by her, and she returns to working on her bike. Surprised you made it this long, Weiss. Yang continues. Must be excited to go somewhere with indoor plumbing soon, am I right? When the words leave Yang's mouth, Vernal's already crossed body language becomes practically frigid as she locks up, only moving to look at Weiss with an anxious stare. Weiss, meanwhile, is fretting on her heels and begins to bite at her thumbnail. Quietly, she admits, I haven't really thought about it. I've kinda gotten used to things here, honestly. Yang pauses and looks up at Weiss, asking, You're serious? You actually like going to bed covered in a mosquito net and three gallons of bug spray? Replies that there's definitely drawbacks, but overall it's been weirdly liberating being in the tribe. Yang blinks and shakes her head, asking if Weiss is still coming with her and Neo to Mistral, and again, Weiss is hesitant. Before she can give a more thorough answer, Vernal insists that of course Weiss will be staying with the tribe. She's better off in the tribe than anywhere else in the world, and she has the makings of a real bandit. Yang grips her forehead and glares at Vernal, telling her point blank to stop speaking on Weiss's behalf. She can answer for herself. Weiss goes to interject when Vernal retorts that Weiss shouldn't need to point out the patently obvious. It's not obvious, Yang replies. Camping out for a little while is fun, but I can't imagine living out here like this, especially when you have to regularly kill people to keep the fires lit. Yang turns to Weiss. They kill people, you know that, right? Vernal pokes a finger into Yang's face. You can't imagine it, but Weiss is a natural. It's only natural then that she stays. Brushing the finger out of her face, Yang replies. Yeah, that's not exactly obvious when I've been here a grand total of like two hours. Vernal is about to reply herself when Yang continues, her voice more resigned. Look, I assumed she'd be coming with me, but if she's really happy here, well, I'll be surprised, but I'm not going to stand in her way. She's a big girl, she can decide for herself. Vernal can't believe what she's hearing. You say you're friends, yet when you think she's making a mistake, you do nothing to stop her. Yang growls and bangs her head against the frame of her bike in frustration. What? No, because I trust her to do what's right by her. Don't you? The words take Vernal by surprise and she physically steps back. I... Of course I do. Yang rolls her eyes, reaching back into the bike's guts. Then act like it. Vernal stomps her foot, seething. She's going to regret leaving. I'm trying to protect her. Yang shakes her head. From where I'm sitting, you're not protecting her from herself, you're protecting her from hurting you. Vernal cringes at the declaration, but Yang presses on. You need to understand, 
I'd give my life for Weiss in a heartbeat, but the last thing I want to do is control her. She has things she wants to do, and I'm not going to get in the way of any of that. Sure, it'll hurt if she stays here, but I'd rather that than her be miserable for the rest of her life. Sparing a glance back to Weiss, Yang adds, I trust you, Weiss. You do you. Weiss stares at Yang, her mouth unable to form words. Her eyes flicker between the two half-siblings, and Vernal's face becomes more and more pained as Weiss refuses to declare if she's staying or not. After a beat of silence, Vernal backs away from the two in defeated disbelief, muttering to herself, I... No, it's just... I just... If Weiss... No. No. Oddly enough, seeing Vernal's vulnerability, Yang's patented big sister mode begins to kick in, and she reaches out for Vernal, saying with absolute kindness, Hey, look... Not everything is a fight. Shut up, Vernal shouts, pushing Yang's hand aside and looking wildly between the two teammates. Just shut up. I don't understand you people. Vernal backs away, and after a beat, she turns on her heels and flees between the yurts, vanishing from view. Yang and Weiss watch her leave before Weiss slides down besides Yang and openly wonders how Ruby manages to make friendship feel effortless. Yang pats Weiss on the shoulder and says that she's wondered that for years now. Weiss sighs and asks Yang how long it's going to take her to fix her bike. A couple of days, and then me and Neo are out of here. And of course you if you decide to hop on. Weiss blinks at Yang and asks, You'd really let me stay? Yang shrugs. Like I said, it'd suck, but I meant what I said. All of it. Not to say I won't try to convince you. It'd be cramped, but next stop is Mistral, which is where Ruby was headed last time I checked. Weiss is quiet and then leans in the Yang's side, sighing, I do miss baths. Yang smiles to herself and replies, Yeah, of course you do. She returns to work on her bike, but as she raises her wrench, she catches her hand trembling. Scowling, Yang closes her fist and grabs her wrist stopping the shaking and ending the episode. Episode 13 opens with a wet thwack as the camera gives way to a falling body with a blade in its back, revealing Cinder, Emerald, and Mercury standing among the burning remains of a random bandit tribe. Cinder rolls her shoulder and comments how tiresome this is already getting. The second bandit tribe they found and still no lead on the Brinewinds. That informant from the spiderweb was useless. Mercury comments that it's good practice, though Cinder is quick to remind him they've had more trouble with the Huntsmen they've been fighting the last few months. This barely broke a sweat. Hopefully these Branwins live up to their reputation, because so far she's not been impressed, as she glares at the body. Emerald points out that their first course of action is diplomacy, right? Like, they're not hoping to fight them, and Mercury asks how well diplomacy goes with Cinder involved normally. Emerald says that Cinder is a wonderful negotiator. She negotiated with him, didn't she? And Merc replies that the two of them showed up outside of his house while he was basically dying. Cinder casually looks back and says that they successfully negotiated his survival. Merc looks bemusedly at Cinder before shrugging to M, who looks smug and amused. Cinder pulls out her scroll and sees a number of missed calls from Watts. She dials him, and he picks up, though she's not very genial with him, Kurt because of how long their search is taking. Watts is amused by this, since it was her idea to use such blunt force methods. Cinder snarls that they're not an atlas with a full suite of drones at their fingertips. He responds, Ah, but we do have information networks. Cinder demands he spare them the lecture, and he summarizes, In between my projects, I've had time to track down some sources. And crossing that with camps you've already crossed off, well, I think I've gotten a lead. In fact, I'm sure of it. I'm planning to go myself to ensure the deal. I'd tell you where it is, but I wouldn't want to lecture you, now would I? Cinder growls that he better give her the information or she'll bring this up with Salem, and Watts casually remarks that the coordinates are already on their way. Cinder must learn how to take a joke. He's told that life without laughter is not much of a life at all. It'll take them three days to get there on foot. He'll meet them there. And with that, he hangs up. Emerald sighs and complains, More walking? Ugh. Merc tells her to quit complaining, but she quickly shoots back, You have robot legs! Cinder tells them to stow it. Long walks are unbearable enough. The three move to leave the camp, letting us see a little more of the absolute devastation in their wake. The camera lingers on a single flame, still flickering, and we transition to a flickering bonfire in the Bramwin camp. A group of tribesmen are eating dinner, with Weiss regaling them all with the jaunty song. In the distance, near the lake's edge, Yang and Neo watch, eating their own dinner. Yang watches Weiss and shakes her head, in open bafflement of how Weiss can get along with these people. Neo shrugs to Yang, and Yang points to the ground, gawking. They're murderers and thieves! Neo gives Yang a flat stare, and Yang fumbles, saying that Neo is totally different. Neo rolls her eyes, and Yang defends herself, saying that Neo knows what she means. Neo silently chuckles, then looks out to the lake, teeming with early evening fireflies. Across the water next to the cherry tree is Raven. Neo nudges Yang, who matches her gaze. 
The two wonder briefly what she's doing there, and Neo signs to Yang that she should go talk to her. Yang rolls her eyes and says that she has nothing to say. Neo replies that leaving things like this is poison, a slow one that'll eat Yang from the inside out. Yang was the one that wanted to come here, and leaving without saying her piece to Raven would be leaving empty-handed. You don't walk away in the middle of a heist. Yang mulls it over, gives a strangled groan, and stands. We cut over to Raven, who seems to be mimicking the prayer stance of her tribesmen before breaking it and seething to herself that she's acting ridiculous. She hears water being tread and turns to find Yang crossing the submerged bridge to the island. Yang complains, asking how Raven got here without getting her boots wet. Raven ignores the question and asks if Yang is ready to talk. Yang's face contorts with rage, but Raven quickly holds up a hand and tells her to wait. Raven apologizes. She's not used to talking. Yang's rage cools, but not enough to stop her from bitterly asking, even with your own daughter? Motioning to the shore in reference to Vernal, not herself. Raven says, Yang, please, I'm trying. Yang swallows her next words, breathes a frustrated sigh, and rakes her fingers through her hair, muttering, Around, not through. Raven gives a warm, bemused smile, asking, How is Tai? Yang pauses mid-rake, taking a seat on a nearby fallen column. The two share a quiet moment of catching up over Tai, how he's teaching at Signal, doing outpatient therapy work. He's happy. Raven says that's… that's good, and silence hangs between them. Raven sits down next to Yang and sighs before saying, I… didn't want to leave you. Yang is quiet for a moment then says, I know. Doesn't change that you did. More silence before Raven says she doesn't think it was the wrong choice, and Yang asks, for you? Or for me? Raven replies both, at least at first she thought that. She scratches at her head and growls that she's not good at this. She does things, she doesn't talk about them. Words are always so cheap next to actions. Yang asks, if that's the case, what do your actions towards me say? Raven is quiet before she says, simply, she failed. Again, Yang is the greatest regret that she's ever had, especially hearing what Weiss had to say involving Team Ruby and Ozpin. She wanted to take Yang away from all that, but Tai… and Summer… and… she exhales. Finally, she slams her fist on the stone and seethes that it's Oz. It's all Oz, and it always has been. Yang shakes her head and finally asks what Raven's deal with Ozpin is. Raven asks if Yang is truly ready to listen, and Yang, giving only a moment's thought, says yes, she thinks she is. Raven looks across the shore and begins to explain that the Grimm have a master, a witch by the name of Salem. We know so little about this world. She gestures to the ruins. But Ozpin is older than all of this, old enough to remember the days before Salem, and claims to fight her at every turn. He's reincarnated hundreds of times, possessing a new host each time, and he tells us he's leading a holy crusade to save mankind. If only that were the case. I don't know what exactly he's trying to do, but whatever it is, all it's ever done is get people killed. He lets powerful tools like magic relics and maidens so powerful they can shift the weather itself rot, unused. Why? It's never to find Salem and take her out, only to stave off defeat, always pushing her threat down the road. Who has that much power and never uses it? Yang is quiet till the end of the whole diatribe, muttering to herself in confusion over maidens and relics, but answers the rhetorical question. Maybe, she says, he has a good reason. Raven confirms that's her suspicion too, and that reason is not to win. Just keep the game going. Now why he wants that, she never learned, and frankly she didn't stick around to find out. Team Stark was the latest in a long line of teams that Oz has burned through, and by the sounds of it, Team Ruby was just the next pawn in his sick game of chess. Raven frowns and looks to the ground, saying, Like mother, like daughter. Yang asks how she's supposed to believe all this. There's a lot to take in, including the idea that magic of all things exist. Raven smirks and says that Yang knows her semblance, correct? Yang knits her brow and explains that Raven's semblance is some kind of teleportation, isn't it? Linking all the people that are important to her. Raven elaborates that it allows her to sense when her loved ones are in danger, know if they're alright. Raven walks to the water's edge and says, You asked how I got out here without getting my shoes wet, didn't you? And with a step, she sends herself falling towards the water, only to turn into a raven, skimming across the water, silhouetted by the setting sun. She circles back around and transforms back, landing on her feet. Looking at Yang's shocked face, she says, A gift. From Oz. And one that's coming useful. Believe me, if I thought he had genuine intentions, I'd be right there beside him, if only for the power I could get from it. But I don't trust him one bit. And you shouldn't either. Yang is awed, her mind processing what Raven said, and then she stands, suddenly frantic. 
Wait, what you and Weiss said about us? We were next? She pauses and puts the dots together. They're next. Ruby, John, Nora, Ren, they're all next! Raven nods. They'll all burn, and they'll smile as they light their own pyres. Yang's arm begins to shake, and she steadies it with her other hand as Raven continues. Once Oz gets an idea into someone's head, it never leaves. Raven looks up to the falling petals, wistful. It's all too tempting to be the hero he makes you out to be. Odds are, if Rose's kid has been convinced by him, it's already too late. Yang says that's not even in question. Ruby's getting in over her head, and I need to protect her. Raven frowns, saying that by choosing that, it'll be no better than getting wrapped up in it herself. Yang should just stay here and not get involved. And if she really wants, Raven will send her back the tie, free of charge. Yang is adamant though, she needs to get to Ruby. Raven sighs and the mood noticeably cools. Raven says that this is Yang's last chance. After this, she won't be welcomed back in the tribe. That ship will sail and you only ever get one. Yang hesitates, but then affirms herself, saying that it's not a hard decision to make. She turns and makes direct eye contact with Raven, eyes red, hair flickering with motes of fire, and she says that she doesn't abandon her family. Raven grits her teeth and says, Fine, fix your damned bike. The minute it's good to go, I'll drop you off with Crow and your sister. Get wrapped up in their mess for all I care. But after this, we're done. Yang begins to wade back into the water, looking towards the shore. She glares back at Raven and says, Fine by me. As Yang walks across the bridge, we have her framed, leaving Raven behind at the tree, and then we pan up to the sky. Panning down, we find ourselves aboard the ship taking the Menagerie Militia to Mistral, and I dare you to say that five times fast. Gira is at work in one of the cabins, filling out form after form, writing note after note. Tired, he grips his brow and asks if Tally would get him some tea. However, Callie doesn't respond because she's passed out at her own desk, slobbering over some of the paperwork. Gira looks at her exasperated but warmly, stands, and puts a blanket over her shoulders before leaving the room. Out on deck, he leans over the railing to get some nighttime air, giving a world-weary sigh, and soon enough he's joined by a curious Blake. They break into a small conversation where he admits that moving this many bodies across an ocean is more headache than he thought it'd be. He never did anything quite as grand, even during his time as leader of the White Fang. Last time this many Faunus forces moved as one was back during the Faunus Uprising in Mantle. Blake hums in agreement, saying it's only about a week until they make landfall. Does he have everything set up with the Mistral Council? Gira confirms that he does, and he asks back if Blake is nervous. Blake replies that she's more excited than anything, which confuses Gira, but she says that it's the first time she's had a clear conscience about doing something. She's not lying, she's not making excuses, there's a clear path forward for what she needs to do, and it's surprisingly freeing. Gira smiles at her and comments that her new outfit fits her well, but the confidence fits better. A little strange to see someone besides Kelly wearing it, but you've got her youthful optimism going on. Blake raises a brow at optimism, since she so rarely had it applied to her, and he says much the same was said about him in his youth, always scrolled away with a book and lashing out against the world. But with age comes wisdom, and he's already begun to see that spark behind her eyes, just like she had back when she was a kid. He misses Blake when she was a kid, and small enough that he could carry her on his shoulders. Blake blinks at him and says, Dad, you still can. You're like seven feet tall. Gira blinks, measures Blake up, then asks if he can, to which she haughtily says, No! Laughing, he offers a hug as a compromise, and she agrees, hugging him back, only to end when he lifts her whole body anyway, causing her to squeal with laughter. The camera pans down past the deck of the ship and into the shadows before sliding out of the bottom of a thicket of tree branches into a forest during the early morning. On a fallen log sits a pleasant little bunny, and as the camera comes into focus, we see behind it, in the shrubs, Bernal knocking an arrow on a familiar green bow. She looks about ready to loose it, when Weiss appears behind her and coos over the adorable rabbit. Vernal's shot goes wide, and the rabbit scampers off. She turns and curses to Weiss that there goes their dinner, and Weiss retorts for Vernal not to get so dramatic. There's plenty of meat back on the drying racks in camp. Besides, it was cute. Vernal glares at Weiss and goes to collect her arrow, asking what Weiss wants. Weiss says that what she wants is to have a conversation with her friend. Vernal has barely acknowledged Weiss's existence the last few days. Vernal snarks that she's perfectly fine. This is how perfectly fine people perfectly act. Weiss shakes her head and says, Hey, if this is about that conversation the other day... Vernal cuts her off. 
I've got nothing to say about that conversation. Weiss groans and says, I don't believe that for a second. And Vernal's reply back is, You can believe whatever you want. After tonight, I don't have to deal with either of you anymore, so it doesn't matter. Weiss hesitates before asking if leaving is really bothering Vernal that much. Vernal looks over at Weiss, eyes wavering between a myriad of emotions. She turns away and picks up a nearby stick, drawing a small knife from her pouch and beginning to whittle. Coldly, she asks if Weiss's mind is made up, and Weiss is slow to say that it is. Vernal stops her whittling, breathes, and turns to ask Weiss, Why? There's a good life for her in the tribe. She's fitting in perfectly, like she's one of their own. Okay, maybe not perfectly, she still bathes way more than she needs to. Weiss glares and says that everyone else bathes way less than they need to, by her measure. Still, Vernal says, this could be your home. No stupid rules, expectations, parties, stuffy performances. Just freedom as far as you're willing to take it. Weiss says that all sounds wonderful, but she was already making that for herself, and she has people that depend on her, obligations that she doesn't mind having. This is doubly so knowing that her best friend is being dragged down a rabbit hole. Well, someone's gotta save her, because that klutz isn't going to save herself. Vernal asks if Weiss is really choosing them over her, and Weiss tries to say that she doesn't see it that way. Not everything is a competition. Vernal turns back to her whittling, angrily dragging the blade across the wood, muttering that maybe Weiss doesn't fit in as well with the tribe as Vernal had thought. Weiss says that she'll always fondly remember her time in the tribe, but it's not a life for her and it's time to say goodbye. Properly, Vernal glances over her shoulder, clicking her tongue and saying, yeah, well, goodbye, before returning to her whittling. Weiss, crestfallen, walks towards the tree line and she lingers, saying that she has her own tribe that needs her, her and Yang both, but their two tribes don't have to be exclusive. We're going to leave. I'd really like for you to be there, to say goodbye, to me and Yang. You can't expect another sibling to fall out of the sky anytime soon. Don't waste it. Vernal is stoic, and Weiss leaves the grove. Vernal looks at the little whittling she's done, lines up the blade, and begins to carve again. Seconds later, droplets of tears fall on the wood as we fade out over the sound of carving, ending the episode. Episode 14 begins with a map being slapped down onto the living room table of the Oz house. Ranger, Crow, and Roman are seated around the map, looking at it as Crow rattles off instructions for the day's operation. He's narrowed down the area that the Branwins could be in, in particular half a dozen routes to the northwest of Mistral heading up towards Lake Matsu. Between that and what he remembers of the tribe's usual settling patterns, there's about four different plots where they could probably be set up. With a little more legwork, they should be able to narrow it down some more, and from there they can head out. The closest plot is relatively close by foot, but the others could take days, if not weeks, to get to, so they'll have to prepare for quite a hike and a fight. Everyone is staring at him, and John asks how Crow came by all this information. Crow explains that while they were playing card games, he was working, watching the roadways and city entrances for damaged or raided merchant caravans. After that, it was just a matter of a few follow-up interviews while the kids were out and about. The room is quiet, and Ruby cheers, That's my uncle! So what do we do next? Crow explains that he's still waiting to hear back from some caravans to narrow down the field, and after that, they'll have everything they need. What needs to happen now is to gather supplies and collect huntsmen. He can handle the latter, but the kids should handle the shopping. After all, their old equipment hasn't held up so well. And he turns his eyes to multiple rucksacks in the corner that are literally falling apart. In fact, a cord holding a saucepan snaps while looking at it. With that, Crow straightens his stand and hooks Harbinger on his back, walking to the door. Nora asks if he wants someone to go with him, but he says that veteran huntsmen won't exactly be leaping at a job where rookies are at the heart of things, no matter how good they might actually be. No, he'll move faster on his own, and he has more street cred to tout around. Just get the supplies, and start prepping a big dinner for everyone that's going to come around when he brings them. Everyone watches him leave before Ren realizes, out loud, that Crow didn't leave them any money. All eyes turn to Roman, and he sighs, saying, You kids are a bad influence on me. What follows after this, in a rare instance where I can actually say it in this script, is a near one-to-one -one retread of Crow's search for the Huntsman from Volume 5, Episode 6. The only exception is adding a small scene at the beginning where he's checking the Huntsman boards, finding many of them on assignment, and many others of unknown status. He makes a cross-reference of contacts on his scroll and heads out. But other than that, we follow him as he scours the city, goes into that ramen shop, pisses off the owner, goes around town, searches for Heather Shields at her house, meets her dejected and scared family, and finally comes back to the board with a reassessment of what the unknown designations truly mean. Truly, this has been Crow's ungroovy adventure. 
We end the sequence with Crow revisiting the ramen shop and paying the tab for the lost huntsman colleague, leaving the racist and aggressive owner conflicted. Outside the shop, Crow sighs and walks through a sitting flock of birds that scatter and fly into the sky, where we follow them. Moments later, we come down in front of the cherry tree at the ruins, with Yang, Neo, and Weiss facing Raven. Nearby, Vernal is supporting a pillar, pointedly disinterested in the conversation happening between her mom and her sibling. Raven says this is Yang's last chance to change her mind, but Yang stays firm. Raven nods, and she says she'll miss the insubordination from Weiss. It was refreshing. Weiss replies that that's a weird thing to remember about someone, but Raven points out that at the very least Weiss is memorable. Weiss at the very least talks, and her eyes fall to Neo, who's patently confused before Yang tells her mom that Neo's mute. Raven's surprise is minimal, and she replies that she thought Neo was just scared of her. Oh well. Neo stares at Raven with pure confusion before Yang steps up and asks to hurry this along. Raven waves off Yang's impatience and opens a portal with her blade. Yang gets on Bumblebee, Weiss behind her, and Neo poises herself precariously on the bike's cowl cover. Yang says that normally this is where someone would wish them luck, and Raven tells Yang to make her own luck. Yang replies, Wow, harsh, and revs her engine. Before they can go, Vernal tells them to wait and circles away from the pillar. She approaches Weiss and hands her a wood sculpted Nevermore. Weiss takes it and asks if Vernal is sure, and she is, but Weiss shouldn't read anything into it. Weiss smiles warmly at her and says that she'll treasure this, always. Vernal smiles back, briefly, before locking eyes with Yang. For a second, they're still, before she reaches into her pouch and draws a miniature sculpt of Yang's bike. Vernal looks to the side and says, I think your bike's pretty cool. Yang dumbfoundedly takes the carving and slowly puts it in her pocket, saying a weak, confused, thanks? As Vernal walks beside her mother. Yang says they'll be going, and with no further words from Raven or Vernal, the trio drive into the portal, Neo waving off the back. Vernal doesn't turn to watch them leave. Meanwhile, Crow is out on a promenade on the mountainside, overlooking the city below. He's scowling into the middle distance when the portal sounds behind him on a flight of stairs. He watched it warily, reaching for Harbinger, and is lingering there until finally the trio come bursting through, jittering down the stairs on the bike and sliding to a stop in front of him. Yang curses to herself that Raven's an asshole for dropping them off on the stairs, and the other two are still shaking off the jolt. Crow says Yang's name in surprise, and the three look to him, Yang putting on a massive strained grin before saying, Surprise! We cut to black, ending the episode. Episode 15 fades in on a boiling pot of sukiyaki, being prepared by Team Ranger. There's some light conversation going on between the four, like asking if they have enough food or if they've overbought supplies, which is matched by a cutaway to an entire room stuffed with materials. But otherwise, it's a fairly short amount of time before Crow arrives at the house with Yang, Weiss, and Neo. We get Crow calling for Ruby, her bringing the tea, and then her seeing Yang and Weiss, prompting her to drop the entire set in shock. She mumbles incoherently, Yang walks up to her, and they have a totally not awkward animated hug before finally inviting Weiss into the hug pile. Again, in a rare moment, this basically plays out untouched. During all of this, the other members of Ranger enter the room and watch the reunion, and Neo makes herself small at Crow's side, trying to avoid Ruby's gaze. Eventually, the hug breaks, and Yang gently grabs Ruby by the shoulders, saying that she has someone to introduce to Ruby, and she has to promise not to freak out. She then steps away, and Ruby sees Neo clearly for the first time since the fall of Beacon. Ruby blinks and is still, prompting Yang to say, Huh, didn't expect that reaction, before Ruby turns to her and says that they have someone to introduce to Yang, and she has to promise not to freak out. Yang is about to question her when Roman bursts through the front doors, carrying a full armload of supplies. He complains about some asshole parking their garish bike out front and how difficult it is to pickpocket after rush hour. He drops his supplies, and when he sees Crow, he smiles and says, You didn't hear that. Then he turns to find Neo there. He blinks, rubs his eyes, blinks again, before saying flatly, Aren't you dead? Neo looks at him with watery eyes before jumping into his arms, forcing him to spin on his heels. When they're finally grounded, she begins to beat on his chest angrily, her face mixed with rage, sadness, happiness, confusion, a whole slew of emotions. Everyone watches, John asks exactly what is their relationship, and Nora tells him not to ruin the moment. He responds that they're criminals! Yang says that they all have a lot to discuss, and Ruby agrees, though Ren is quick to say that dinner comes first. A full stomach should come before emptying one's mind. Ruby frets over having enough food for when the huntsmen come, and Crow finally steps in, saying that they don't really need to worry about that. Unfortunately. Weiss is next to speak, saying that she's starving. She hasn't eaten a proper meal in weeks. 
Ruby pinches her nose and says it smells like she hasn't bathed in weeks either. Y stamps her feet and says that she was actually told that she bathes too much. Then she drops the haughty facade and says that she desperately needs a bath. Immediately. Ruby nods and says she'll show them to the showers while everyone else finishes dinner. John asks, what about them? Looking to Neo and Roman, who seem to be silently communicating to each other. Yang just says, eh, let them have their time. They'll be fine, probably. So what's this about dinner? We then cut to the whole crew absolutely pigging out on all the delicious food they made, and all the food is properly prepared and not served in one gigantic tub because our artists actually understand how food works. When Ruby asks for her duck sauce, she gets her goddamn duck sauce. What follows is a cutesy scene where the teenagers get to reconnect and have a good time, including such scenes as Weiss getting her nickname mocked and enjoying it, Ranger talking about the Nuck fight and complimenting each other, Yang talking about her arm and leading to the whole arm wrestle rematch with Nora, and even a quiet scene outside with Roman and Neo who are eating dinner on the house patio. End of all of it, it's super cute and wholesome, and there are absolutely no lines where anyone flatly describes character growth because that would be cringe. Eventually, Crow, Roman, and Neo come to collect the group, and they all move to the lounge. As Yang sits down, she finally asks a question that she didn't ask before dinner. Why the hell is Roman Tortric of all people working with Ranger and Crow? Roman sighs, grumbling over having to do this so much, before allowing Ozpin to inhabit his body. Ozpin greets Yang and Weiss warmly, as well as Neo who is more than a little weirded out by Roman speaking with another man's voice, to the point she steps away warily to Yang's side. As Ozpin gives the cursory explanation he needs to and the confusion begins to wear away, Yang curses to herself, Shit, Raven wasn't lying. When Crow hears that, he stands at attention, alarmed, and begins to say, What did Raven tell? When Yang immediately jumps and stares down Oz. You bastard! Why my sister? Why my team? Why my friends? Oz is only phased for the most split of seconds before sighing deeply and rubbing his forehead. He says that, No matter how many times I have tried to explain the circumstances of the secret war, it seems never to be sufficient. Always one person out of the group, those that do not understand or I lack the words to explain, and when they digest the truth, they fear what they have agreed to. Your mother, Yang, is an exceptional individual. Smart, talented, deadly. Much like you and your friends here. Raven seems to believe I sought her out, along with her compatriots, but in reality, it is these traits that led them to me. Victims of their gifts, so to speak. Yang scoffs, and Crow speaks up before she can, saying that it's true, and when she tries to interrupt again, he pleads her to listen to Ozpin. That quells her, if only for a minute. Ozpin continues that Raven believes that she and her team were heroes meant to stop the evils of the world, and to a lesser extent, that's what all huntsmen are. Day by day, easing the woes of society plagued by monstrosity. However, Oz himself, and the company he keeps, serves a much different purpose. They are not to eliminate the woes of the world, nor rid it of Salem. Instead, they are a counterpoint, a balance, meant to prevent her from wiping out all life on Remnant. The fact that he has tried and failed countless times to kill Salem should attest to that simple fact. He chuckles, thinking fondly on Raven's hard-headed attitude and perspective. She wished to be the hurricane and never the clouds. Ruby pipes in, saying that this is exactly what they've been training for their whole lives, to protect people, to keep them safe. Yang argues back that it was never this big. It would be protecting villages, doing contract work, not saving the whole world. John speaks up that it's not like they really have much of a choice. They weren't all that involved when Beacon fell. The disasters came to them. And now that they know the truth, ignoring it would be... John trails off and Ren finishes by saying... Immoral. Ozpin chimes in that, immoral as it may be, foisting the entire world on someone's shoulders is not an easy thing to ask, and says there's no shame in anyone that wishes to leave. That goes for everyone, not just Yang, Weiss, and Neo. Quiet settles around the room, with everyone contemplating their decisions. Weiss is the first person to volunteer to assist Oz, surprising everyone, especially Yang, who balks at her and asks why. Weiss responds that between Ozpin's and Raven's stories, there's one clear factor. Salem exists, and she's trying to destroy the world. Ren's right that it'd be immoral, irresponsible to ignore that. Whatever truth there is to Ozpin leading people on, at the very least she knows she's doing something to stop Armageddon. And if they find a way to stop Salem later on, then they can talk about how Ozpin handled things. Ozpin praises Weiss's pragmatism, and Yang thinks on it, biting her lip. She looks to Ruby with that pleading look in her doughy silver eyes, before relenting and agreeing to join the cause. But, no more lies from Ozpin, no more miscommunications. 
If there's something they need to know, he will explain it until everyone in the room understands. Nora asks, Even John? And John gives an indignant, Hey! As the group laughs, Osmond cedes control back to Roman. He blinks to awareness and turns to Neo, who is looking uneasily at him. He reaches for her, but seeing the discomfort in her eyes, he sighs and shrugs, giving her a lopsided grin while saying, I'm still me. Neo still appears uneasy, but she approaches him and stands at his side once more, glancing at him periodically to make sure he's still him. Crow watches the warm moments happening around him, smiling for only a split second before looking out the window and seeing a raging storm in the far distance, past the mountains. Scowling, he takes a sip of his flask and walks deeper into the room, the storm reflected on the window's surface. We then cut over to the very storm at the Bramwing camp, where the tribesmen are scrambling to batten down the hatches. Shiloh, guarding the outskirts of the camp, curses the sudden rain as a foggy mist begins to roll in from the tree line. From the mist, figures begin to emerge, people untouched by the rain and mud as the ground dries beneath their feet. As they come close, we see Emerald and Mercury, both flanked by Cinder. Behind them, outside the seemingly anti-storm bubble, is Watts, with his umbrella open and a scowl on his face. Cinder smiles as Shiloh raises his gun, his hands shaking, telling them to get back. Emerald puts a hand on her hip, asking, What about this situation makes you think a gun is going to stop us? Shiloh narrows his eyes, and Cinder tells Emerald not to antagonize the man. He knows he's out of his depth. Sharply, Cinder asks which way she is. Shiloh doesn't lower his weapon, but nods his chin towards Raven's tent. Cinder thanks him and begins on her way in. Emerald and Mercury follow closely behind, though Merc teases Shiloh with a fakeout, causing the man to fire into the woods out of surprise. Watts shides Mercury for his sophomoric behavior and lays his hand on Shiloh's revolver, apologizing to him for his colleague's disrespect. We cut to Raven's tent, where she's plugging a hole in the ceiling, when Vernal comes in, saying that Salem has found them. Raven is pensive, but looks to her daughter and nods. Vernal puts on her face mask, and so does Raven. The two emerge just as Cinder approaches. Raven calls Vernal's name, and Vernal raises her hand. In a second, the storm around the camp dissipates, leaving them in the veritable eye. Cinder comments how quickly Raven decides to show her hand, and Raven replies that she thought she'd return the favor. It was nice of Salem to send some stupid kids, a failed at Legion scientist, and a maiden with an on-the-nose name. Watts corrects that he's actually a doctor, but the rest is on point. What follows is, spiritually, the same scene as in the original volume where Cinder exhorts Raven into cooperating with Mami Salami. From Cinder's side, they want Vernal to open the door and retrieve the Relic of Knowledge, and afterwards everything is square. Salem will never bother Raven or her tribe ever again. Raven, knowing the tribe is between a rock and a hard place, agrees, on the condition that the Salami Slices kill Crow and everyone around him who has allied with Ozpin. Cinder agrees to the condition, which is where Watts initially objects. But Cinder puts her foot down that she's the one in charge, and it'll be a perfect chance to get revenge for what happened to her, grabbing her covered arm in a phantom pain. This will upset Vernal, who asks if that means Yang and Weiss too, and Raven answers that of course it does. They're not free from the consequences of their own choices. If they've allied with Ozpin after everything she's said, they're lost causes. Vernal is horrified, but cowed into silence by Cinder's pure, cold resolve. There is ultimately more to these plans from both perspectives, but of course the audience aren't supposed to know that yet, so please just stick with me on this. Agreed on their plan, Watts hands the scroll to Raven, saying they'll use that to contact her and organize the theft, which should be an easy walk-in, walk-out procedure. The scroll is special though, so he warns her not to break it. With arrangements made properly, Cinder and Raven meet halfway, and then Raven removes her mask so they can shake face to face. They shake three times, and on the third and final shake, the screen cuts to black, ending the episode. Episode 16 begins by fading in on the sign for Onsen Onsen Onsen, which is, you guessed it, a bowling alley. Sheesh, tough crowd. Anyway, outside the entrance, there's a sign that says, no mixed bathing. We cut inside one of the shower rooms where we get quick cuts of Ruby pouring water over her head, Weiss scrubbing her arm, Yang rubbing in shampoo, before cutting to Ruby unceremoniously dropping into the water of one of the baths, next to a device using fire dust to heat the pool. Weiss shites her for being so unrefined, slipping in carefully herself just before Yang drops in beside her like Ruby did, sans arm of course. 
Weiss grips her nose and says that she thought it was bad enough that she couldn't get the tribe stink out. Now she has to deal with the barbaric behavior as well. Yang points out that Weiss wanted to join them, and Weiss flushes, saying that it may have been a consideration at one point, but it was never serious. Yang chuckles at Weiss's expense, and Ruby excitedly leans against the edge of the onsen, which is an infinity pool overlooking the city below, chittering about how awesome the view is. Yang tells Ruby to be careful not to fall over the edge, and Weiss is dismissive, saying that with Ruby's luck a gust of wind would knock her right back into the onsen. Ruby pouts at them and says haughtily that she's confident that Weiss would catch them with her glyphs. To which Yang retorts, Aw, look at Ruby, still depending on her little friend. Both girls shout hey in indignance, and Ruby counters that it's not just friendship. Weiss is obligated to. She's the best teammate ever. Her words, not mine. Weiss rolls her eyes and smiles softly, saying, Well, she's got me there. Just as Yang splashes both of them with water. Ruby sputters that splashing is against the rules, Yang laughs and asks when Ruby respected the rules anywhere, and Weiss just laughs and sinks into the water, mumbling how nice this feels. She hasn't been this relaxed in months. Yang agrees, settling in, but Weiss notes that her shoulders are still pretty stiff. Yang acknowledges this and says that she's still stressing over who the Maiden might have been back at the Branwen camp. They were just there, and if only they had an idea about the maidens, she and Weiss could have. Yang is cut off when Weiss presses a finger to her lips, telling her to shush, that now is not the time for fretting. This is a treat. It's time to relax. For all of them. Ruby agrees, saying they've all been through a lot, it seems. It's nice just decompress for once. No grim, no bandits, no plane crashes. Idly, she hopes the guys are having a good time, too. We cut over to the matching men's only onsen, where Crow, Ren, Roman, and John are awkwardly sitting in silence. Crow is hitting the floating sake tray, and John is almost uncomfortably close to Roman. After a few lingering seconds, Roman blinks, turns to Ren, and asks, very earnestly, Wait, you're a guy? We cut back to the girls, with Yang waving off that they're probably all having a good time. Ruby agrees, though she's kinda sad Blake isn't here to enjoy it too. Yang's joyful demeanor evaporates, and Yang says, yeah, well, she isn't. No use dwelling on it. Ruby frowns and draws out Yang's name, mixed with exasperation, weariness, and disappointment. Simultaneously, Weiss's brow shoots into her hairline, asking what that means. Yang points out that Blake would have been there if she stuck around, but they'll be fine without her. Ruby asks if Yang wants her here, and Yang bitterly asks back why she would want that. Ruby prods deeper, asking if Yang is still mad at Blake for leaving, and Yang's response is dripping with bitter sarcasm. When Weiss tells her to calm down, Yang shouts for them not to tell her to calm down, her hair flickering with flame, her eyes glowing red, and the water around them beginning to boil. Ruby and Weiss are verbally unnerved by the sight, and Yang does actually calm down to a more suitable level, though she's obviously disinterested in the more joyous mood they had going earlier. She's actually about to leave the onsen when Nora's voice carries in from the shower room, screaming, CANNONBALL! There's a massive splash as Nora enters the water, soaking the other three girls. Nora surfaces in a crocodile float, laughing all the way while Weiss chides her for how dangerous that was. She could have broken her back, or worse, the floor. Nora spits some hot spring water into Weiss's face, prompting even more ranting, and Ruby laughs along with Nora. When Weiss's little rant ends, Nora responds, Oh please, just relax. This place was built to withstand at least five girls. Speaking of which, has anyone seen Neo? We jump back over to the boys' side where Ren is emphatically questioning Roman. I have a naturally deep voice, and Roman says, Some girls just hit a lower register. Ren replies, I have a girlfriend, and Roman shoots back, I don't judge. Finally, Ren says, I have no breasts, to which Roman replies, And neither does little Miss Snowcone. Doesn't make her less of a woman. He pauses and puts a hand on his chin. Is she a woman? Ren replies, Yes, she is a woman, and I am a guy. Roman rolls his eyes and says, Look, I hear you, but look at yourself. You're beautiful. Like, you're not my type, but you're a head turner. But like, as a lady. Ren just stares at Roman, baffled. I have no idea how to take this entire conversation. Roman is now lost to himself, muttering, Damn, I'm usually pretty good at telling this kind of thing. Before turning to John beside him and saying, Isn't that right, Neo? John, who by this point has sunken up to his face in the water, blinks to awareness, looks to Roman, and gives a sheepish smile. When he blinks, his eyes turn to Neo's colors, and he reaches over to cling to Roman's side. Roman sighs and asks her not to do the puppy eye stare with another person's face, just when John walks into the room. He takes one look at Neo, who still appears like him, and he says, I am so confused right now. With that, we cut over to the onsen's resting area, where a still armless Yang is buying soda from a vending machine. 
She sits at the table with her back to the shower rooms. Someone walks up beside her and Yang thinks at first it's Ruby, immediately going to dismiss her because she doesn't need cheering up. She's surprised when Weiss says, Good, because I'm told I'm not very good at that. Weiss sits down across from Yang, with a warm, compassionate smile, and Yang plays with her drink at her fingertips. Yang asks what Weiss wants, and Weiss raises a single brow towards Yang. Yang, picking up the signal, shakes her head, saying she doesn't want to talk about it, taking a sip of her drink. Weiss shoots back a shrug, and Yang slams down her drink, saying, I mean, why would I want to talk about Blake? She doesn't deserve it. Oh look, I got stabbed. Wish I had my partner around to save me. Oh wait, I did. Maybe I should stay around for five minutes to see if she survived having her arm cut off. Maybe I should have stuck around to see if my team leader came out of a coma, or rescue my friend from being dragged off by her father. You know, the person she's been fighting for most of her life, the person who's the boogeyman her arm cutting off ex-boyfriend is obsessed with taking down, might be a good idea to wait around for ten goddamn minutes! And Yang punctuates her last sentence by slamming her fist on the table, shaking it, cracking it, then downing her drink. Weiss blinks and leans back before saying, For someone who doesn't want to talk about... Yang cuts her off, her face falling to the table, her hand coming up to cover it in frustration, saying, I know, I know, I just... I don't know how to handle this, Weiss. Yang raises her head part way, her forearm still hunched as she speaks. I'm always the one getting left behind. Raven left me, then Mom left us, then Dad. He was always so busy with school and Ruby couldn't even talk yet. I had to pick up the pieces. I had to keep things together. Alone. And with Blake, when I got a partner, I thought for a minute that maybe I'd have someone that helped me keep things together. Only to learn that she was a fixer-upper too. But that was okay. I, I was used to doing that. But then, at the Vital Festival, at the fall, all that work was meaningless. I was trying to be the best friend I could be, and she threw it in my face. Weiss watches Yang carefully, taking a deep breath before speaking herself. When I was 10, my dad finally admitted to my mom that the only reason he'd married her was for the family name. It was actually on my birthday. He missed the big dinner, she got mad, he finally snapped. I think she already knew. Looking back, I think I knew too. But hearing him say it finally pushed her over the edge. Weiss gets up and sits next to Yang at the table. First it was separate lunches and dinners, opposite balconies at my recitals, a glass of wine here, a glass of wine there. Then it was no dinners, no recitals, a bottle of wine here, and, well, you get the idea. Yang murmurs sympathy to Weiss that she never knew. Weiss waves it off before speaking again. I don't think I trusted people after that, until Beacon that is. You guys, Blake included. It was rough, but I learned. But it was hard, and it still is. Even after all that, knowing you guys have my back, those months in Atlas with my family were the longest of my life. And I had every doubt about you, and Ruby, and Blake. I didn't think I'd see you guys again. And that was the optimistic part of my brain. Eventually though, I had enough. I didn't want to be there anymore, didn't want all the lies and duplicity. I wanted a family again, and I think that's what we all are to each other. Maybe in a way that our real families can't compare to. Well, maybe mine at the very least. Yang replies that Weiss didn't run away, she was taken, and with no say of her own, and Weiss replies that of course she had a say. Does Yang really think a 57-year-old businessman could stop Weiss if she really wanted to stay? Weiss got scared, and she fell back on instinct, the one thing she was most familiar with, not trusting anyone and doing as she was told. And it was a moment of weakness that took, what, six to eight months to break free from? To undo? She explains that they're not done growing, none of them are. As much as they wanted to play adults back in Mountain Glen, they're all a little bit more like Ruby than any of them want to admit. Heck, by the sounds of things, she's been the most adult of all of them. Yang gives a bitter chuckle, saying that Ruby still has the same stuffed corgi pillow that she sleeps with every single night, and Weiss asks where that pillow is now. Yang slowly replies that it's back at the Zhao Long household, where Ruby left it months ago. Yang's bitterness seems to sober, and Weiss wraps an arm around her. Yang gives an uneasy laugh at Weiss giving her a hug, but Weiss is quick to stop her from ruining the moment. Yang sighs and pulls her deeper into the hug, sobbing out that she's tired of people running away. Weiss leans their heads together and says that Blake will be back. She'll come back home. Just give her time and be there for her, just like Weiss is there for Yang now. Yang asks when Weiss got good at this, and Weiss smiles, saying that she doesn't know. She took a page out of Yang's playbook and is just winging it. Yang sniffles and says it's working, hugging her deeper and laughing. The two share a quiet, pleasant moment together before hearing a racket back towards the showers. Nora's panicked voice screams for reinforcements. Ruby brought a water gun and she's going crazy with it. From beyond, we hear Ruby shouting, Victory will be wet! Victory will be swift! 
it will be refreshing! There's another crash, and we hear all the boys scream as Ruby laughs. Weiss blinks before standing and reaching for Yang's hand, recommending they go to stop her before the damages get out of control. After all, it's not like she has access to her dad's pocketbook anymore. Yang smiles softly at her, takes her hand and stands, asking if it isn't more important to protect their family from unruly redheads. Weiss smirks, they turn towards the showers, pump their fists in the air, and yell, Banzai! before charging in. Outside, we get one last shot of the front of Onsen Onsen Onsen, the background periodically shaking as laughing and screaming is heard. The camera shifts through the doors, through a shower, through one of the untouched onsens, and focuses on the port in the distance. There, emerging from the misty sea, is a ship carrying the Menagerie Militia. On the bow is Blake, battle ready, eyes narrowed. Cut to black, and the episode ends. Episode 17 opens on the familiar White Fang symbol, one on the uniform of a guard out in the field surrounding the White Fang base. She yawns, and her partner complains that this is the fourth hour in a row that she's done that, and they squabble about her not getting enough sleep the night before. They also complain about the foggy and stormy weather, and how it makes things too hard to see. Just then, two dark shapes blur by them, completely unnoticed as one of the guards is ragged on for being unfazed by the rain due to their duck faunus nature. We begin to follow the two shapes as they weave and duck through the field, using the fog as cover to avoid any number of patrols arriving at the mansion. We see Gamble getting thrown and latch into one of the walls, allowing Blake and Son to climb up it and onto the roof of the building. The two, both heavily soaked, radio in that they've reached the main compound, and we hear Ilya give an affirmative on the other side of the line. We cut to a Mistrillian mobile operations center where Ilya is manning the radio, alongside Gira and Kali. Gira confirms to Blake that they've got four squads in position to move in once they've got a better picture of things inside. Ilya takes over the call and instructs Blake to move to a nearby skylight, and once she opens it, she'll have access to an air duct right below it. Back with Blake, she does as instructed, and slips through the skylight into the air duct. We follow her for a quarter of a minute as she crawls through, uncomfortably tight in the space before reaching a vent. She peers through, making sure the coast is clear, and she calls back to Sun behind her that they'll break in through this vent, only to start panicking when he doesn't respond. Her panic skyrockets, however, when she looks through one of the grates and sees Sun nonchalantly walking around completely exposed. She opens the vent, and Stage whispers to him, asking him what he's doing. He turns around and holds up a half-eaten donut, saying with a mouthful that there were donuts in the break room three vents back. As Blake balks at him and drops from the air duct, Sun continues that they really need to start providing catering before missions. Blake glowers at him, but he holds up a second donut and offers it to her. She glares at the donut, then at him, then shites him to try and keep a lower profile before taking the donut and wolfing it down, all while walking on her way forward. The two stalk through the house, encountering surprisingly light resistance the whole way through, Ilya's voice in their ears telling them which way to go in order to get to the basement. Before going to Menagerie, they had been excavating down there, looking for something or going somewhere, and she never found out why they were doing it. Blake and Son manage to slip by one last patrol and make their way down to the basement, where they find a number of troops transporting materials from the basement into a number of crudely carved tunnels in the basement's foundation. Hiding behind a pile of crates, the two are confused and radio in that there must be a second site they don't know about where they're transporting this material to. Just as Gira is asking for more information, Adam and Hazel emerge from one of the tunnels, mid-heated discussion. They're far enough away that only the louder portions of the argument carry over to where Blake and Son are, but it's clear that the two are arguing over the numbers of the White Fang, that Adam's forces are being pulled thin. Adam reassures Hazel that they'll be able to manage, yet Hazel questions if their dwindling numbers has anything to do with disappearing defectors. Adam pulls Hazel in close, and while we don't overhear what's said, it's clear that Adam is defending his position and partially threatening the unflummoxed Hazel. Pushing Hazel away by the collar, Adam breaks off and heads back upstairs while Hazel ducks into the caves, warily watching Adam go. Blake and Son describe what they saw to the base team, and they're told that a human working with the White Fang isn't unusual. There are a few crazies that sympathize with movements that want them dead. Sun blithely brings up the whack with the hat as an example, but Blake feels there's something more going on than just a simple sympathizer. Gira agrees and says that they need more information, telling them to tell that man and find out what it is at the end of those tunnels. Blake's eyes, however, are affixed to Adam as he reaches the top of the stairs, and though Sun gets her attention, it's clear where her mind is going. She says that maybe they can split and get more information faster. Sun will follow the man through the tunnels, and Blake will search the rest of the estate for documentation. Sun gives Blake an uneasy look, knowing full well what she's actually planning, and Gira openly disagrees with her course of action, ordering her to tell Hazel. She turns off her earpiece and puts in her pocket. Sun asks if she's sure, and she nods. He gives her an uneasy stare before pleading that she be careful. She nods solemnly and takes off after Adam. 
Now alone, Sun's ear is pelted with shouts from Gira, demanding that Sun prevent Blake from leaving, and Sun just tells Gira to trust his daughter. Besides, they've got the best man for the job talking to them right now, pointing to himself boastfully. He turns towards the tunnels and stealths his way to them, passing a dripping pipe, which we linger on. We follow a drop of water as it falls into a muddy puddle outside of Raven's tent back at the Bramwyn camp. We see Shiloh standing outside the flap of the yurt, talking to Raven and saying that the entire camp should be ready to move tonight at the earliest. Raven expresses her satisfaction with that, but clarifies they shouldn't need to move for another week. All the same, it's good to be prepared, especially with all the unseemly visitors they've been getting. Shiloh mentions that the tribes members are getting restless about that and want to move sooner rather than later. Raven nearly threatens him, telling him and the people he's probably a messenger for not to speak out of turn. As long as she draws breath, she leads the tribe, she'll hear no argument for her plan. Shiloh seems a little less cowed than usual, but still backs off and walks into the rain. Raven goes back into her tent, where Vernal is lazily unstringing her bow. Raven sits down to read a book, but it only takes Vernal a few seconds of glaring before asking if she'll really hear no arguments. Raven gives an exasperated sigh and puts down the book and says yes, the tribe is hers to lead, and that includes her daughter. Vernal growls that they don't have to kill Weiss, or Yang for that matter, they could just kill Uncle Crow and the people that won't listen to them. Raven pinches her nose and says this is all bigger than Weiss or Yang, that they can't take risks. Just because they were willing to listen doesn't mean they won't be swayed to follow that silver-tongued devil. Oz has a way of brainwashing people, people that had what she thought were good heads on their shoulders. But he snakes his way around that. Odds are, if Crow knows where Ozpin is, then Oz has already worked his magic on the pair, and they can't take chances on letting them live to indoctrinate more people. Vernal stands and asks where Raven's limit is. Weiss was practically part of the tribe. Yang is her daughter. What if it was one of the tribesmen? What if it was Milo, or Kenny, or Shiloh, or me? Raven stares her daughter in the eye and says that she doesn't kill what has value to her. Value? Vernal screams. That's your limit? That's where you draw the line. What happened to tribe is family? Sure, the weak weed themselves out, but we don't kill them. They get left behind. We are a family, not just some horse you ride until it collapses, or some bike until it runs out of fuel. We're people, Mom. You're people. Raven replies quickly, they're replaceable. You're not. Vernal sneers, her eyes tearing up as she bites out that she's only worth something to Raven because she chose to be the Spring Maiden when no one else would. Take on a whole mantle just to keep the people she cared about safe. And she's doing this most of all for Raven. Just because Vernal made a harder choice doesn't mean she's automatically worth more to the people that they're both protecting. With that, Vernal turns on her heels and stomps out into the thickening rain, splashing along the muddy ground. Raven watches her go and sighs, muttering that Vernal is worth more than just that. Raven looks to the book on the table, reaches for it, hesitates like she might follow Vernal, but then picks up the book anyway. The sound of rain becomes overpowering before morphing smoothly into the sound of a waterfall. We cut back to Sun as he emerges from the tunnels, following closely behind Hazel and sticking to the shadows. They arrived at a large underground tunnel, open on one side with a massive waterfall covering the entrance. Side note for a little bit of lore that can only really be picked up on through visual details. This tunnel used to be a highway expansion that the city of Mistral abandoned maybe about 10-20 years back, so it's wide enough to provide a landing space for a small squadron of kit-bashed bullheads and the supplies being loaded onto them. The tunnel is a buzz with activity, with White Fang crawling absolutely everywhere, delivering crates from the smaller tunnels, mechanics working on the airships, and the crews fueling them. Sun hides behind a concrete outcropping and radios in what he's found, mildly panicked over the scale of the operation and the firepower he can see. Everyone in the command module are surprised to hear that the White Fang have an air force, and Gira says that the situation is quickly getting out of hand. They don't have enough people on the ground to handle this, and they're only going to get one chance. Sun is to pull back, find Blake, and get them both out of there before any alarms can be raised. Sun grimaces, looking back towards the way he came in, then looks down in front of him where there's a clearly labeled box of satchel charges. The audience can see the wheels in his mind visibly turning, as he slowly says that he doesn't think he'll get a second shot at this if they have to come back. There's no guarantee they'll still be here. But he can do what he does best and raise a little hell on his way out. Kali and Gira attempt to object, but Sun just tells him to be ready to go on his signal. Ilya asks the obvious question of what that signal is, and we see Sun stuffing his pouches with satchels and a detonator, saying that they'll know what his signal is. And with that, he moves towards the closest bullhead, which is at the back end of the tunnel, furthest from the waterfall. 
As he goes stealthy again, we cut back to Blake, equally if not more stealthily tracking Adam through the base. He enters the main throne room, the doors of which are flanked by two guards with pole arms. Blake sneaks behind and knocks out both guards, grabbing their weapons and entering the room. When the door shuts, she shoves the poles through the door's handle, making a crude lock and preventing anyone from entering by accident. Adam hears the noise and turns, just as Blake calls his name. The two lock eyes, as best they can. I mean, he is wearing a mask. And Adam balks at Blake, letting her name tumble out of his mouth. He mutters out that this wasn't what he thought their next meeting would be like, and she retorts, What, did you expect me chained up in a box? Adam snarls at her that he didn't want to go to that extreme, that she forced his hand by running away in the first place. She shoots back that the first time they saw each other after she'd left, he stabbed her and, she hesitates before adding, cut off her best friend's arm. Adam's voice raises as his head snaps towards her, and he rages that he used to be her best friend. He runs his fingers through his hair and cools himself, though maintains a guarded posture, wilt and blush never far from his hands. He says, more calmly, that at Beacon, he was angry. He lost his cool because he didn't understand why she left in the first place. But by the time he'd realized what he'd done, how badly he'd ruined things between them, he wants to apologize for how he hurt her. Even if he knows it's not enough, that mere words will never be enough. Blake breathes and says that if he really wants forgiveness, he just has to stop all of this. She borderline begs Adam to stop. Adam, uh, blinks? Whatever facial expression that comes with blinking while wearing a mask, and recoils, saying, And this? This. This is my life's work, Blake. I've been working day and night for years to ensure the freedom of our people. While you are off playing hero at that damned school, consorting with our literal enemies, are... are you trying to hurt me? Rub salt in the wound? She's a schnee. The hunters at Beacon are responsible for all of our oppression, holding up a system that keeps us down. And you ran off to become one of them. And here I am, expressing remorse over hurting you and the person that's holding your leash, when in reality you should be begging me for forgiveness for abandoning our cause. Blake shoots back that she never abandoned their cause, she only abandoned his methods. What progress has the White Fang made that could compare to a Schnee counting Afanis as one of her closest friends? Adam immediately questions if that's how Weiss really sees Blake, and if Blake truly thinks that, then she's far more gone than he even imagined. After all, her little friend took off with her father almost the second the ashes cooled at Beacon. What kind of loyalty is that? Blake smirks bitterly, saying that she knows Weiss didn't abandon them by choice. Because of all the people in the world, the one person that hates Jacques Schnee more than either of them is Weiss Schnee herself. Adam grips Blush, seeing that Blake truly has gone mad, before firing Wilt at Blake and beginning their fight. Now this fight between the two of them is relatively tame in terms of complex choreography, only getting as spicy as to have Blake swinging from the pillars in the room and accidentally lighting the room on fire. Otherwise, it's a relatively straightforward back and forth between the two, up until Blake throws Gamble, and using a cut we transition to a thrown satchel charge landing on a bullhead's wing. Now with Sun, we get a small montage of him sneaking around the makeshift hangar, tossing explosives on every single airship he can, and he gets a significant way up the tunnel before his throwing hand is caught and stopped by an angry looking Hazel. This engages the second fight of the episode, which is much more acrobatic in nature. Hazel, in his first combat scene, gets to demonstrate how immovable he is as a fighter, which gives the more agile but physically weaker Sun a run for his money. Every fancy flip and kick Sun does is matched by a simple, brutal show of force from Hazel who is more apt to grab Sun and slam him into the ground. Sun has to use all of his cunning, his semblance, and his gunchucks to keep ahead of Hazel and ensure he doesn't get the detonator. Eventually, the fight works its way towards the waterfall, where, in a last-ditch effort, Sun throws the rest of the charges at Hazel's feet. Hazel manages to grab Sun by his shirt and hold him in place, demanding he drop the detonator. Flippantly, Sun does, but when a flummoxed Hazel goes to pick it up with one arm, Sun has summoned two of his clones to hold him in place. This allows Sun to kick free from Hazel's singular hand, grab the detonator with his tail, and leap over Hazel's head. He ducks out of the waterfall, clicking the detonator as he does. There is a massive chain of explosions going down the length of the tunnel, and Hazel is launched through the air. And though he's not unharmed, he's certainly less harmed than most others would be, indicating an intense level of aura. 
Back with Adam and Blake, the two are locked in a stalemate, unwilling to bend to the other when the explosions rock the building. Blake immediately mumbles concern for Sun and Adam scowls, asking, What have you done? He uses Blake's moment of concern as an opening to clock her with blush and cut open the door to the room. He gives Blake one last glance as she clutches her cheek before rushing out towards the basement. Blake gives chase, but is waylaid by panicking White Fang members, all trying to get to the cramped corridors leading to the main tunnel. Blake pushes her way through just in time to see Adam and Hazel ordering troops on board one of the four fleeing bullheads. Upon seeing her, Adam fires, scattering the rest of his troops around her, but pinning her down as the bullhead door closes and begins to lift off. Blake scrambles along the service railing, firing Gamble into the wall to swing towards the bullhead and firing again to latch onto its side. She manages to cling to it as it takes off and they pass under the waterfall. What follows is a flyover of all of Mistral as Blake clings desperately to the fuselage of the airship. Her aura begins to flicker against the harsh winds and the physicality required to hold on. Eventually, her grip slips and she falls, clinging desperately to Gamble, still firmly affixed to the tail of the airship. She's forced to run along the rooftops, a la Spider-Man with all the acrobatics involved, just to keep up with the plane. When the bullhead begins to slow down and angle its descent, Blake sees an approaching wall and willingly lets go of Gamble's ribbon to prevent slamming face first into it. She tucks and rolls across the adjacent roof, but underestimates her speed and goes tumbling out of control over the lip of the roof. We watch from her perspective as she tips over the edge and descends rapidly into the alley below. There's a crunchy cut to black, and the episode ends. Episode 18 begins in Raven's tent, mid-argument between her and Cinder over the scroll that Raven was handed by Watts. Raven is insistent that they had a deal, and it's on Cinder to uphold her part of the bargain first. Cinder, however, is much more aggressive and bites back that there will be time after retrieving the relic where they can kill Crow and his tagalongs. But right now, they've got a time press they weren't prepared for, especially if Raven wants to be free from Salem's pursuit. And, Cinder adds, this is also ignoring how much time it'd take for Raven to get to Mistral. Even by car, it'd probably take too long, which means her only means of upholding her side of the agreement relies on her using her semblance to get to Mistral by portal, and for that, she needs Crow alive. Raven scowls and Cinder taunts that yes, old Leo told her what Raven's semblance was, and if Raven wants to be free, she has to get to Mistral ASAP. Raven is beside herself, silently fuming at the scroll before speaking through gritted teeth that they'll be there. Cinder smirks and sings songs that she just knew Raven would be accommodating. She sharply reminds Raven to bring the maiden with her before ending the call. Raven shuts the scroll and calls for Vernal, telling her to be ready in five minutes to go. Vernal is surprised, asking what happened, and Raven snaps, her frustration bubbling over, demanding that Vernal just listen to her. Raven stills herself and takes a breath, hissing that the timetable's been moved up. Vernal goes to ask a question and Raven anticipates it, answering that yes, yes, Yang and Weiss are still alive. Cinder's crew will be dealing with them after the theft at Haven, allegedly. Vernal is pensive, but says that she'll go to get her things. We cut to an alley just outside of the Ozpin house, where Raven's portal opens. Raven and Vernal jump out with their masks on and take in their surroundings, just in time to catch Weiss, Yang, Nora, Crow, Ruby, and Ren emerging. Vernal watches cautiously, focusing mostly on Yang and Weiss, who along with Nora bid farewell to Crow, Ruby, and Ren who are going out for the day's investigation. Raven shifts her focus away, dragging her down the other side of the alley and saying they have work to do. Vernal gets one last look at Weiss and Yang before they're off altogether. Vernal seems reluctant but follows dutifully, asking with a snarl when they ever hid in the shadows like thieves. We then cut over to Roman, Neo, and John inside of what remains of Charlotte's, the entire place absolutely empty of personnel, power, and furnishings. Roman gawks at the empty space and asks, Who came in and robbed the place while we were gone? And John asks if you can really rob a criminal. Roman puts a hand to his heart and says, My god, you're heartless. To which John shoots back, They're criminals! Roman acknowledges that this is true, but they're also people, and people don't just vanish for no reason. I mean, they took everything! They even took the poles! John blinks where Roman is gesturing and fumbles. Oh, wait, this is... You took Ruby here? Roman pointedly ignores John and approaches the now empty room where Little Miss had her private chamber. In the background, Neo is tense, drawing her blade before stopping next to a divot in the floor, next to a series of bullet holes in the wall. Picking up what she found, she taps her blade on the ground and holds up a white fang mask for Roman and John to see. John pales and says, Oh, crap. And Roman walks up behind him, face dark as he says, Call Ruby. 
We then hear a ringing bell, a doorbell in specific, and we hear muffled voices from outside as Ruby questions if Crow is sure this guy is home. Crow says he doesn't know for sure, but it's the best lead he's gotten on any huntsman yet. From inside, we see a figure shuffle quietly past the door, only to accidentally trip over something and create a ruckus, groaning as he does. Alarmed and thinking someone needs help, Ruby uses her speed to bust through the door, with Ren and Crow protesting the whole time. Inside, they find a huntsman that Crow identifies as Lucero Hawthorne. The man has fallen over a collection of boxes and has become buried underneath them, though it's clear he's not really harmed. On the other hand, his mental state is in question as he scrambles away from Crow, Ruby, and Ren in a panic. He yells for them not to hurt him, and they have to spend a bit of time calming the man down so he can explain why he was so scared. The Huntsman missions that they've been sent out on have been complete wastes of time, but gradually the missions became harder and harder until they were all basically suicide missions, pushing all the Huntsmen and Mistral to their absolute limit. And the last one he went on, it was a wild goose chase, until his unit was jumped. He didn't know who they were, but there were three of them, and one of them, the man begins to break down again, and it takes everything for Ruby to distract him and keep him calm. Ren gets a curious look on his face and asks if Lucero was on a mission to Kuchinashi about two, two and a half months ago. Lucero thinks about it and says that he's been on a couple, complete goose chases like all the early missions before things got so crazy. Crow hums and remarks that's a completely different story from what Leo told them. Ruby looks between Ren and Crow and begins to think herself, scratching her chin before pointing out that Lionheart only sent an airship when Crow was involved, and he seemed to pull it out of thin air despite how desperate he says the situation was. Crow narrows his eyes and looks to the door, saying he needs to have a few words with Leo about this. Things aren't adding up. Lucero, behind them, asks if he can leave yet. He wants to get his things and get out of Mistral as fast as possible, before she can find him. After some confused parting words, the three allow him to leave and step out of his front door. He gives a parting piece of advice. If they don't want to wind up like the others, they should leave as well, closing the door on their faces. Ruby looks to Crow and asks if their next stop is Haven Academy, but before he can respond, she gets a call on her scroll. She answers it and says, Yang? We cut over to the Osman house, where Yang is quietly watching Nora prancing around Weiss, gushing the whole time about an upcoming festival that's being held in the city. She waves a flyer in Weiss's face, pointing out the food, the games, and her voice raises an octave when she says, THE ADORABLE FASHION! She immediately launches into a campaign of getting Weiss to wear a traditional kimono, and Weiss's interest goes from completely absent to tentatively piqued at the mention of fashion. Yang smiles at the two's shenanigan, but out of the corner of her eye she catches Vernal poised on the railing outside of the sliding glass door of the house. Her mask is on, her finger to her lips, pleading for silence. Yang looks to her friends and says she's going to get some air, leaving the other two with little suspicion. They barely even notice she's left. Outside, Yang comes face to face with Vernal, who after a pause, takes off her mask to properly look Yang in the eye. Vernal is openly conflicted, her face a mixture of emotions, and her body language is incredibly closed off. Vernal says she doesn't have much time, so she'll cut to the chase. Something is happening tonight at Haven, and Yang and Weiss should be as far away from the city as possible. Yang presses Vernal and asks what exactly is happening at Haven. Vernal asks back what it even matters. When things are well and done up there, Yang, Weiss, all of their friends are next on the chopping block, and they need to leave. Yang says that things aren't that simple, but Vernal cuts in that they are. They stay, they die. Simple as that. Yang asks if that's a threat, and Vernal replies that it's a guarantee. Get Weiss away from the city. If Yang still feels like she needs to come back to protect Haven, or whatever she's been brainwashed into doing, she can do it once Weiss is safe. Yang pointedly asks why Vernal didn't go straight to Weiss, and Vernal replies that Weiss is too hard-headed. The minute she learns something is happening, she'll try to stop it. Yang has a moment of disbelief, saying, Weiss is too hard-headed, and you came... to me. Vernal groans and rubs her temples, saying, I... I don't know you. I'm taking a chance you'll do more to protect her than she will herself. You know her! Yang sighs and agrees, but brings up the conversation they had the day they met. This isn't a choice she can just take away from Weiss. I'm going to tell her. You should know that. Vernal presses her back to the corner of the railing, sliding down it with her hands around her face. I... No, I know, but I... don't know what to do. I don't want to see her get hurt. Please, just... Please, get her somewhere safe. Yang says that Vernal can help her get Weiss to safety. She can come inside, talk this out with Weiss, let them know what's happening. Vernal drops her hands, her eyes strained and her breath shuddering, admitting that she's already pushing how long she can be here. They'll notice soon enough. 
Yang asks who will notice and Vernal stands donning her mask and stilling herself. She replies, bad people Yang. And that's coming from mom. Yang blinks at the remark and Vernal jumps atop the railing, pausing to say, please Yang, get her away from here. And yourself too. If you don't, we might not be on the same side the next time we meet. Yang asks, so why warn me now? Vernal swallows and looks into the distance before saying, everybody gets one, and jumping to the road below. Yang watches her go, turning to look through the glass door at Weiss and Nora laughing gleefully at the table. Contemplating the situation for a moment, she pulls out her scroll and makes a call. We cut over to a different call, however, being held in Lionheart's office. Cinder is on screen and glaring furiously at Leo. Leo says very clearly that they can't come to the school right now. There are still decorators working on setting things up for this year's festival, and if anything were to go wrong, all of their covers would be blown. Cinder says they don't have a choice. The White Fang had half their operations discovered and captured by a surprise police raid. If they don't move now, the White Fang attack is going to happen sooner rather than later, and if it happens too early, any attempt to retrieve the relic quietly will be out the window. Leo grimaces and says they can come and get the relic once the festival workers have left, and he's made sure all the students are off campus, but no sooner. He'll send her the earliest time when he knows when that will be, but she should also advise the White Fang to stay their attack as well if they want the minimal amount of resistance. From this, he will not back down, and they've only got one shot to get this right. Cinder groans that this would have all been easier if the Branwins would have just cooperated without a caveat, and Leo says that he told her to be prepared for a difficult negotiation. Branwins rarely, if ever, back down. Well, Cinder says, Raven and the Maiden are on their way now, so whatever time Leo deigns to send them, he better be ready to open the damned vault. Leo responds he will be there, before ending the call and resting his face in his palms. We then hear Crow's voice overlapping the scene, that Lionheart's been lying to them as we transition over to the Ozpin House living room. The collected members of Rui Jr. Kern are seated around the coffee table, papers and charts scattered around it, including the White Fang mask that Neo found. Crow explains that he did some digging into the missions the missing huntsmen have been going on, and Lucero was right. Either they ended up being pointless, or they ended in complete squad wipes. Worst of all, when he tried to track down who ordered the missions, almost every time the road led back to Leo. It wasn't even all that hard to find, like he didn't expect anyone to check. Or, Ruby says, that there'd be no one left to check. Ren concurs and says that they can't rule out the possibility that several of the roadblocks to Mistral Team Ranger encountered weren't caused by Lionheart's interference, like the train shutting down. Nora asks why he'd be sending his own people out on suicide missions, and John chimes in that it'd leave the school completely unprotected. Some of the earliest casualties, as far as they can tell, were teachers at Haven. And with all the students gone on their own missions, it'd leave the grounds completely open for attack. And with that, he points to the White Fang Mask. At least, that's what they got so far. An attack, Roman adds, that has the underworld scurrying for safe harbor, which means some sort of massive upheaval on the horizon. But, Yang says, Vernal came to warn her that something was happening tonight at Haven, and that none of them would be safe afterwards. She theorizes that Raven made a deal with the White Fang, or, more likely, Salem's forces. Weiss says that it doesn't make sense though. Raven was all about survival of the fittest, she'd sooner die than bend the knee. Crow agrees, which means that Raven is plotting something if she and Vernal are here in the city. Roman briefly looks to the side and is seemingly annoyed before sighing, closing his eyes and relinquishing control to Ozpin. Ozpin says that regardless of what Raven intends, they know a few facts to work with. Leo can't be trusted, there's something happening tonight at Haven, and the White Fang seem to be threatening the stability of all of Mistral. With all of this taken into account, the most prudent course of action would be to strike out to Haven as soon as possible. John looks to Oz and nods, standing and proclaiming that he's not going to let another beacon happen. Nora and Ren nod in agreement with him. Eyes then fall to Ruby, who is lost in thought and a little surprised by the attention. She asks why everyone is looking at her and Crow says that she leads one third of the crew. It's her call. Looking at Crow with no small amount of appreciation, she refocuses herself, standing and drawing Crescent Rose, declaring that they're going to Haven. Unfurling it, she slams it into the table, pointing to the door and giving a battle cry for everyone to head out, just as the table breaks in half under the blade. Cut to black, end of episode. Episode 19 opens with Gira's fist slamming into the side of the Mistral Mobile Outpost, seething damn it as he does. Callie is behind him, beside Sun, sitting at a plastic table as she dabs him dry and asks him if he knows anything else. He says emphatically that Blake just took off without him. She's still got her radio, so why she hasn't checked in over the past 30 minutes, he doesn't know. Gira is furious that Sun allowed Blake to go after Adam alone, especially when he knew she was lying through her teeth to do it. Sun defends himself, asking what Gira would have had him do. 
He knows how hard-headed she can be, she was going to do it one way or the other, and any attempt to stop her would have blown both their covers immediately. Callie pinches his arm, saying that he may be right about that, but the fact that he launched no argument is what's really irking both of them. Inside the truck, cuffed to the table, is Ilya, who suggests that Sun is right that Blake wouldn't back down if she felt it was important. They might be her parents, but Sun and Ilya have known the her now, so to speak, longer than they have. Callie glares at Ilya, saying the Blake Ilya knew isn't the same Blake as the one she is now, and Ilya mumbles back weakly that she meant the Belladonna should listen to Sun. Out of all of them, he knows Blake the best. All eyes turn to Sun, who smiles, saying he's worried, but Blake has been in tougher spots. He's sure she's fine, and she'll contact them when she can. We cut to the alley where Blake fell, and her head pops out of the top of one of the few uncrushed or displaced soggy boxes there. She blinks to awareness, rubs her head, and mumbles that she thought cardboard boxes were supposed to be soft. She reaches down and pulls out a tin of tuna from inside the box, scowling at it. She uncurls from her position and steps out of the box, mumbling that the rain is gone and the sun is getting low. How long was she out? She pulls out the radio from her pocket and puts it in her ear, giving it a try but receiving no reply. Frowning, she pulls out her scroll to discover it cracked, which further amps her anxiety. She puts it away again and stalks around the area looking for any landmark to go on. We discover that she's landed in an alley tangentially attached to the street that Roman and Ruby had been searching back in Episode 7, down in the faunus quarter of the city slums. Getting a better look at her surroundings, Blake deduces she must have been out for hours of time and needs to get a better lay of the land. Blake spots the chop shop and the adjoining apartment complex, which is the tallest building around. We focus on the rooftop and Blake begins to finick with the earpiece, and as she heads towards the building we can deduce that she wants to get better reception. She gets close and reaches for Gamble, only to realize it's not sheathed in shroud. She curses silently to herself and finds the building's fire escape, using some quick parkour to clamber onto it. She rushes to the top of the building, and as she nears the top, her radio begins to spark with sound, like she's getting a connection. Back with Ilya, we see her Manny in the radio, playing a repeated message calling for Blake when Blake's attempts to break through get noticed. Immediately, Ilya tries to radio Blake properly, but when we cut back, we see that Blake isn't listening to her static radio. Instead, she's staring at the roof of the apartment complex, which, instead of being made of anything solid, is just a series of layered metal sheets. Between the cracks, Blake can see what looks like the tip of a small tower inside the apartment building, and she lowers herself to the metal to get a closer look. Peering through the cracks, she sees that the inside of the apartment complex has been completely hollowed out, and that the exterior is basically just a facade. At the center of the building is the tower, a miniature CCT tower, and below that, patrolling the grounds, are a number of busy white fang members. She carefully maneuvers to the other side of the rooftop and peers at the building connected to the complex, the chop shop, and in one of the open bay doors she catches a glimpse of a poorly hidden tail fin of one of the white fang bullheads. Scowling, Blake grabs hold of a damaged pipe and slides down into the enclosed yard below, where she ducks behind a rusting forklift as a patrol sweeps by. We get a small sequence of her sneaking into the base stealthily, her personal rage against Adam having seemingly cooled in favor of an alarmed curiosity. As she gets into the makeshift hangar and observes the troop movements within, she spots Gamble, still firmly affixed to the tail of one of the airships. She moves to reclaim it, only to pull back as two mechanics begin to chat nearby, and in fact start to close in on discovering Gamble. Panicked, Blake searches for a way to distract them, ending up with the can of tuna she took from the box between her fingers. She tosses it, and in that most cliched way, the noise is enough to distract the guards. Blake swoops in, pulls Gamble free, and she uses it to escape into the rafters before being seen. Breathing a sigh of relief, she creeps along the ceiling, closing in on where the chop shop meets the apartment complex, which seems to be the nexus of the operation. There, she finds Hazel, Adam, and Watts talking heatedly with each other, and she starts to get snippets of what's going on. Apparently, Watts is planning to leave, and Adam is raging that they need Watts' support on the ground. Watts tells Adam that wasn't part of the deal. He was just here to set things up and teach the Fang how to use these little toys. His mistress, however, has many other needs for him, and none of them are supporting the Fang at this moment. Besides, he was meant to be gone from the get-go. It's not his fault that Adam is pushing the operation up. Adam sees that it's not just pushing things up. They've had to completely rework everything. That included burning a lot of bridges in the Mistrillian underground that they were planning to lean on when the dust had settled, all just to keep this plan afloat. That means they need to have as many feet on the ground as possible, and that means they need Watts in the chair to make sure everything works correctly. Before the argument can continue, Hazel shuts it down and says that bickering is pointless. They have to act now or else Mistral will be on to them soon. 
From out of the camera, we hear Cinder's angry voice saying that the shift in timetable is untenable. They've had no time to fulfill the Bramwin's request. Watts shrugs and says that's Cinder's problem to deal with now, though he wonders when keeping their word with bandits became a priority. If anything, her convincing Raven to actually help them early means they could just kill her and not have to uphold their end of the bargain, free of charge. Granted, that would risk alienating their little maiden, unless you kill her first. Either way, it's still probably best that they eventually remove that drunkard and his runs from the picture. Watch scratches his chin in contemplation before shrugging the thoughts off entirely, saying that whatever happens, it's all on Cinder's head now. This is why he's in the technical fields and not public relations, as much as he would rise to the task. Cinder steps into Blake's line of vision and snaps at him that he'd be too busy laughing at his own snide remarks to get anything done. Watch smiles and says, Well, if the other people around me had an IQ in the double digits, they'd be laughing too. Blake recoils at Cinder's appearance, but even more so as Emerald and Mercury drift into her wake, with Mercury lazily remarking that he's getting bored with all this conversation. Emerald, in a rare vote, agrees, though suggests that maybe they call off the mission entirely, make a new plan if the White Fang are going to end up giving things away. Cinder shuts that down fast, saying she's already burned the last of her rope with the Branwins. Idle threats won't keep them pacified long. They're going to Haven, get the relic, and getting out just before the White Fang do their thing, and no one will be the wiser. Watts says, That sounds like a wonderful course of action, but if it's all the same, I am needed elsewhere. Watts attempts to leave, but is stopped by Adam, who orders him to stay. Watts laughs and says, You have everything you need. When the main tower goes down, you'll be the only ones able to say a single thing through the whole of Mistral. Just make sure it's something worth saying. At that, Watts yanks away from Adam and dusts off his jacket. Amused, he says, The irony, though. Atlas built the CCT as recompense for their part in the Great War, and here we are now, where they'll be used as a catalyst for the next. Pretty devilish if I say so myself, and relatively simple to use. Even a rodent could do it. So, if that really is all, I must bid you adieu." And with that exasperated last sentence, Watts strolls his way out the front door of the building. Cinder seethes after him, saying he's a stuck-up prick, but Hazel redirects her focus, asking her if she doesn't have a phone call to make. Bitter, Cinder glares at him, but ultimately turns away and pulls out her scroll. And then he turns to Adam and asks if he doesn't have something better to be doing as well. Adam glares at Hazel, but stomps off, shouting orders to the White Fang around him, saying that the CCT isn't going to take itself out. Hazel himself leaves, abandoning Emerald and Mercury to their own devices. They muse over the free time they have, though Emerald suggests they go out and track down Vernal. She doesn't trust the Branwins, and she needs to be back here in time for the theft. Merc says that she can do what she wants. He plans to go out and have what fun he can in under an hour. Emerald recoils, telling him he's disgusting before walking out. Mercury yells after her that's not what he meant, and she knows it, but is then left completely alone. Shaking his head, he stops for a second, curiosity and confusion on his face. He turns and looks right where Blake had been hiding, which is now completely empty. Shrugging to himself, Mercury walks out the door as well. We jump to Haven Academy where Leo is seeing a number of workers off who have been busy decorating the school for the upcoming festival. He's sure this year's festival will be an explosive occasion. At that, Raven, behind a pillar, surprises him by chuckling, saying he sure knows how to talk in doublespeak. No wonder Salem picked him up. His surprise quickly dies and he addresses her, saying that this conversation is best not done in a public forum, motioning to his office. Raven gives him a glib smile and follows as he goes inside. As she walks through the door, Raven admits she didn't think Lionheart would be the one to turn tail. Surely, Ironwood or Theodore would be the most likely ones to betray Ozpin. Leo asks bitterly how she could even think that. Ironwood's a fanatic, and they all know that Theodore doesn't exactly have much going on up in his noggin. Meanwhile, Ozpin puts Lionheart in charge of a city where half the people despise him and the other half prop him up like some sort of herald from the New Age. None of this reflecting upon who he is and all of which to do with what he is, emphasizing this by lamely threading his tail through his fingers. With all that pressure and none of the respect that comes with it, is it any surprise he'd be embittered about the whole ordeal, especially when his life would always be on the line with Salem dogging them and their allies? Why keep running at that point? If anything, he's more surprised that Raven would agree to work with Salem, considering how adamant she was that she cut deceptions out of her life. Raven responds that she'd rather have all of this gone and away from her as soon as possible, but it seems that her past caught up with her. Who knew a moment of benevolence upon the old maiden would end up threatening her entire lifestyle? No, by the end of this, she fully intends to be free from Salem and Oz once and for all, no strings attached. 
Leo asks how she assumes that'll work. Salem doesn't just give up power. She'll come back to Raven again and again, asking for more until Raven either refuses or is completely used up. In fact, he muses, it's very possible once she's done here, they'll have no use for her and get rid of her to prevent any future complications. Raven narrows her eyes and asks why he would even say something like that. He does still work for Salem, doesn't he? He responds with a cold laugh that he might work for Salem, but he's a coward through and through. Maybe it's just his nostalgia as a headmaster, but he respects Raven and wants her to know what she's signed on for. She may come to regret her actions as much as he has. Raven says she knows full well what she's signed on for and she's not going to regret what she has to do. Lionheart scoffs, saying that everyone thinks that and then the next thing you know you're getting the people you once called friends killed by the dozens. Good thing, Raven says, that she doesn't have any friends to speak of, just followers. As Leo hums, a call comes in on Raven's scroll, and the caller ID is Cinder. Scowling, she looks to Lionheart and says that it's about time to go. He nods and grabs his jacket from the back of the chair. Cutting back to Blake, we join her on the rooftop of the apartment, desperately pawning at her radio. We cut to Ilya, who's still rapidly listening to the airwaves when Blake finally breaks through. The two quickly get caught up on where Blake was, but she redirects the conversation, explaining what she knows of the White Fang plan and how there's more involved than what they thought, with outside forces pulling the strings. Ilya asks how long they have until the attack on the CCT. Back with Blake, she watches as each airship is taxied out of the garage and lifts off towards the Chochi, towards Haven. A little shaken, Blake says the attack is happening now. Without hesitation, Blake leaps off the roof and chases after the birds via Spider-Man rooftop swinging. Ilya recoils at that and pulls away from the table, only to have her cuffs hold her down. She pulls at them violently, trying to break them, but it's futile. Swallowing her pride, she calls out to anyone outside the mobile base, and Sun is the only person to hear. He pops his head in, and she very busily says that they need to warn everyone about the attack that's coming. Sun asks her to put Blake on, but the radio only returns static since Blake is on the move. Ilya curses and slams onto the desk, pleading with Sun to let her go and tell everyone. He says she should tell him and he'll tell everyone, and she says that every second counts. The attack is happening now. He needs to let her go. Sun hesitates, and she begs for him to trust her. Sun looks pensive before drawing his gunchucks and smashing the cuffs. Ilya thanks him and wastes no time rushing out of the vehicle with him in tow. They rush to where Gira and Callie are talking with Mistralian officials, and they're alarmed to see her free, though the fact that Sun is calmly following her diffuses the situation by a significant degree. She explains in detail with the leadership present Blake's situation. There's an attack on the CCT happening. It's happening now, and if they don't get people up there now, it's going to be a disaster for all of Mistral. They ask her how sure she is about any of this information, and she replies that she doesn't know for sure, but Blake told her and she trusts Blake. The conviction in her voice is strong, and it's enough to convince Gira to order their troops to mobilize. The militia around them begin to scramble, but Ilya adds that she needs to go now. Callie looks suspicious at her and denies the request, but Ilya remains resolute. If explosives are involved, she's dealt with her fair share of them and she knows how to disarm them. Callie is about to object again when Gira rests a hand on her shoulder and asks if Ilya knows what she's requesting. If anything goes wrong, he will hold her personally responsible. Ilya looks at him, and the claw sprouting from his fingers. She nods and confirms she understands what's at stake. Gira nods back and says that Sun can go with her. They can take the surveillance van. The two look back at the van, and Sun groans how they can't have something sexy like a motorcycle. Ilya asks if he even knows how to drive a motorcycle, and he replies that he doesn't even know how to drive, period. Ilya rolls her eyes and tells him to buckle in. With Callie and Gira, Callie is angry at Gira's decision, letting a criminal go free. He says that Callie did it for him back in the day, and she argues that protesting is different than attempted assassination. Gira agrees, but says that he expects to see her again. He thinks she understood that this was the only rope that he'd give her before he let it hang her completely, and she's too smart to let that happen. Callie looks at her husband, pensive, saying he's a good man, but she worries about him. He says that he's more worried about Blake right now. And as he says that, we cut to her, standing on a much closer rooftop, looking up at the Chochin, before leaping off and swinging deeper into the city, evening lights twinkling as the screen cuts to black, ending the episode. So just like every year prior, the last two episodes are one big episode. That's right, episodes 20, 21, and 22 are all one big- wait a minute, that's not right. 
The screen fades in on the setting sun of Mistral, silhouetting the twin mountain peaks and the enormous Chochin. We cut to inside Leo's office, where Raven's mask is resting on his desk. Beside it, Raven cuts open a portal and Vernal walks out smoothly with a stumbling emerald. Emerald gripes about how much of a menace Vernal was to keep track of, and Vernal retorts acerbically that she was giving Emerald a little exercise. Besides, no one asked her to be Vernal's handler. Raven eyes Vernal carefully as Emerald takes indignation to that statement, though all fight leaves her when Cinder walks through the door. Emerald runs up to her and Mercury asks what took Emerald so long, earning a disapproving glare. Cinder looks to Raven, then to Leo, the last occupant of the room, and says that it's about time they get started. No more delays. Leo, Raven, and Vernal are quiet as Leo nods and leads them out the door. As I walk through the corridor leading to the hall, Mercury starts to say that he's going to miss being able to walk around the city freely. Not a lot to do at Salem's place. Emerald agrees, shivering at the thought of returning and muttering that that place always feels so… dead, and Salem is… Cinder cuts her off, asking, Salem is what, exactly? And Emerald immediately curls in on herself, saying it was nothing, her eyes small and beady in fear. Cinder turns back to the front of their group, just as voices can be heard emanating from the hall. The group of villains slow, and all eyes fall to Lionheart as it becomes clear the voices are coming from Crow and his posse. Cinder and Raven nudge their group back into the hall while Cinder demands that Leo take care of the problem. He begins to sweat and says he doesn't know what to do, but Cinder insists that he's the headmaster of an entire student body. Give them detention or something. Swallowing nervously, Leo approaches the main landing? Balcony? Railing? Thing? What do you call that? Anyway, not important. He approaches, and upon seeing nine people instead of five, he becomes even more nervous. He tries to act casually, asking to what he owes Crow's visit, and why he brought such a colorful collection of people, adding a forceful laugh for flavor. Crow glares at him and says that they have some questions about, well, a whole lot if he's being honest. Leo expresses his willingness to answer, though he's clearly uncomfortable, and as the assembled heroes ask their questions, Leo becomes more unwound, more panicked, and more retaliatory as the accusations pile up. That is, until, back with the rest of the villains, Raven realizes that Leo's been compromised and makes an executive decision to attack. She cuts open a portal right behind Crow and sends Vernal through. Vernal pops out and flips over Crow's head, distracting him for only a second before Raven reaches out, grabs him by the collar, and drags him through into the hallway. Ruby yells Crow's name in horror, turning to face the new threat, while John only spares Vernal a glance before glaring up at Lionheart and rushing up the stairs. Halfway up, Emerald comes rushing out of the hallway, using her chains to snare his leg and throw him over the railing, jumping down beside him and resting her other blade at his neck. Weiss and Yang react next, getting a moment of surprise at seeing Vernal so willingly attack her own uncle. It should be noted that Weiss is more shocked than Yang, and Yang is more angry than appalled. However, their attention only remains on Vernal for a second before Yang catches Mercury jumping over the railing at her in the corner of her eye, tanking the blow at the last second and sliding back beside Weiss. Mercury asks if Yang missed him, and he compliments the new Chrome. Really suits her. Yang becomes tunnel-visioned on him, jumping forward and saying she'll break his stilts for real this time, his arms too for good measure. Coincidentally, stilts will be the nickname Yang uses for Mercury going forward. Behind them, Roman and Neo see what's starting to happen and both silently agree to rush towards the door at the back. Nor and Ren see this and immediately complain not to split up, rushing after the other pair. Roman and Neo almost make it to the door, just as Hazel enters through it, completely unfazed by the burgeoning battle and saying to Cinder across the room that the White Fang will arrive any minute. Roman stops in his tracks as we hear Osman's voice say, audibly, Oh crap. Roman mumbles to himself, Oh crap? What do you mean by that? And with no pause, Osman tells Roman to run. Roman looks to Neo and says her name, and in an instant, they're back on the same exact combat wavelength, as though they'd never missed a beat. Roman takes her hand, and the two vanish into an illusion, leaving Ren and Nora to stare at this hulking mass of a person who now has barred their nearest possible exit. Cinder struts her way out next to Leo and formally welcomes the assorted cast members below. She names each one mockingly. The Schnee, the Bimbo, the Wannabe's little friend, and the Child. This last name is said as she reaches the bottom of the stairs next to Emerald, glaring the whole time at Ruby and saying that they have a score to settle. Ruby carefully aims Crescent Rose and confirms that they do, but she's not the only one. Ruby fires, having been aiming at Emerald the entire time. The shot knocks Emerald off balance, giving John the opportunity to slash at Cinder. Unfortunately, he misses, but he does manage to roll back beside Ruby. Cinder glares indignantly at him, saying he's not worth the air he breathes. He screams, worth more than you, while charging at her, sword raised. 
Emerald jumps in front of Cinder and blocks him, while Ruby rushes up behind him and jumps over his shoulder to slash at Cinder. This engages the first main fight sequence of the finale, with John and Ruby tag-teaming against Cinder and Emerald. As their fight engages, we see Weiss hesitating between helping them and helping Yang with Mercury, which that fight has started in earnest. Before she can decide, Vernal walks up the middle, drawing her Tonto and getting Weiss's attention by calling her name. Weiss doesn't yet lift her blade, unsure of how to deal with Vernal's genuinely aggressive posture. Vernal asks Weiss, angry, if she didn't get her warning, if Yang didn't tell her. And Weiss replies that she did get the warning, but before she can elaborate, Vernal talks over her. She gave Weiss an out, an opportunity to escape, to be free, just like she told Vernal she always wanted to be. But no, now she sees what her mother was talking about, how that old man has such a grip over people that he convinces them to go against their better judgment. Weiss glares and says that she weighed her options, she made her choice, and she's sticking to it. And if Vernal has an issue with that, well... Weiss takes up a defensive stance, and the two begin to circle. The two stop after a few seconds, level eyes, and Weiss says, I'm sorry, and Vernal says back, I'm not, before both launch forward and lock blades. Meanwhile, Ren keeps his eyes locked on Hazel while Nora fluctuates between the larger man and the combats happening near the other side of the room. Hazel seems to only just now really look at the two and asks if they're willing to die for someone else's lost cause. Both teens glare at him, Nora saying that it's only lost if no one fights for it. Hazel sighs and laments that no one ever chooses peace, walking towards the two calmly. Ren opens fire on him and Nora winds up her hammer, but he simply walks through the bullets, tanking them with his aura alone, and when Magna Hill comes down, he catches the shaft with one hand. Nora doesn't even have time to react before he uses it as a lever to fling her through the hall's right set of double doors, into one of the school's many hallways. Ren screams Nora's name and charges at him, only to have his head grabbed by Hazel's massive hand and flung through the same door as Nora. Without a word, Hazel stalks in after them. The camera detaches from him as he goes through the doors, flying over the rest of the combatants and into the hall leading to Leo's office. There we find Raven and Crow locked in an absolutely desperate struggle, as neither can quite get the upper hand on the other. The fight eventually breaks into Lionheart's office, tearing it up and leaving the windows shattered. Using a well-timed and placed portal, Raven kicks Crow through into one that she's ripped open in the sky, the farthest distance she can manage from a loved one. Crow plummets towards the school, but shifts into a bird halfway down, only to be attacked mid-air by Raven in her own bird form. The two land on the roof of the school, and we get the more verbal edge of the confrontation as Crow lambasts Raven for throwing in her lot with Salem. Raven says she had no choice, the survival of her tribe takes... Crow cuts her off, calling her out on her bullshit, that it's never been about the tribe. It's always, always about her and what she wants. And while she acts all high and mighty, the minute she's faced with someone stronger than her, she cowers, she runs. Raven, standing at the edge of the roof by this point, feels the tile slipping under her feet and glares at Crow, asking if he thinks that if he can keep talking, his pathetic semblance will take care of her for him. Crow snarls that her pride will do that to her anyway, lifting his blade for a strike. Unfortunately for him, this is when the White Fang arrive, a bull head with its brights on passing overhead, distracting him just enough for Raven to lunge forward. Crow steps to the side and ends up on the edge of the roof himself, and her next attack is about to land only for the towels beneath his feet to slip and send him tumbling off the building. Raven screams and jumps down after him. The camera focus changes from her to the White Fang airship landing in the distance, where Adam is stepping off. He directs his men to start laying charges on the tower and calls for the remainder to secure the perimeter. And once they're done with that, feel free to take whatever isn't bolted to the ground and destroy whatever is. With that, his men spread out, with a few jumping the gun and throwing molotovs at the nearby dormitories. Adam watches the flames spread, and in the background is Haven's school building proper, where we fade in on the right wing of the complex. There, through the window, we can see Hazel, Nora, and Ren all locked in deep combat. Nora and Ren are mostly on the defensive, as their attacks just bounce off of him, and no terrain can seemingly slow him down. In fact, at one point Nora puts an entire class of desks between herself and Hazel, and Hazel just charges right through them, flinging them out of the way with wide sweeps of his hands as he goes. Eventually, he corners Nora and moves to gut punch her, only for Ren to jump in the way, and both of them are sent spiraling through multiple walls and classrooms. Nora slams into the far wall, too exhausted to continue fighting, and Ren himself is absolutely out cold, both of them covered in a layer of debris. Hazel huffs in their direction, turning around to walk back into the hall, muttering, No one ever chooses peace. The camera zooms over his shoulder and back into the main hall where we find Weiss, battling it out with Vernal, both visibly winded at this point while trying to keep up with one another. Unlike the first duel between them, there's no hesitation between either of them to try and kill the other. 
Vernal in particular is far more feral in her movements, keeping Weiss on her toes and preventing her from casting spells through her glyphs, let alone summon. She attempts to ignite Vernal's powdered dust like before, but Vernal spins away. However, knowing that she would probably predict that, Weiss outmaneuvers Vernal and actually uses the fire dust on her blade to lock with Vernal's, causing the fire dust blade itself to explode. Vernal slams into a trophy case, and this gives Weiss enough time to summon Glyph, which springs Vernal into the air and onto the underside of the balcony above. Vernal manages to right herself halfway up, almost cat-like in how she does, and actually stands on the ceiling for a brief second, locked in place. She conjures a new blade and flings it at Weiss, forcing her to block the blow and release the hold, and as Vernal falls, we focus in on one of the support pillars, behind which we find Roman and Neo, hidden in an illusion. The two are watching and eyeing the door, but Roman remarks that running now wouldn't be classy. Neo looks at him, baffled, but he just replies that if they don't end up helping, there's not going to be much of a city left to return to. The statement is punctuated with loud gunfire and whirling engines outside, making him remark that it sounds like a war zone. We hear Oz try and get Roman's attention, and Roman is curt with the old man, telling him he doesn't have time for platitudes. Instead, Osman says that if Roman wants to help end this fight quicker, he may have a suggestion, if he's willing to enlist the help of his little friend. Roman looks to Neo and seems to listen to an unheard Oz. He then says she needs to trust him and do everything the old man tells her to. Neo looks at him with some level of revulsion and terror, but before she can make any protest, the two have already made the swap. Oz opens his eyes and crouches down to be at eye level with her, instructing her to do as he says. We see John get flung into the pillar next to them, and with that we smoothly transition over to the fight between Ruby, John, Cinder, and Emerald. John drops from the pillar, staggered for only a split second, and then charges right back into the fray. Cinder deftly uses a glass blade to deflect him and sends him tumbling to her side, just as Ruby, dodging an attack from Emerald, rushes up and tries to slash at Cinder. Cinder ducks just in time, but Ruby uses her momentum to hook the pillar that John hit and swing around beside him. Ruby quickly mumbles the phrase, Rose Knight, and John mumbles it back with assurance. And the two launch forward at Cinder, with John striking first, Ruby spinning around his back to slash at Cinder, John doing the same, and the two effectively whirling around each other in a tango to constantly increase their pressure on Cinder. Cinder, on the defensive, becomes furious and unleashes a wave of wind that knocks both of them back. Ruby immediately uses her semblance to launch back forward, slashing at Cinder and catching her off guard. This is where Cinder's face mask is cut free, but it's also where Emerald does her best to peel Ruby off Cinder. John jumps in the way and blocks the blow, and this is how the fight continues on for another minute, with Ruby attacking Cinder, Emerald defending Cinder, and John defending Ruby. Ruby poses an actual threat to Cinder through her speed alone, and this is where we get to see Ruby using microbursts of speed to dodge attacks that would have otherwise landed. Eventually, Cinder strikes the ground, turning it to a solid sheet of ice, causing Ruby, John, and even Emerald to lose their balance and giving her an upper hand to push back. We follow the ice as it creeps along the wood, stopping only once it runs against the fire radiating off Yang's aura as she goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mercury. This is a much more straightforward fight. Think MMA meets parental issues. Also, there's fire. Yang and Mercury are evenly matched, though Mercury has a much better command of the terrain and skillfully begins to press Yang up the stairs. Yang is so busy focusing on him that she's completely blindsided by a blast from behind, sending her tumbling down into Mercury's waiting kick. She manages to slide underneath it, but the camera doesn't linger, transitioning to her second assailant. We find Lionheart with his freshly redesigned weapon Stalwart, a collapsible shield that can cast multiple types of dust through crystal eyes on the lion, and creates areas of effect by utilizing the projectile spines that connect his dust attacks like tethers. Leo watches the two launch into another volley of attacks, only to send someone behind him. He turns, raising his shield, and is horrified to see Ozpin, completely alive, glaring him down. Leo steps back, muttering that Ozpin is supposed to be dead, and begins to stammer almost incoherently. Ozpin begins to talk to Leo calmly. Leo, I believe you and I should have some words. He allows Leo to back himself against the banister before continuing. I have searched high and low for those I thought were trustworthy, loyal, dedicated to stopping the evils of this world. Tell me, why exactly was I mistaken? Cornered, Leo defends himself, saying that Oz abandoned him, dropped him into a city that hated him, that expected perfection at every turn. Day in and day out he met that expectation, but it wears on the soul, and Ozpin never offered him anything to alleviate that decay. His defection only weighs as lightly on his shoulders as it does because the grand tonnage of it is tied around Ozpin's neck. Oz sighs and looks to the fighting happening below with a frown, waiting only a moment before offering an apology to Leo. He had not known this was leaving such a drain on Leo's morale. Had he known, he may have shifted his approach, but Leo knew what he was getting into when he agreed and has failed to live up to his own promise. 
Leo snarls that the promise means nothing when lies and deception are the heart of Ozpin's enterprise. He knows what Ozpin is, heard it right from the demon's lips. And to this day, he regrets telling the Maiden to run, because if he had known what he knew now, he'd be able to help her rid this planet of Ozpin's filth. Then again, he says bitterly, if Ozpin were to suddenly cease existing, it'd mean an end for Lionheart's usefulness to her as well. Ozpin sighs out Leo's name, but in the middle of it, his image flickers, revealing underneath the possessed Roman and just behind him the concentrating Neo. Leo narrows his eyes and calls out Ozpin's deception, and the illusion finally collapses, shattering into glass and leaving the criminal duo exposed. Leo shouts that it's lies, it's always lies with Ozpin, and he raises his weapon. Never the truth, always every single little petty advantage he can scrabble onto. We see Roman blink and suddenly hear Roman's voice instead, muttering that it was worth a shot before lunging out and striking at Leo with Osman's cane. Leo parries and we launch to a 2v1 fight with Roman and Neo engaging the Headmaster. Lionheart is able to keep pace, but only so much between the relaxed ease of Roman and Neo's symbiotic fighting style. At some point during the battle, Osman remarks to Roman that he has training that far surpasses Roman's, and as such would be the better fighter in this circumstance. Roman, mid-fight and obstinate, refuses. As the battle rages, the camera leaves them and drifts down the stairs, past Yang and Mercury, to where Weiss has gotten an advantage on Vernal, but both look the worse for wear. This is when Hazel finally steps in to blindside Weiss, catching her square in the jaw with a meaty punch. Her aura flickers, and it's clear she's not holding up very well as she slams into the wall. She does recover, however, and ricochets one of Vernal's flung blades into Hazel, who shrugs it off easily. Weiss is shocked, but still dives back into the battle. We zoom over to Cinder, Emerald, Ruby, and John, where they're holding up surprisingly well against each other. Cinder's frustration is almost palpable, but out of the corner of her eye, she catches Weiss shattering Vernal's aura, leaving her too winded to fight. Weiss breaks back and summons a wall of ice that pushes Hazel away and gives her breathing room to start attempting a summon. During this, Cinder yells to Vernal that she's a maiden, she should start acting like one. However, while Cinder is distracted, Ruby manages to disarm Emerald with a few well-placed combos alongside John, leaving her back to a wall with John's sword tipped to her throat. Ruby turns to Cinder and levels her rifle, telling Cinder that it's over. Cinder apathetically retorts that unlike Ruby and her friends, she doesn't have unnecessary attachments. And like that, Cinder summons a spear of glass, turns on her heel, and does a snapshot spear toss. Weiss, in the middle of summoning, is impaled. Are shattered, the spear wedged to the wall of ice and melting it with the burning hot tip. Ruby and John watch in horror as Weiss slumps against the disintegrating wall, and even Yang is distracted enough so that Mercury can land a solid crescent kick down atop her head. Emerald, still at John's sword tip, looks at Cinder, her face scrunched in disbelief, muttering Cinder's name like it's not possible she just abandoned Emerald to the heroes. John drops his guard and rushes to Weiss's side, just as Hazel approaches. Ruby runs forward and slams into Hazel's side at such a speed that he slides back several meters. Ruby bounces off of him and drops to Weiss's side, asking John how she is. John is understandably panicked, cradling Weiss's limp form and practically non-responsive to Ruby's questions. In the background, we find Leo still locked in battle with Roman and Neo, only for one of Raven's portals to open beside the ex-crime lord. Crow is flung unceremoniously through the portal and slammed into Roman's side, sending them both careening over the banister. They land in front of Cinder and the still-shocked Emerald, and both have a moment of surprise at seeing Roman. Cinder asks, Didn't you die? And Roman retorts, exhausted, It's a matter of opinion. From above, Neo drops down in an attempt to stab Cinder, only for Cinder to snatch her out of the air and fling her into Roman's side. Cinder scoffs at their little reunion and waves her hand, a blast of air sending the trio bouncing towards the center of the room. Raven jumps out of the portal beside Leo, and Cinder calls up that it's time to open the vault. Mercury is about to stomp Yang's head in, but Cinder orders him to secure the maiden first. He can have his fun later. Merc rolls his eyes, but complies, assisting the injured Vernal to her mother's side. Leo scrambles down the stairs and places his timepiece in the statue, turning it into an elevator down to the vault. Cinder, Raven, and Vernal get on the platform, and Cinder tells the crew to defend the entrance at all costs. Emerald meekly says Cinder's name, still not quite over the shock of abandonment, but Cinder does nothing in response as the lift descends. Mercury turns back from the lift and goes to finish off Yang, who is stumbling to her feet. Neo, unraveling herself from Roman, sees this and kicks free to warn Yang. Merc goes to kick Yang, only for her to shatter into shards of glass. Behind where she was standing is Neo, holding Yang to her side defensively. Yang thanks Neo for the assist, but pats her on the shoulder, saying that she can handle this. Neo, in a rare turn, looks down on the doubled-over Yang, doubt in her eyes, until she sees a glimmer of a smile on Yang's face and a flicker of flame in her hair. 
Meanwhile, Leo, looking over the battlefield, glances over to Hazel fighting Ruby, and yells for him not to bother with the children. Ozpin is here, and with a flick he points to the recovering Roman. Hazel pulls back, and grateful for the reprieve, so does Ruby. The tank of a man glares at Roman and begins to scream Ozpin's name, tearing the shoulders off his shirt in a growing rage. Reaching into his pouches, he draws several different dust crystals and wedges them into his biceps, infusing himself with pure dust energy. Roman looks at the man, horrified, and asks what Ozpin did to piss him off. Ozpin replies slowly that this is Hazel Reinhardt, brother of Magnus Reinhardt. As Hazel charges forward, Roman screams, AND WHO THE HELL IS THAT?! He tries to scramble away, but Hazel's rush forward is successful and Roman is pinned to a pillar just as Ospin answers. He was my host prior to you. Roman blinks, giving a revelatory and deadpan, oh, just as Hazel's fist slams into his stomach. Neo watches this, horrified. Yang keeps her focus on Mercury who is starting to circle again, but she shoves Neo away, telling her to go protect what she loves. Or like, whatever Roman is, she doesn't know. Neo gives a grateful nod and Yang just shouts for her to go as Mercury jumps forward again for round two. We jump to Ruby watching Neo engage Hazel before dropping to Weiss's side and asking how she's doing. John is beside himself, flailing with his words, rambling, and Ruby tries to calm him down. He grabs Ruby's shoulders, with tears on his face and blood on his palms, and says, Not Pira. Not again. Trembling the whole time. And for a moment, the aura around his hands flash white. Ruby is visibly relieved as her aura strengthens, glowing red where he's touched her. Ruby pulls away and grabs his wrists, looking at them in shock, and then down to Weiss. He looks just as startled, and Ruby has to think a moment before she presses his hands down on Weiss's wound, telling John that whatever he just did, don't stop. John is confused, stammering, but Ruby is firm in her direction and John begins to focus. Under his breath, absently, he begins to mutter, For it is in passing that we achieve immortality. Ruby stands, glaring at the elevators as Crow stands beside her, brushing off his shirt and glaring at Lionheart. He asks how she's holding up, and she says she's never been this angry in her life. Crow laughs bitterly and welcomes her to Ozpin's inner circle. He holds out a flask to her, asking, Drink? And she pushes it away, merely replying, Revenge, as she steps forward. Crow shrugs, takes a swig, and follows after her in approaching Lionheart and the only now recovering Emerald. John keeps his eyes locked to Weiss, but hazards a glance to watch Ruby and Crow walk back into the fray. He looks down to Weiss, whose wound is beginning to seal, but hasn't done so completely. Gritting his teeth, he takes a risk and grabs Weiss by her collar, dragging her through the doors to the right-wing classrooms and out of the line of fire. As he gets through the door, the camera zooms past him and out the window, where the White Fang are continuing to set the campus alight. Adam watches the buildings burning, drinking in the moment of his victory when two Mistralian police officers rush up to the scene, weapons drawn. Only sparing them a glance, Adam waves towards the men and his troops brutally gun them down. The camera pans around the corner of one of the buildings, where Sun and Ilya watch the brutality unfold. Both are understandably horrified, but quietly discuss what to do since they can't take on an entire army alone. Sun puts a thumb to his chin and thinks for a moment, before saying that Ilya might not be very good at taking on armies, but he's got a little more experience in that department. Then, confidently, he stands up. She asks him what he's planning to do, and he says that he's doing what he always does, steal the scene. And with a wink, he runs out into the open, up to a patrol of two White Fang members, decking one of them in the face and pulling the hood over the other's head. With a few choice taunts, he rushes away, pulling the attention of the entire congregated force in his wake. Ilya watches him, baffled, before looking at the tower completely resolute. The camera pans up the length of the tower, drifting off into the night sky before darkening and fading into complete opaqueness. It continues to pan up, and now we're aboard the elevator descending towards the vault. Cinder, Raven, and Vernal ride in silence, until Cinder says that Vernal should be more assertive with her powers, saying she'll be the first maiden to open a vault in decades, cheekily adding that she should set a good precedent for all the other maidens. She's making history. Vernal blinks at Cinder, deadpan, saying that she's not doing this for any other reason beyond protecting her tribe, her family. Looking to Raven, she says it's a burden, not an honor, and the two share a knowing look as Cinder blithely remarks that Raven has trained Vernal well. The lift reaches the bottom and the three depart into the same vault structure we witnessed in the original show. See, if the original volume showed as much visual creativity as it did here, this volume wouldn't be nearly four hours long, or longer. I still have no idea how long this entire thing is going to be by the end of things. But yes, they step off the platform, Cinder makes her remarks comparing the two different vaults, and Raven says she just wants to get things over with. 
That all said, the camera rises back towards the elevator and once it passes into the ground, it jumps to the top of the shaft where Ruby and Yang are being pressed away by Emerald and Mercury, and Crow, Roman and Neo are facing off with Hazel and Lionheart. I'm gonna be honest, a lot happens here, so instead of doing a play-by-play -play of the footwork in question, I'm just going to go for plot point by plot point. The picture count for this season is already too damn high, and the time I've been spending on this has already exceeded what I planned, so please forgive the abruptness. First off is the first concrete signs of Emerald's growing guilt and fracturing sanity, as she pleads for Ruby to just surrender. The heroes don't have a chance. Once Cinder has her sights set on something, she always gets it. And Ruby is too kind to get involved for any of this. Ruby responds with her adamance that everything they've done has already hurt people she loves. She can't just stand by and do nothing. Pained by her conscience, Emerald screams that Ruby can die like the rest and continues the fight. Next is Crow arguing with Lionheart over his cowardice, openly indignant that he sold them all out, asking how many people had to die in order to keep himself safe. Leo replies that Crow has never met her, never seen her and what she can do. He has no idea what they've all been up against. Crow rebuffs him that they've known who they were fighting all along, but he never thought he'd have to add a friend like Leo to that list. Third up is the fight with Hazel, Roman, and Neo, which starts out well for a plucky ex-cons, but turns sour when Hazel, with Leo's help, strikes a lucky blow on Neo, knocking her out cold. In a moment of desperation, Roman willingly relinquishes control to Ozpin and allows the scrawny man to take on this behemoth, if only for a little while. With that, we can cut away back down to the vault, where the three have approached the massive door. The room comes to life as they get closer, and Vernal smiles warmly as the glowing petals from the tree hit her hand. And... This scene, now that we've given Vernal an actual character to work with, is actually perfectly fine as is. Vernal goes to the door, Cinder builds up her taunt to Raven, Raven prepares to stab Cinder in the back, and then Cinder springs her trap by freezing Raven in place and using her grim arm to impale Vernal. Vernal only manages to turn before the claw sinks deep, and Cinder taunts her how unworthy she is of the power of a maiden. Vernal struggles against the arm, but is powerless as she is pushed to the ground. Her struggle fades, and Cinder reacts with shock when she finds no power flowing into her through her arm. This is when Raven breaks free of the ice containing her and declares that Vernal isn't the Spring Maiden. Raven is. And her words are touched with a little bit of a voice crack to denote the rage at seeing Vernal get gravely wounded. Back with the crew up top, we find the battle between Ozpin and Hazel going poorly as Ozpin is thrown into the wall beside the right wing door. Ozpin remarks that Roman isn't very strong, and Roman bites back, yeah. And that's why my cane had a gun! On the other side of the door, in one of the ruined classrooms, are John and Nora tending to Weiss and Ren. Ren is still completely out of commission, but Weiss, with her aura charging rapidly, is beginning to stir and even acknowledge John's presence. When Hazel approaches to finish Oz off, Nora sees him through the other side of the door and launches forward to protect the entrance. She swings at him, and this is where we get Hazel slamming her to the ground and electrocuting her. He asks Ozpin how many innocent lives must be sacrificed before he is satisfied with his faulty crusade. Unfortunately for him, the electricity fuels Nora and she quickly overpowers him, flipping him towards the entrance to the hall. He begins to stand back up almost immediately and she asks what it takes to keep him down. Oz, winded, says that Hazel's semblance negates the feeling of pain. It's why he can inject so much dust into his body so frequently. Nora looks at him with indignant rage, muttering in disbelief that he can't feel it? Green her teeth, she jumps forward yelling, she'll make him feel it. And with a single supercharged swing, she sends him careening out the front entrance, taking a good chunk of the wall with it. Hazel slides to a stop in the courtyard, just as Sun rounds the corner, breathing heavily. He blinks at Hazel, and in a moment of shock and goodwill, asks if the guy is alright. That looks like it hurt. Hazel groans, and a gunship overhead pushes Sun to keep running, but the White Fang have completely encircled him. The group get a few shots off Adam before Adam waves for his men to stop. Adam begins to address Sun, saying that it's pathetic faunus like him that have made the White Fang necessary, ones that are willing to sell out their brothers and sisters to humans and perpetuate the enslavement of their kind. Sun puts his hands on his hips and flippantly tells Adam that he needs a vacation in Vacuo. If the faunus are free anywhere, it's there. And hey, the rest of the world isn't far off from that. In all honesty, the White Fang thing just keeps doing more harm than good. As Sun talks, Adam has been getting more and more furious before finally stepping forward, blade drawn, and seething that Sun is as blind as the rest of them. As Adam approaches to kill Sun personally, we hear Blake cry Adam's name from atop a nearby building. 
Adam and his troops turn to face the threat, and the gunship overhead focuses its light on her. The door guns fire on her, and she ducks and dives down the side of the building, evading the shots as she goes. Adam scowls at her, demanding that his troops kill that traitor. The rest of the troops open fire, giving Sun the opening he needs to escape, but not before slamming Adam over the head with his gun chucks and running away. Adam swings wildly at Sun, but gives up quickly in order to join the pursuit of Blake, walking in the wake of his troops. The wave of White Fang follow closely on Blake's tail, and when she rounds a corner, they stream after her. The camera follows, right into the now arriving Menagerie and Mistral forces. Adam barely rounds the corner and reacts with a raised brow when a Mistralian airship swings in and blows a bullhead out of the sky. We watch as the bullhead spins out of control and flies wide off the top of Haven's campus, and then crashes down into the bottom of the Chochin. A firefight immediately breaks out between the two factions, Blake slipping into the chaos. Adam retreats, fleeing back to the courtyard where he finds the winded but rising Hazel. The approaching troops can be seen closing in, making short work of Adam's forces, and in desperation he asks Hazel what to do. Hazel replies that it's Adam's problem and he should fix it, so Adam does the one sensible thing he knows he should, and sits down to write an entire video series repairing the mistakes that he's made thus far, and this perfectly explains why he's insane in Volume 6. <laughs> no, but seriously, Hazel gets up, plugs some more dust into his arms, and then walks back towards the entrance to the school. Adam turns around and Blake is there, staring at him. The two glare at each other before Adam asks, why? Why is it always Blake? Everything he's done, all the success he's made for the Faunus, everything is poisoned because of Blake. Blake says that this was never about the Faunus. Everything that Adam has done has actually been about himself, and everything that's failed is because he was too wrapped up in his delusions to see the truth. The world isn't perfect, but he's let his past poison his ability to see what good there is, how far things have come. Their world now is not the world of his mother. Adam's face contorts, hissing that the world has never changed. It's all about who has the power and who doesn't. And right now, he says, holding up a detonator, he has all the power in Mistral. And with that, he clicks the switch. And nothing happens. He clicks it several more times, screaming at it before looking to Blake and demanding to know what she's done. Blake levels her glare at him and says, I used words, not violence. Blake looks to the tower and Adam follows her gaze, and at the top, swinging her legs off the ledge, is a smiling Ilya, looking down on the campus. Adam howls with rage and tosses the detonator away. He screams to Ilya, I'll kill you. I'll kill that monkey. I'll kill all of you. He turns to Blake, snarling, starting with you. And with that, he fires Wilt out of blush, and we engage in a fight between Blake and Adam, which is eventually spiced up by the inclusion of Sun and Ilya. Again, not really going to go into details here, but at the very least, it should be noted that Adam keeps on par with the three-on-one odds, similar to how he balanced his foes back at Beacon. During the last shot of this fight, we see Nora being flung out of the front door of the school, unconscious, with a winded but still very much functional Hazel wiping his hands of her. Inside, Crow and Lionheart have slowed, while Ruby, Yang, Emerald, and Mercury are still stuck in their youthful stalemates. Hazel walks up behind Crow, grabs him by the leg, and flings him into a pillar, taking him completely out of commission. Ruby and Yang find themselves beset by four on two odds, being pressed from both sides by villains. Suddenly, Lionheart screams in agony, as both he and Hazel are pincushioned by a hail of bristling white feathers. All eyes turn where a now-recovered Weiss stands tall, nevermore landing triumphantly behind her. With his aura now broken by that attack, and welts of blood spilling from the holes in his body, Lionheart limps towards the stairs in a panic, completely fleeing the fight. Hazel is enraged and yells after him, only to be attacked once more by the swooping Nevermore. We follow the Nevermore into the air as it swoops, the camera hugging its shoulder as we transition to a flying shot of Raven and Cinder coming to blows in the cavernous vault antechamber. This fight? actually doesn't change too much. Sure, overall it's kind of a ripoff of Advent Children, but it's still unique choreography, so I can give them a bit of a pass on it. All the same, there are two big changes here. One, during the summon the big sword scene, Cinder is the only one to actually summon a big sword. Instead, Raven uses her sheath like a minigun, firing blade after blade at Cinder, eventually overpowering her big blade and causing an explosion that sets them both back to square one of the fight. The other big change comes to how Raven and Cinder handle Cinder's wacky wavy grim arm. Raven takes every opportunity to cut at that arm, and Cinder is constantly regrowing it, mid-fight, howling in agony each time it's severed. 
This makes the scene where she pins Raven to the elevator grate much quicker, since Raven just cuts herself free in Isis Cinder's feet in one motion. The fight continues as it was in the show, right down to Vernal using her last moments to distract Cinder so that Raven can get the final stab in, impaling Cinder up to the hilt. With a scowl of disdain, Raven uses her blade to push Cinder off the cliff, detaching the blade so it will go down into the abyss. And before all two of you Cinder stands out there think that I just killed Cinder off, she's not dead. Sorry to spoil the surprise, but the writers worked me into a corner with this one. Luckily, I've introduced an element not like one paragraph ago that can be elaborated on to qualify her survival. But yes, we follow the red blade as it falls and use it to transition over to Adam, wielding Wilt, which is glowing red hot with energy from the fight. We only get about half a minute into the fight before Adam catches a glimpse of the last vestiges of his forces being routed, with Kali and Gira leading the charge. The few free survivors of his forces flee towards him as their last bastion of protection. Enraged and backed into a corner near the rear of the CCT, Adam unleashes a cut so devastating that the air itself blows Sun, Ilya, and Blake back and severs the CCT tower at its base. The tower falls, and Blake is forced to roll out of the way to dodge it, landing herself square inside the Hall of Haven Academy. The tower itself crushes the front wall, but doesn't go much deeper than that, leaving the hall itself exposed to the gathering forces outside. Adam watches and begins to step forward to pursue, only to be stopped by one of his men. They insist that they've lost, but Adam tears his arm away, insisting that they've already accomplished the biggest step of their goal. The time to strike is now. As he begins to step away, four of the mooks look to each other before jumping on him and wrestling him towards the foliage on the edge of campus. He struggles against them, but two solid blows to the back of Adam's head from the biggest mook finishes off his strained aura and knocks him out cold, allowing them to pull him away without a fuss. Back in the hall, all eyes turn to the tower, then to Blake, where Weiss, Ruby, and Yang are all equally stunned. Meanwhile, Mercury, Emerald, and Hazel are all simply confused. The heroes, though probably more surprised, get the edge up when Ruby screams for Yang to go, prompting Yang to get a cheap shot in on the baffled Mercury and sprinting towards the elevator shaft. Emerald tries to stop her with her comma, but a wall of ice catches the blade, allowing Yang to escape. Down with Raven, she has a quiet moment to mourn Vernal's death before approaching the vault, opening it, and going inside to retrieve the relic. She grabs it with utter disdain, and it's almost as if she's trying to break it with her grip alone. She exits the vault just in time to see Yang land and begin to rush her. With a panicked look to Vernal, Raven makes the cowardly split-second decision to run, using a portal to vanish. Yang reaches the spot a second too late and punches empty air. Cursing, Yang catches her breath and then her eyes fall to Vernal, whose eyes are still open. Silently, Yang stares at the corpse before gingerly closing her eyes and picking up the body. She walks towards the elevator. Up top, the villains are clearly outnumbered and outgunned, especially when the recovering John, Ren, Crow, Roman, and Neo step in to join the hero side of the bench. Emerald begins to panic as Mercury tries to drag her towards the left wing door. She scrabbles against him, saying, Cinder's gonna be back any minute! She'll have the relic! She'll save us! The whir of the elevator captures everyone's attention, and it's not long before the platform reaches the top, with Yang carrying the dead Vernal. Emerald, realizing that Cinder must have lost, has a full-blown meltdown, and as Mercury becomes more forceful in dragging her away, she unleashes the full brunt of her semblance, depicting a horrific distortion of a skeletal, almost ghostly humanoid wraith, leaving all in the room stunned in horror. All except our villains, who recognize the distorted visage and use it as a cover to escape through the left wing of the school. Ren moves to go after them, but falters on the spot, too injured to really keep up. John grabs him and helps him stand, using his semblance all the while. Yang descends the stairs, still in a state of shock over Vernal's death, and as she reaches the bottom, she looks up to find a winded ruby, dropping to the ground to rest. Dread sinking in, Yang flashes back to when she and Ruby were younger, and cruelly, her mind replaces Ruby with a young Vernal. As the time ticks away, the reality of Vernal's death and what she could have ultimately meant to Yang sink in. The camera pans back and we cut away to Lionheart's office. Leo scrabbles to his desk, his wounds scabbed over but his clothes torn and bloodied. 
He's grabbing what he can from his desk when the shattered window behind him opens. He turns, in horror, and we see the second seer we've seen all series, glaring at him, silhouetted in the moonlight. He begins to ramble, that none of this was his fault, that Cinder and her white fang lackey screwed everything up, that it was all out of his hands, and that he'll keep serving her loyally as best he can. A horrifying, cold, and very Cortana-like voice slips from the orb, saying, If you could not stop such a simple blunder, what use are you to me? The seer raises its tentacle, and in a last-ditch effort to survive, Leo fires at it with stalwart, only to fail as it absorbs the shot and entangles him. He is dragged screaming off-screen before there is a snap, and he goes silent. The seer drifts silently out the window, and we focus on the broken moon. From the moon, we pan down to Raven arriving at the bandit camp's communal fire beside Shiloh, clutching the relic tightly. As the portal fades, Shiloh asks where Vernal is, confused. When Raven doesn't respond, he asks again, more concerned, the other bandits around him growing equally worried faces. When he sees Raven's grimace and stinging eyes, he asks, panicked, Where's Lily? Revealing to us Vernal's true name, not the name they used to cement the spring made in disguise. Raven begins to walk towards the center of camp, towards the bridge leading to the lake's island, as Shiloh is left in a state of shock. Breaking free of it, he demands that she come back there and answer him. Raven ignores his pleas and shouts back that they'll be leaving tomorrow. She has important work to get done tonight. Shiloh scowls at her before yelling in opposition that, no, they'll be leaving tonight. Raven stops, turning to look at him, surprised but also disdain on her face. She tells him that he doesn't want to be doing this right now. In return, he asks what it is she's doing, leading the tribe, watching out for everyone's well-being. It doesn't feel that way. Raven seethes that if someone is too weak, they die, as it's always been, and this prompts him to start tearing up, realizing what that means. He shouts that it doesn't mean they abandon each other. You don't just turn your back on family. Strength alone means nothing, and if she wants things to be that way, she can have it. Raven finally turns to properly address him, reaching for her blade, and the crowd gathers in support of Shiloh, all reaching for their own weapons. Shiloh, seeing the brewing tension, is quick to order there be no killing on hollowed ground. It's directed mostly at the other tribesmen, but also to Raven, who still has her hand on Omen. He continues that she doesn't own this tribe, she simply let it, and for all the good it's done them over the years, her leadership has only gotten more and more questionable since those strangers started falling into the camp. Maybe it's time someone else stepped up to lead the tribe, and acting as de facto leader, Shiloh declares that they are leaving tonight, and Raven won't be coming with them. There is silence, as not a soul disagrees and no one moves. A few moments later, the tribesmen begin to disperse through the camp, breaking down the last of their equipment. Watching them get to work, Raven shouts, Fine! I don't need you! You're all just as worthless as... As... And she can't even stomach saying her own daughter's name. Fed up, she screams to the sky and marches off to the waters of the lake, towards the islands. We drift to the side, where flowers are growing alongside the banks, and we use those to transition into Vernal's hair, where Weiss is tenderly resting her body on a stretcher separate from Yang. Weiss then notices that Vernal's fist is clenched tight, knuckles even whiter than her paling skin, and she gingerly opens the palm. Inside, she discovers Weiss's poorly shaped bear carving. Weiss, tears dripping from her eyes, closes the palm and stands. The amassed heroes are congregated around Yang, who appears drained but resolute in what she needs to do. She says she knows where Raven went, and if they want to catch her, they should probably hurry. Who knows what she wants with that relic? Ruby immediately says that she'll go with Yang, as does Weiss. Yang smiles to them before having her eyes drift to Blake, talking with her parents, son, and Ilya. With sullen eyes, she stands, Ruby and Weiss following as they pick up Vernal's stretcher and begin walking towards a nearby airship. With Blake, her parents express how crazy the last few days have been, and that they're proud of what she's done. Sun agrees, spouting off about some apparently secret crazy entrance hole in the middle of Haven's Hall. Like, is that a safety hazard or something? It sounds awesome! Blake asks what happens now that the White Fang's been dealt with. Gira admits that what Blake's friends told them seems fanciful, but there's plenty of evidence to support what they've said so far. And if the stakes are as grave as to threaten the world on such a grand scale, well, Mistral has allowed them to use an airship to get them where they need to go. Blake looks back at the airship, eyes heavy with guilt, until Ilya rests a hand on her shoulder. Ilya smiles and says that sometimes you can be too late to make amends, but Blake isn't there yet, not by a long shot. Go to them. Help them. Blake considers the words and jogs off towards the airship. 
Yang is the last person to board, stepping on as Blake approaches. The two are silent for a second, staring at each other, before Yang asks what Blake wants. Blake says that she wants to come along. Yang pauses before reaching out her arm, hesitant, and saying that it's a long, miserable road ahead. Blake smiles softly and takes the arm, giving a wry, misery loved company. And with that, Blake is hefted into the airship and it takes off. We watch the airship pass overhead and the camera pans down to Emerald, Mercury, and Hazel, fleeing over the rooftops of Mistral and using the plentiful piping to make their way down the city. Emerald breaks down again after only a few seconds on the rooftop, and a frustrated Hazel hefts her over his shoulder while Mercury tells her to get it together. Hazel brushes him off and tells him to give her space. He spares a glance back towards the campus before continuing his path. Mercury sighs and follows, saying that Salem's not going to be happy about any of this. We pan back as they continue their descent, back to Adam being dragged away by his men. He's partially conscious, mumbling words like, Traitors, and Blake, as the White Fang members struggle to get him down the mountainside. When they hit a particularly bumpy spot in the path, Adam's mask comes loose and tumbles into a muddy puddle below. We watch as Adam's limp legs are dragged away, the camera turned away from his face the whole time. Distant thunder rumbles in our ears before we cut to the airship with Ruby on board, coming into view of the tribal campgrounds, the Lake Central Island obscured by swirling clouds and flashing lightning. It's so localized that Weiss remarks that it can't be natural. The airship dips down and comes to rest in the lake, the Mistralian airship doubling as a boat. On deck, the team can see the campgrounds are basically abandoned, with nothing but a few flecks of debris, footprints, and tire tracks to show that anyone had been there, save of course for two lone yurts that have been left untouched. On the other side, they can see Raven on the central island, calling down lightning from a storm again and again onto a single point. Yang watches her with heavy eyes before saying, Let's go. We cut over to Raven, who is delivering as much damage as she can onto the relic, calling in lightning and fire and ice, and when none of that works, she resorts to just bashing it endlessly with Omen, wearing herself out more and more. The only thing she ended up destroying is the pillar on which she placed the relic. Her blade breaks against the glass when Team Ruby finally get close, and she turns to glare at them though her eyes lack the normal amount of confidence. Raven's been shaken, and she's trying to hide it as best she can. Looking back to the relic, she says, I don't know what you're expecting, but you're not going to get it. Turn around and go home. Yang responds, You know we can't do that. Raven sucks in a breath and mutters, Of course you can't. She turns, resting her hand on Omen's sheathed hilt when she addresses them. None of you can leave well enough alone, can you? I'm trying to end all of this, right here and now. Weiss hisses, You think that makes any of this better? You attacked us! And Raven counters, None of you were supposed to be there. If you hadn't shown up, me and Vernal could have just been in and out with the relic before they even knew what hit them. You ruined my plan! Yang follows that up by asking, The same plan that included killing Crow? That included killing all of us? Raven's mouth shuts, and she swallows down her next words. Ruby, watching cautiously, steps forward to ask what Raven's plan was exactly. Raven looks to Ruby, and in an instant we can tell she recognizes her. With a scoff, Raven says, Just like her, right down to the way she talked. A warm smile threatens to grow on her face, but it doesn't win in the end. I'm trying to break this cycle once and for all, or at the very least stagger it until it's not any of our problems anymore. She picks up the relic and displays the lamp for the four to see. I plan to destroy this thing, and failing that, Raven curls the fingers of her free hand into a fist and punches down through the air, forcing the earth below to cave into a deep hole. Bury it so far down into the heart of these ruins that no soul alive will ever find it. This place wards Grimm away, so both Salem and Osmond would need to find this spot and have some way to move hundreds of feet of rock and stone to get it. Not exactly foolproof, but it's clear I needed to do something to buy my tribe time. Blake looks back towards the empty campgrounds and genuinely asks, What tribe? Raven bitterly laughs and sits upon a broken pillar, staring out over the empty grounds and saying, No tribe of mine, not anymore. Weiss watches Raven for a moment before speaking up. They left you, didn't they? Rage flashes in Raven's eyes and she jumps to her feet, fuming, Ungrateful! Every single one of them! I've done nothing but ensure their survival, protected them at every turn, and the minute I fail once, they up and leave like cowards! But you didn't just fail once, Yang jumps in. You agreed to work with Cinder, didn't you? You got Vernal killed! Raven glares at Yang and roars, Don't talk like you didn't play a part in that! Yang shouts back, I'm not the one making deals with Salem! I'm not the one parading her daughter around as the Spring Maiden! Raven stomps the ground, Vernal made that decision herself, damn it! I never wanted her to do that, but when she learned the truth, she promised she'd always protect me! It's here that Raven begins to crack, falling back to her seat with her head in her hands, the occasional tear managing to escape her eyes. 
Angry, Raven continues to talk, glaring at Yang. What was I supposed to do? If I didn't do what they said, they would have just kept coming. I'd always be running. My people would always be in danger. So what other choice did I have but to try and stop the cycle entirely? I didn't have one! Ruby steps forward, her voice pleading. You should have worked with us, with Ozpin, the people that are trying to keep the world safe. Raven stares at Ruby in disgusted disbelief. She rubs her tears from her cheeks and begins to speak again. He's not trying to keep the world safe. He's just trying to keep it the way he likes it. Raven looks at the relic in her hand and then tosses it to Yang's feet. Take it. Just take it. Yang stares at it before picking it up and cradling it gently in her fingers. She asks, what are you going to do? Raven stamps down her tears, stands, and draws her sword before replying. I'm going to go somewhere they'll never find me, and with any luck, I'll stay one step ahead of both of them for as many years as I've got left in me. Yang raises a brow, so you're just running. Raven pauses, before slashing open a portal. It's the only choice that's mine to make, Yang. Blake steps up beside Yang and speaks up, saying, That doesn't mean it's a good one. Raven closes her eyes, opens them, and then replies, None of them are. And with that, she slips through the portal, sealing it behind her. The team stare at the space where she was before turning their attention to the relic in Yang's hands. Yang hands it to Ruby, who gives it a rap with her knuckles, while Weiss wonders exactly what the relic does. Ruby says they can ask Ozpin when they get back to Mistral, but Yang cuts in that before that, they have one last thing to do at the ruins, looking back to the airship. We cut to the island on the lake blanketed mostly in flowers, all waving gently in the night's breeze. Renal's body is laid to rest among the flowers, arms crossed, eyes closed, and her fists still curled around Weiss's bear statue. The four stand around her, pensive and lost in thought. Ruby asks if they should say something, looking to Weiss and Yang. Weiss shakes her head, choked with emotion. Yang, however, does speak. I'm sorry? I know we got off on the wrong foot, and honestly... Okay, it was on both of us, really. But still, sorry, I... I regret how little time we had together. How I wasted it being petty with you. Ignoring you. I wish... I wish I'd have been an actual sister to you. And with that, Yang goes silent, nodding to Weiss. Weiss nods back and draws Mirton Aster, clicking the cylinder into place and allowing a grey glow to encompass the blade. Stabbing it into the ground, a jut of solid stone encompasses Vernal's body, creating an impromptu tomb. The four stare at the stone, and then Yang turns and leaves, the other three following shortly thereafter, with Weiss lingering the longest. The camera lingers a few more seconds on her grave as flower petals drift through the air. We follow these petals as they drift in through the open window of Onsen Onsen Onsen's lounge, where our assorted crew are relaxing. Roman is sitting in place, allowing Neo to dab his bruises with medication. After a moment where she's a little too rough, he snatches the applicator and proceeds to playfully apply medication to her wounds in return, laughing sadistically and asking if she likes a taste of her own medicine. Neo squirms and his tone becomes slightly more grounded, telling her to sit still so he can do it right. Crow watches them with a look of disgust, taking a long swig of sake as Ruby and Weiss sit down next to him with trays of food. Ruby remarks that it is kind of a strange sight to see, and Weiss concurs but also says they shouldn't bother the two. After all, no one complains when Ren and Nora do something weird. At their mention, Ren and Nora appear with their own food trays, laden with much more than Ruby and Weiss. Nora slams hers down and asks who's ready for the best post-fight eating competition on the planet. John walks up behind them and sits down himself, asking Nora to slow her roll. They've already gotten kicked out of this place once, they don't need to ruin the goodwill they've been given now. Ren smiles to John and says that somehow he doesn't think that'll be much of an issue this time around. All eyes drift to the middle of the room, where our camera has tactfully avoided showing the remains of a bullhead tail that has become wedged inside the spa's main lobby. Ruby just remarks that, still, it was awfully nice of them to give them a group discount. With a hard cut, we jump to the actual onsen of the spa, where Yang is resting her eyes, soaking up the water. We hear Blake ask for permission to join her, and without opening her eyes, Yang gives a hum of approval. Blake slips into the water to Yang's right, and the two just sit there, basking for a short while. And then Blake speaks. She says she's sorry. For everything. For getting her hurt, for running away, for just... leaving Yang and the rest of their team behind. She didn't mean to hurt them, to hurt Yang, but she did, and she's done making excuses for it. From now on, she'll be there for Yang, for the entire team, if they'll take her. Yang is silent, eyes still closed as the words hang in the air. And then Yang pipes up that it's been almost a year. Blake is confused, but Yang elaborates that it's been almost a year to the day from when Beacon fell. A lot has happened in that time, and she's had time to think things over. 
Finally, opening her eyes, she looks to Blake and says that she understands. Sort of. She doesn't know why Blake ran, maybe she'll never fully understand that, but she knows what it's like to feel something you can't control, and how it makes you do things you regret. Yang gives a self-deprecating laugh and says that her anger issues are still a work in progress. But the more important thing is that she's working on it, and she's trying to fix it. And from the sounds of things, Blake is too. Blake nods solemnly and looks into the middle distance, saying she doesn't want to run, not again, not from what's important to her. Yang gives a full smile and closes her eyes again, saying, Yeah, we wouldn't want anyone accusing you of being a scaredy cat. Blake's ears pin back, but she smiles as she slaps Yang's shoulder. Oh my god, that's awful! From the next wall over, Ruby can hear the laughter between the two as she walks out onto a patio that overlooks the whole city below. Roman is leaning against the banister, staring pensively into the horizon and smoking a cigar. As Ruby approaches, he starts talking. You know, Red, when I was a kid, my best friend and me, we'd play hero and princess all the time. He pauses, dashing the cigar into an ashtray before quickly adding, I was the hero, she was the princess for the record. Ruby cheekily says, I didn't want to assume. He smiles at her and shakes his head. We play all the time, swinging sticks like swords and slaying imaginary dragons. But what's the fun in being you? So we made up little names for ourselves. Names like Roman Torchwick. He takes a long drag of his cigar and lets the smoke linger as he exhales. After I left home, I never expected to wind up in one of those stupid stories, or that they'd end up being so terrifying. Ruby quirks an eyebrow at him, leaning against the railing to get a better look at his face. What are you talking about? Roman looks down to her with sunken eyes. I talked to the old man about that thing we saw. That was her, Red. That was Salem. Ruby blinks, the horror slowly dawning on her. Roman smiles warily and says, Yeah, I know. Give me an imaginary dragon any day. And with that, he takes a long drag of his cigar before planting it firmly in the tray. We cut to black and the credits roll. In the after credits, we get the shot of Ty back at his house with Raven's feather drifting in the foreground, just like in the original volume. What is that, like the third or fourth time I've actually said that this whole script? Right at the very end, too. Yeesh. Ty gives a look that reads, oh god, not this crap again, and we cut to black. Bip, bop, bam. Volume done. This has been an incredible volume both for the best and for the worst. I've had some of the highest highs and some of the lowest lows, and somehow I always knew fixing Volume 5 would be just that. I dreaded going into this fixing, Volume 5 is the black sheep of Ruby for a reason, and though many consider it usurped by the likes of 7 and 8, I don't foresee myself losing as much sleep over those as I did over this one. And in all fairness, I couldn't have done this alone. Unlike other years, I've actually worked with the members of the Sketchy Huntsmen to flesh out my scripts, and build the world out in a new, interesting way. Mistral was an untapped playground they were all excited to get their hands on, and I think we came away with some of the most interesting locales in the Ruby universe to date. Combined, I don't even know the total number of images we had for this particular volume. If it hasn't hit four digits, it's probably damned close. We got a wonderful spread of different styles and expertise, experiments and collaboration that I hope make things easier going into Volume 6, and models from a 3D design team that sped up even my ability to make quick little one-off images for the volume. Likewise, I was both excited and intimidated to see several of the artists go all in on animating sections of this volume, and though comparatively small to the overall runtime, I think the animated segments added more punch to things where we needed them. Don't get too used to the animations, though. They're staying small and strategic. I have no plans currently to make this a fully animated production for a number of reasons. I know I'm going a little long on this segment, but there were over 47 artists working on this volume, and I'm trying to give them all enough time that their credits don't scroll by too fast. There's also a link to a Google Doc in the description of this video that lists each artist and all of their socials. Please, I beg you, please support the artist. They volunteered their time and effort into this project. They bled and sweat, almost probably literally at times, and I want to give them the biggest promotion that I can. They're all incredibly talented, and they've all done excellent work, and I can't recommend all of them enough. Please, check out the links and give them your patronage. Similarly, 
I need to give special thanks to Fatman Falling for being the beta reader of the script for Volume 5. He helped me buff out several issues with it, and though he wasn't happy with it overall, quote, it's still Volume 5, that's the problem, unquote, he helped me refine it to a point that I was happy. One more personal shoutout to Moderately Entertained, who I'm still pretty sure maintains some version of the adding flavor to Remnant spreadsheet. It's a great little resource that I and the Huntsman have gone to a number of times when generating ideas when we were stuck, so we'd love to see you guys contribute as well. Getting near the end here, I'd like to thank each and every one of my patrons. Without you guys, I would be a drooling mess right now with no will to live. If you're not already a patron, I implore you to consider throwing just a dollar my way to help keep the lights on around here. Finally, finally, I want to thank you, the viewer. How many people are willing to sit down and watch a four to five hour long series fixing just one volume of an obscure internet serial? Let alone all of you who have watched since volume one. You guys are frankly awesome, and I'm really excited to hear what you all think of this volume now that it's done. Please leave a comment down below, and I'll be sure to read out and answer the most interesting ones, comment or critique during a follow-up live stream. Or streams. We'll see what happens. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. Feed that hungry YouTube algorithm. And I think that's it. Unlike past volumes, this volume ended up running up against the holidays. And with Thanksgiving behind us and Christmas ahead, I want to wish you all a Merry Christmas, a Happy Holidays, and if I don't see you during the streams, a Happy New Year. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll catch you all on the flip side.